Hello everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, let's get things started. Uh, so it's my greatest pleasure uh, to be here, um, starting the, as you know, the third um, international workshop on seeking no dimensionality and deep networks. So that's actually, uh, just give a little bit of, uh, little bit of history about this. I think this is the sort of workshop uh, we started about uh, several years ago. Um, this is the third time. Uh, I think the previous two workshop were uh, held in New York City. So this is the first time we held this uh, workshop in the uh, international side, um, the amazing Abu Dhabi. And I, I believe that uh, most of you will enjoy immensely in the next few days. Um, it's a great culture and a great country and also the city, right? So also I would like to express uh, our deepest appreciation for the university being uh, uh, Mohammed bin Zaid University of AI. Their generous, due to their generous support, we'll be able to have this uh, workshop in this amazing place, uh, 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 hotel. And also that uh, regarding the workshop, right, this is really, uh, it started yesterday, we had a work tutorial, and the, 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 the theme of this workshop, and also, is really about to try to understanding the fundamental mathematical and the computational foundation of, for behind the machine learning or behind the artificial intelligence, or more broadly, intelligence in general. Right. And we actually see some fundamental connection, mathematical connections between right, the phenomena, mostly empirical phenomena we have observed in the past decade about the practice of deep networks and uh, some fundamental mathematical uh, uh, properties of deep models. Right. So hopefully this will continue to be a very exciting scientific uh, program for years to come. And uh, of course, there's also plans we'll talk about how to make this workshop eventually transform into a conference, more dedicated uh, special topic conferences, right? So that can, we can go deeper and further with some of the investigations and understanding of this research topic, right? I'm sure during the next few days, uh, you will hear from some of the top researchers in related uh, in the fields and speak about their experience or the results, latest results regarding this research uh, direction, right? And uh, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I will introduce the, the program, program chair of this uh, workshop, uh, Professor Chin Chi uh, from University of Michigan to give us a little bit of overview uh, about, uh, what's, about the particular program of this workshop for the next three days. Okay, okay. please. Clicker. Um. Clicker, clicker. The middle one is for uh, sexy for the great briefing. Thanks, Yi, for a great briefing. So, uh, my name is Ching. I'm from University of Michigan. Uh, it, it's my great pleasure today uh, to give a brief overview of the history, uh, the background, and the agenda of today's uh, workshop. 
Uh, in the past decades, so we have witnessed great success of deep neural networks. Uh, although we have made uh, tremendous uh, progress in the last five years about understanding deep neural networks, but there's still a huge gap between theory and practice. So what we believe is that the key to understand deep neural network is by exploring the low dimensional structures of the data, right? So this is the key that we for the success of compressed sensing and the sparse representation area. Uh, and I think the key uh, to understand deep neural network here is also by looking into the structures, low dimensionalities of the data. And in the last day's tutorial, we already given some history and background on low dimensional modeling. Uh, and in the past few years, the evidence between the connection of low dimensional models and deep networks are emerging in terms of network architectures, representations, and also regularizations. And in last day tutorials, we have given a tons of evidence uh, in that as well. So in the end of this effort, uh, in 2019, uh, two of my colleagues, actually Professor John Rice from Columbia and Yu Xian Zhang from Rutgers, have organized the first workshop uh, on this, as, as E mentioned, in Columbia and uh, New York. Uh, and uh, in 2000, uh, 2020, uh, we uh, make this a workshop uh, named Seeking Low Dimensionality in Deep Neural Networks. And the acronym is given by one well, of my colleague and also the organizer here, Professor Atlas Wang from UT Austin. Uh, and because of COVID, we make this an online workshop which has approximately 400 registers, and we invited like 10 speakers, particularly talks, uh, in this event. Uh, and last year, uh, because of COVID, we also make this online, and we attracted around 500 uh, register attendees, uh, and we invited uh, more uh, speakers, and uh, this year we decided to make this workshop uh, in person, and thanks uh, Professor Eric Xing, uh, the president of uh, MZU AI, and also uh, Philip Perreault, uh, which is, is uh, the head of international institutional research and benchmarking at MZU AI, uh, really make this uh, workshop taking place uh, in person. And this year we have uh, uh, we have around 500 uh, eight, uh, 580 registered attendees and. Over a hundred people are uh, attending in person. Uh, and this year we have uh, enlarged our, our workshop to uh, have 20 spectacular speakers. Uh, and this is the agenda of today's workshop. So this morning I will be the moderator uh, and we have a coffee break around uh, 11. Uh, and for the afternoon we have uh, four talks uh, along with poster sessions. Uh, tomorrow, we will have a panel session uh, at the end around PM. Uh, and in the last day, uh, we will have uh, another uh, seven uh, talks uh, with a poster session. Uh, finally, I want to thank all the organizers that were really making this uh, workshop uh, happening. Uh, and especially, we like to thank Professor Eric Xing and so a lot of the local chairs that uh, helped moderating and coordinating this workshop. Uh, and also, I want to mention this is a, a workshop is also part of the AI quorum that's happening at MZU AI. I would like to thank uh, for MZU AI for the generous uh, uh, support on uh, this workshop. Uh, Finally, I want to mention is that uh, we are trying to make this workshop as uh, a small uh, focused uh, conference on foundations of deep networks and low dimensional models in the future. And this is more like an annual recursive uh, workshop or conference in the future. And our uh, current plan is to make this uh, taking place in Hong Kong, uh, presumably in December this year. Uh, finally, I want to thank all attendees for, make, uh, for making this workshop really happening. Thanks all for our attendance.
I, I think we're the next agenda. So we are still have a few minutes. We're running a little bit late, but we are waiting for um, one of the uh, vice president of the uh, Mohammed bin Zaid the University of AI to give some um, the general opening remarks about the workshop. And I think he's on his way. Uh, we will wait a little bit. Um, and then we'll resume our technical program uh, after his uh, short speech. Let's just wait a, you know, take a quick break and uh, wait a little bit. I think he's on his way. Yeah, should be here any minute now. Since we have a few minutes, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know, what we could do, right? So uh, this is a workshop. It's really an um, event for all attendees to enjoy, right? To exchange ideas. I really uh, encourage all attendees in the next few days, right? During your lunch, during the coffee break, during the dinner, um, to exchange all the ideas that you have, right? And I think, uh, as the Ching has mentioned, this is uh, an area has really become uh, uh, progressing at a very uh, amazing pace in the past few years, right? Both theoretically and computationally, and also in practice, right? So there's a lot of exciting things um, to come. So this is also the purpose of this workshop to precisely bring all the people interested in this topic, right? To share the progress, to share ideas, especially for the future. And uh, maybe, you know, also I would like to say that the uh, Ching did mention um, the, and for all the attended uh, papers, uh, accepted posters and so on, uh, we're also organizing a special issue um, for IEEE's uh, uh, transaction on special topics uh, on signal processing, right? So uh, I really encourage all the students, uh, if you have ongoing work, that or a conference paper, you like to really substantiate it into a more um, extended journal version, and that is a place you can consider, right? So as a result from uh, the exchange of ideas from this workshop, right? And also for future, uh, we also, the meeting of the organizer also talking about maybe we'll transform uh, this workshop into a small conference. Maybe many of you know that, right? So the, right now, all the big machine learning conferences become too big. Uh, almost uh, published everything, right? Um, that actually defeats the purpose as, uh, you know, to change ideas, can intensively, deeply exchange ideas, right? Like a work small workshop like us, right? So I really hope that you guys can really enjoy it. This is a very rare, a very, very cherished event, and you can learn a lot from each other, and, uh, and, and, for, and also teach each other. Right, well, the topic. Okay. Thanks a lot. Now I see, uh, okay, um, the Mr. Uh, Sultan Al Haji, uh, the Vice President of the uh, Bin, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Zaid, the University of AI, uh, to give us a few remarks about the uh, university and the city. Uh, please welcome. Good morning to all of you. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm a little bit late. I was not, I can't say traffic was not much traffic to come from my office to here. But it's always a pleasure to see all of you here. I think, thank you. We came from all the way from California today, and I think the difference between is about 12 hours. <laughs> so it's either too late or too early. <laughs> On behalf of our president, Professor Eric Sheng, who couldn't be here today with you, I have his greetings to you and wishing you all a happy new year and it's a good start to start in Abu Dhabi for 2023. Um, we appreciate, of course, your presence and participation in these three tremendous days of exploring the AI and how we can develop more into applying AI in this workshop store DNN. 
We at Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence play a crucial role in creating the technology and skills required to accommodate our nations, the UAE, long-term vision and ambitions in AI. To support the advancement of our national organizations, we as a university work to cultivate talents of masters at master's degrees and the PhD delivered in professional ranks. We provide masters and PhD degrees in computer vision, machine learning, and natural language processing. In the coming years, we also hope to introduce degrees in programs of robotics, human computer interaction, and other fields, of course. We also provide an executive program which had a big success to enhance the awareness of AI applications in different fields, and these courses are attended by ministers and under secretaries and CEOs, levels and chairmen. And I think today we are celebrating the third cohort to be graduating from this programs. <clears throat> and together with our master and PhDs and this type of programs, I think the Mohammed bin Zayed of artificial intelligence had its impact and you know and it did its, 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 its ambition so far. And the long way to go of course. Since the Samsung uh, exceptions of uh, more than two years ago, we have gathered an incredible list of faculties, as you have known and know, we have the oh. best faculties in the world, I can say that, we are proud of them. Many of whom you are familiar with, and many of them are here today with you today. Yeah. Okay. We are now placed at top rank of 25 uh, internationally in our special uh, fields, according to CS ranking thanks to the dedications and hard work of our faculties and the students and the staff, of course. And of course, your support and your networking and the fact that we are organizing such a forum here is a part of our um, goals, of course, to, to enhance our ranking, not only that, but also to reach our UAE ambitions in, in the, and as I said before, in AI. As you know that UAE is 51 years old now and by any measure is not very old in any nations, but the infrastructure you have seen from not having running water or electricity 50 years ago in most of the houses, today we are here talking about AI, and I think AI have a big impact, and many things in our lives are impacted by AI, in UAE especially, and we have more places to go, of course. The most cutting edge potent, uh, <clears throat> and potent method of ensuring that we advance in the field of healthcare, of course, education, logistics, and of course, the climate, as we're celebrating this year, UAE becoming the, the, the host for the climate uh, the mission of COP28. The UAE wants to be better leader in AI, both uh, out of desire and out of need, of course. We have a long perspective of global warming because of the climate changes, since we live in a very harsh desert. Thanks God, uh, Philip was very kind to organize this seminar and this workshop during a month of uh, January, because it's a nice climate, and it was a little bit chill this morning. But otherwise, in, 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 in uh, July and August, of course, it's unbeatable with the humidity and, and, and uh, hot weather, of course. And the second thing, of course, the water is very scarce. Most of our water coming from the sea, and we have to advance in AI how to apply that, and that both in the climate and the water resources. The UAE is the first country to sign the, the, the ratify the Paris Agreement, of course, as you know due to its futuristic outlook. We want to be net carbon free zero by 2050. Because of this, we feel quite lucky to have you here today for this event. W the conversation you have and you will do in the next day to come <clears throat> with AI accomplish our objectives and achieve carbon neutrality and all other areas you have highlighted throughout the workshop. I sincerely hope we get the opportunity to have you again visiting us and to see the outcome of this workshop, because most of us looking forward to hear from you, yeah, the futuristic you are making the impact of AI. And today I was listening to NBC that Elon Musk have lost a bunch of his Tesla's advanced in technology because there's other companies coming up and, and challenging it. And this is the thing about the challenging. And a few days ago, of course, not a few days ago, but a few weeks ago, you have read about the chat GPT, and there's a big challenges for schools like us and others where the students can write with G, chat GPT and present their uh, dissertation without any detection of frauds or any incomplete. And this is a new challenge of course, how to, we can be authentic and do authentic jobs. At Mohammed bin Zayed Collaboration and Academic uh, Organization, 
like we have a lot of collaboration, of course, like the Wiseman Institute, recently we have signed with the agreement to advance our research fields. We're also establishing a centers with IBM and other organizations to advance technologies and advance research topics. And I hope in the coming days you will hear something outcome of these research topics collaboration. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best, inshallah, and looking forward to hear from you all the good things for AI. Thank you much. All right, uh, without uh, any further ado, uh, now I will introduce, the, we'll get the technical program started. Um, maybe the, the, the session chair, Professor Chin Chu, will introduce the speakers. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, I'm the moderator for today's uh, morning session. So for the first talk, we are very honored to have Professor Tommaso Paudrio from MIT uh, to give a talk on key principles of deep neural networks. Uh, so let's welcome uh, Tommaso. Well, um, great to be in Abu Dhabi, first time for me. Thanks a lot to the organizers that have made this possible. Um, I want to tell you really <clears throat> two different stories. One is about, uh, so two different talks. One is about uh, why deep networks work. That has been a big question uh, throughout the last uh, uh, 12 years or so at least. Um, and then I'll tell you a number of results because of time only some of them about a detailed analysis of the dynamics involved in training deep RLU networks for classification under the square laws. So the first top next slide <coughs> um, is um, an old movie from 95. This was a project we had with Daimler-Benz, Mercedes. This is a movie um, that was done in Ulm, where the research labs of Mercedes are. And this was one of the first, probably the first uh, people detection, pedestrian detection system based on machine learning. So this was 25 years ago um, uh, or more. And you can see that there are a few mistakes, like at the end, uh, the traffic light is um, mistaken for a pedestrian, and there are some misses detection, and so on. At the time, 25 years ago, we were very happy about the performance of this system was uh, like one mistake every three frames. But on the other hand, these were 10 mistakes per second which made it of scientific interest, but absolutely of no practical use at all. Now, 25 years later, for the same problem, Mobileye, who is the leading vision um, de developing system for cars, based in Jerusalem, Israel, has a uh, error rate of about one error every 50 or 100,000 kilometers of driving. If you do back of the envelope calculations, this is about one million times more accurate than the system we had then. And this corresponds roughly to doubling accuracy every year for 25 years. So that's why <coughs> in the last, um, I would say, decade or a bit more, there have been a lot of important applications of machine learning because a combination of algorithms and especially development of computers and storing um, have made um, really possible for application things that before were only in of interest in the lab. So the point is, however, that during this last 20 years, there are, there are a lot of applications, but we still don't understand why deep no networks work as well as they do. Next slide. Um, 
make the point that this actually happened other times in history, history of science, the fact that you had something that uh, you, you did not quite understand, but was immediately quite useful. And one story that I like is the one of electricity. People don't know very much about it, but electricity really was invented in the year 1800. Next slide. By Alessandro Volta, <coughs> who was a professor in, in uh, Pavia, which is 30 kilometers from Milan. He did that. It was an accidental discovery. Um, he wanted to show that one of his colleagues, Galvani, in Bologna, was wrong and electricity was not of biological origin. Um, now, he was made a count by Napoleon, and um, it was the first time scientists had a continuous source of electricity. The pila, which is shown here in uh, this little uh, set of disks of zinc and uh, copper and, uh, and uh, wood, um, produced 2.1 volts for about four minutes or so. But this was the first so source of electricity, continuous electricity as opposed to sparks. And once a scientist had that, they were able to develop a number of applications. Volta himself designed the telegraph line between Milan and Pavia. And the next slide shows in fact that before understanding how electricity worked, there was electrolysis, electric motors, telegraph, electric generators, and so on. But it was only until 1860 when Maxwell developed this equation that there was a real understanding of electricity. And after that, of course, there were many more developments. So theory does not always come first, usually comes later. Um, and it's not strictly necessary for application, but can of course, turbocharge applications. So my, that's the hope for, from my side for why we want to develop the theory of machine learning, with the hope that we understand what's going on and with the hope that we'll get even much better systems if we understand what is going on. So next slide. Um, <coughs> this is, uh, next slide shows things that you probably all know. Next slide. Yeah, the basic, uh, the basic architecture of feed-forward networks is very simple, a series of layers of neurons, and neurons are simply units that summate their inputs and then pass their inputs through a very simple nonlinearities, this uh, rectified linear unit, RLU, and so the output is a number that gets um, then passed to other neurons, and the, the, um, the things you can change, the parameters you can change in that system are the weights. So each input to a unit is weighted, and those weights are the things you are trying to set uh, in order to get your network to do what you want. And one way to set them is to have a training set with inputs and correct outputs, and change the inputs, the, the weights, until you get for each input the corresponding output. This is training, and this is done, next slide, using an optimization procedure that typically this day is stochastic gradient descent, which is a form of gradient descent in which you um, compute the gradient of the loss um, based only on a few samples and not the old sample set. Okay, so next slide shows, I, I want first to speak about a possible principle, single principle that may underlie why deep learning works. It's a kind of, it's unpublished, it's a, um, a, a theorem or two, uh, hopefully correct. So I would love to have your feedback. And the other one, um, next slide, is about uh, the dynamics of learning has to do with uh, approximation, optimization, and generalization for deep learning on the square loss. This is more details. Uh, let's first start with the more general 
principle I was, I was mentioning. So next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah. Um, so the idea is that a principle could be what I call compositional sparsity. Next slide shows that <coughs> there are in the meantime um, a lot, a number of different neural network architectures. One uh, on the left is a cartoon of convolutional networks, um, CNN, but then there are transformers, perceivers, MLP mixers, and whatever our brain is doing. And they're all kind of different. Um, they're, of course, um, neural network connection of elements we call neurons, like the brain is, um, but um, with different uh, um, with different architectures. And the question is, uh, these are the ones that seem to work particularly well in a number of domains. Why do they work? Do they have in common some basic idea? So next slide shows insights from approximation theory. Something that was known since the 80s is that um, both shallow networks, say one layer, hidden layer, or many layers, um, can approximate any continuous function from a compact domain arbitrarily well. This was well known. This is similar to Weierstrass theorem. You can, with polynomial of sufficiently high degree, approximate arbitrarily well a continuous function from a compact domain. In this case, you don't need more layer. One layer is enough. Uh, so the question is, why, why do you have deep networks behaving much better than, than shallow networks? And, uh, and the beginning of an answer comes from the next slide that shows that, in general, it's true that you can approximate a function arbitrarily well, but you may need an enormous number of parameters. The number of parameters you need, in our case this would be the weights, that you need is uh, something in the order of the epsilon, which is the error you are willing to accept in the approximation, to the minus d, where d is the dimensionality. m is, you can think about the smoothness, the number of derivatives, but let's say for the moment uh, m is equal 1. So suppose uh, epsilon is 10%, so epsilon is 0 0.1, d is 10, you have 10 to the 10. Um, parameters you need if you have 10 variables. So that's, uh, you know, a largest number, but the number will be huge if, for instance, you consider the dimensionality of an image in CIFAR. These are small images. They are 30 by 30 or so, and this means 1,000. So these 1,000, so that would be the up upper bound by this curse of dimensionality would be 10 to the 1,000 which is really a big number because um, in the universe, our universe, there are two, 10 to the 80, 80 protons. So 10 to the tau is huge. So this is a real curse. The next slide shows one way to avoid the curse. This was a, a theorem we proved a, a, a few years ago with Rushikesh Maskar, and this is uh, the following, that if a function that you are trying to learn, so this, think of a task, um, input to output, if this task can be decomposed as a function of functions in which the functions, the constituent functions, have a small dimensionality, um, then you can avoid the curse of, a dim of dimensionality if you use a deep network with a similar graph architecture as your function. So for instance, the binary tree on, on the left can have eight variables, but each node is a function of two variables. So this is a function of function of function where each constituent function has just two dimensions. And in this case, the curse of a dimensionality is not set by eight, but just by two, the maximum value of the constituent function. Okay, this is, by the way, a special case of convolutional networks. And, um, but this statement is about the task. It's nothing to do with network. It's about the function you're trying to learn. 
So it turns out <coughs> that if a function is compositional, and I say compositionally sparse because it's compositional, and its constituent function is has depend on a small number of variables. So composition, compositional sparsity would be the general term. By the way, I did not invent it. It's uh, a statistician, Damen, who came up with it. Uh, next slide. Um, next, yeah. So this is a more general statement, essentially saying the same thing, but for a general uh, graph. So if you can represent a function as a directed acyclic graph, each node is a constituent function, then basically the number of parameters that you need for the whole graph uh, depends on the uh, node of the graph that has the largest number of variables. So in this case, I say four down there. Um, same thing, just generalized to arbitrary graphs. Now, in general, every function is compositional, trivially, because you can only compose a function with it, the identity function. And the question is, um, how many are compositionally sparse functions in the universe of all possible functions? Uh, next slide. Um, you know, th there is also the fact that um, in general, if a function has more than one compositional representation. When I speak of a compositionally sparse function, I speak of a function that has a compositionally sparse representation. Um, and next slide, uh, there are simple examples in which a function of many variables can be compositionally sparse. One is that it really depends only on a small number of variables, not all the variables that are directly involved. Other ones are more complicated, like the binary tree example. Next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, the, this, the, this idea of assuming that in, uh, um, you have to have the function you are trying, the target function, the function you are trying to learn, to be compositionally sparse, this assumption appears more and more often in um, papers by statisticians uh, on approximation theory. It seems that if you don't do that, there is little you can do. So uh, we used to call in the original paper, we called it hierarchical, um, uh, hierarchical locality. Uh, but the better term is compositional sparsity, which is introduced by Wolfgang Damen just last year. Okay, so next slide um, says, suppose that you have functions that are compositionally sparse. Could this be a principle that uh, neural network use? Next slide. Um, shows that uh, um, the original paper about transformers. Um, and next slide shows a graph of what a transformer is. I, I cannot make much of it, of this figure in terms of understanding what is going on. I'll show you some a version of it, which is quite different, gives, I think, a better idea of what's going on. Next slide. On the, on the left, you see <coughs> the architecture of um, essentially a deep convolutional-like network. Um, so the, the architecture is given. You're assuming that the function that you're trying to learn has the same architecture. It's made up of um, constituent functions um, and uh, and so you're using a network which has the same architecture to learn this compositionally sparse function. And because it's compositionally sparse, the number of parameters you, you need is not so astronomically high. But it, so in this case, like in a convolutional network, what you are doing is assuming that you know the graph of the underlying target function. Uh, you assume you know. Uh, your assumption is correct, and 
you're able to exploit this when you learn. Now, for transformers, you don't need, you don't know what the underlying graph is. You don't know that, for instance, um, the first, one of the first constituent functions depends only on those three inputs and not, no other ones. You don't know. So what you have here is a module that is called self-attention. And this module, um, and it's partly conjecture by me of what's going on in a transformer. This module is uh, looking at the input, getting into it, and, uh, and looking, so looking, for instance, at uh, this input, and then looking which other inputs are similar to it. And it does that through essentially a um, Malanobis types uh, dot product. And through the softmax operation, it selects only a few of those other inputs. So it's a system to enforce sparsity on the fly for any new input. And, and so the idea would be that both for convolutional type networks and also for transformers, the key part is to try to infer uh, or to know and exploit or to infer and exploit the sparseness of the target function. In the first case, you know it. Second case, you just know it's sparse. You don't know what the sparsity, the structure of the sparsity. OK. So that's a way sparsity can be exploited by networks. And the next slide um, yeah, it gives more, a little bit more detail about this, the uh, self-attention module. But let's go to the next one. Um, uh, as I said, if uh, um, approximation is possible, and then I'll make uh, um, uh, um, the case later in the analysis of deep, net, deep RLU networks that generalization is also much better if you have sparsity of constituent functions. The question, as I mentioned, are these compositionally sparse function very special functions or, 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 or not? Are, are, are we making a very restrictive assumption when we say uh, that our target function is compositionally sparse. By the way, these are assumptions about the world and not about neural networks, are assumptions about tasks. Um, and next slide. In fact, years ago, together with a colleague of mine, a physicist, Max Tegmark, we had <coughs> put forward some assumption that may be for problems that are typical for perception uh, because of uh, laws of physics, for instance, or maybe evolution, they, uh, most of the interesting function or tasks, like recognizing an image, an image correspond to compositionally sparse function. Um, but the answer, it seems to be a bit different. Next slide. <coughs> so the, the answer st seems to be let me tell you in advance, is that practically all functions are compositionally sparse. And to uh, support this, um, let me make you a couple of definitions. This is bridging machine learning with uh, a theory of computation. So let's think of um, a definition of a sparse compositional function as a function that has a representation in terms of the composition of a non-exponential number of function, each one of which depends on a relatively small number of variables. That's a bounded number of variables. OK, that's one definition. The other definition comes from theory of computation and Turing machines and so on. And it says that the function is computable if it's, there is a procedure or algorithm that correctly calculates a sequence of approximation to this function. And if this procedure or algorithm 
is uh, um, computable in polynomial time or space in the number of variables, then I call it efficiently computable. This is the same thing you do for computability in terms of a Turing machine and efficient computability when it is polynomial in uh, um, the relevant variable. So next slide shows the theorem that you can prove is that for functions that have bounded first derivatives, so not all functions, but I would argue all reasonable functions, then compositional sparsity is equivalent to efficient computability. That if this is true, this means that for most reasonable function in practice, um, you can assume that they are compositionally sparse. Okay, and, uh, and so composition sparsity will not be coming from the laws of physics or uh, evolution, but it's a property of our mathematical world. Uh, next slide that just makes a few points. Th this is a statement about, not about neural networks, it's about functions, tasks that neural networks may learn. Um, it says that every task can be decomposed in simpler tasks or modules. This is the same idea as a program that can be decomposed in a set of subroutines. Um, um, it's also, next slide, there are connections. It, th this establishes a connection of between computability and approximation theory. Um, of course, co the idea of compositionality is a very important idea in linguistics and cognitive science. Um, and uh, um, I find it quite interesting that uh, th if assuming all of this is true, that, uh, that um, you know, this may be the principle um, on which uh, deep RLU networks are based and why they are successful. So exploiting this compositional sparsity of every task that has to be learned. Okay. Next slide. Um, uh, yeah, just outline uh, a proof that, uh, uh, for instance, um, if computable by a Turing machines, it means that um, the function that is computed can be represented by the composition of function, each corresponding, each one corresponding to the basic read-write step in a Turing machine, which is itself a sparse function. So, um, and again, uh, next slide shows um, um, there is a pathological case about Kolmogorov theorem and Hilbert's 13 problem, but it can. I can leave that for the discussion if anybody is interested. Next slide. Um, yeah, it makes this point that, you know, if, if there were no uh, sparse compositionality, then functions like the functions we are trying to learn um, when we recognize, we have a network recognizing CIFAR images because it's a function from R1000 to R, um, this would imply, um, you know, a curse of dimensionality is really 10 to the 80, the number of all, um, uh, the, number, uh, the, the, the number of values you have to store in order to, to be able to reproduce that function or compute it. So that's another remark pointing to the fact that functions must be compositionally sparse, otherwise that there is be no, no way to compute them in our universe anyway. Um, okay, how much time do I have? Twenty? Okay, so next slide. Uh, 
it's a summary. So uh, the key property of the of function of the word of tasks is this one that are compositionally sparse. That um, for such function you can approximate them without the curse of dimensionality. As I'll show in a few minutes, generalization is much better if you have sparsity of constituent functions. Um, in, uh, um, we know that in the uh, over-parameterized queer loss case, we can solve the optimization problem training by using SGD uh, with regularization means with weight decay. And you can do that if the underlying uh, sparse graph of the regression function, of the target function is known. In, for instance, uh, convolutional networks. If you don't know the graph, then, and this is a conjecture, is that um, the optimization with the sparsity constraint is solved by transformers using self-attention, and there may be better way to solve it than self-attention. That's an open problem. Okay, next slide. I'm going now in uh, <coughs> for about 10, 15 minutes about some of the main points in uh, there are more details, so that's a separate talk on the properties of uh, RLU networks, deep RLU networks, um, um, trained under the square laws for classification. So let's get into the next slide. Um, the main result, we, ha we have new results, is that we can uh, um, reach uh, zero error um, that we um, can prove that training with SGD plus weight decay has a bias towards low rank weight matrices. I think this is new as far as I know. Um, and then uh, um, there is an intrinsic SGD noise in the weight matrices um, which means that you never have exact convergence. You never have, even asymptotically for time going to infinity, you, ever, you always have um, non-zero gradient in the weights, at least in some of the layers. Um, we prove that there is this phenomenon of neural collapse that was discovered by David Dono and others three or four years ago, and we proved that unlike other proofs without any additional assumption, um, we proved that that can happen not only in the final layer, but also in the intermediate layers. Um, and this corresponds to a particular structure of the weight matrix, which becomes stiffer matrices with a small number of eigenfunctions that are orthogonal. And there are as many as the number of classes minus one. And then uh, the one point I want uh, to mention more in details is new generalization bound. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, very briefly, uh, this is a cartoon of the loss landscape without weight decay regularization. We know that in the case of overparameterization, you have degenerate <laughs> exact solution, zero loss solution, zero square loss solution, so exact interpolation of the labels. In our case, we consider binary classification, so the labels are plus one, minus one. You have exact interpolation, and this, uh, the parameter space corresponding to this minima is highly degenerate with a dimension which is W minus N, where W is the number of parameters and N is um, the number of data points. So, and typically we train these networks with many more uh, parameters than data points. In the case of CIFAR, it could be um, like half a million 
parameters for 50,000 data points. Um, so the landscape is something with um, flat, zero minima losses, where the water, the blue in that picture is, um, and we use uh, uh, pseudo-polar coordinates, where rho is the distance from the center. So uh, next slide shows, uh, yeah, that's the, this, uh, this would be region of zero loss, and all this valley could be connected together if um, there are some theorems, if the overparameterization is large enough. Other theorems showing that gradient descent converges to those. Um, next slide. Next slide. Let's, next slide. Let's go quickly through a few slides. We are using, um, uh, as I said, polar coordinates instead of the W, the weights. We are using normalized weights, Frobenius norm one, and then a row of parameters with the product of the Frobenius norm of the various weights. Um, and so the network corresponding to normalized weight matrix is this f of x with VL, the top layer, and then there are a LU of all the other weight matrices. And the whole network not normalized is G of x equal rho times f of x. Um, so next slide. Um, um, next slide. Next slide. Um, let's go over this next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, 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 next slide. Okay, so here typically you look at uh, generalization in terms from the theoretical point, point of view, you have bounds on the expected error, and actually on the bound between the expected and the empirical error. Um, and to do that, you use uh, concepts like VC dimensions or Radamacher complexity. Now, um, if you use VC dimensions, the number you get you are expecting something between 0 and 1, the expected error minus the training error. <laughs> but the number you, you get are larger than the number of parameters in the network, which are a lot, like 100,000, 1 million. So the um, bounds based on uh, VC dimensions in this overparameterized case are essentially meaningless, vacuous. This is the definition of Radamacher complexity, um, uh, where the sigma i are um, random uh, plus one variables. And um, we try to use uh, Radamacher. And next slide shows that, in general, uh, you get expression that gives you the generalization gap. The, expected error min minus the error on the training set, bounded by twice the Radamacher complexity of your network, plus some, some term. And, uh, um, and what appears here is that uh, because uh, the Radamacher complexity is homogeneous, you can take the rho, which is um, uh, because of the homogeneity of the RLU, um, that becomes the product of all the rows of the single weight matrices, so it becomes the product of those. And so the overall um, complexity here, there is two row, the Radamacher complexity of the network with normalized weights. So as you can see immediately, the row, which is the product of the norms, 
controls the generalization error. Smaller row, better bound. Next slide. Uh, um, I think it repeats the same things. Uh, you expect the square root of n from the rather macro complexity of a normalized network. The next slide shows some experiments in which we see we can control rho by increasing the, lab the random labels in the in cipher, and we get that increasing the random label uh, rho increases w one over rho decreases, and correspond in correspond correspondence with that as we increase um, the percentage of a, a random label, the test error also increases. So this is exactly says uh, what we expect from the bound. Larger row, worse test error. Next slide shows something interesting. You know, most of the success stories are not dense networks, are convolutional networks. This is where the, um, apart from transformers, where the success of deep networks was. Now, you can find it in many papers and uh, um, everywhere in computing the Radamacher complexity of a deep network. There is at some point this um, approximation that you have the matrix W time the input or the input from the layer below X, you have, you have this um, norm of WX. And typically what people do is a pretty harsh bound. It's saying, okay, um, this is, you know, less equal than, uh, you know, the norm of W times the norm of X. Okay, that's fine if uh, W is a dense matrix, but suppose that W is a, can I go back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if W is a sparse matrix, so <coughs> for instance, if you have a convolution, the W will be a Toeplitz matrix in which you have the kernel of the convolution in one row and then the kernel of the convolution displaced on the second row and so on. Suppose you are in the lucky case in which you don't have overlap between the rows. In that particular case, instead of doing this harsh bound, the square root of the, of the norm of Wx is norm of W times norm of X, you will take into account that each kernel is now essentially multiplying, uh, doing the dot product, only with a little part of the x vector, not all of it. And if you take that into account, you will see that you have from each row of the matrix a contribution that is the norm of the kernel, the norm of the row, time a fraction of x squared. And when you do all the calculation, instead of having the norm of the matrix w times the norm of x, as you have up here, you will get a bound which is the norm of the kernel time the norm of x. Okay. <coughs> this can be, you know, order of magnitudes smaller in the case of of uh, of uh, cipher uh, because the number of rows could be thousands or so. So, next slide shows, in fact, experiments in which we measure this rho over square root of n, a rho in which we took into account this estimate using the norm of the kernel, not the norm of the, the matrix, the template matrix, and we get estimates um, that are in the order, because there are some coefficients that I'm not showing, but in the order of um, um, between 0 and 1, or not much larger than 1. So instead of 
getting numbers that are millions or hundred thousands, we get numbers that are very close to being non vacuous. Um, this will be the actual experimental test error, and this will be the one estimated using this theoretical bound or rho over square root of n without taking into account some uh, constant which is probably in the order of two or three. And uh, uh, next slide shows a similar, similar one um, in which um, these numbers are ev even smaller. Okay, so this is just to make the point, the next slide, um, that, um, that sparsity is not only important for approximation, but it also improves generalization. It makes generalization possible or much better. Um, so these are the two points here. And, uh, and the question of whether this uh, assumption of sparseness is uh, uh, very special or not, I already answered, so I'll not answer it here. And um, I think with this, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tommaso, for the great talk. Any questions from the audience? Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, Sufian Hayu from National University of Singapore. So just, just a simple question. Um, so it seems that this uh, compositional sparsity could potentially explain generalization in deep neural networks. So a simple question would be, is there any empirical evidence that a fully trained neural network that achieves, let's say, state-of-the-art performance on some task, is there any empirical evidence that it can be decomposed as like a, compos a compositionally sparse function or something? Um, yeah, I think, um, um, you know, a, a, a neural network itself is a composition of functions. You can imagine of each layer being a function composed with the previous ones. Um, so if this was the question, the fact, um, I think uh, this is uh, in part supporting what I said. I say in part because what I said was that uh, this result of equivalence between um, compo compositional sparsity and Com efficient computability holds for smooth function, for function that have bounded derivatives. And uh, um, the, the sec this last part is not something that you, you get out from just a network, right? Um, I mean, this is a more technical discussion, but we can discuss about it. But, uh, but in, you know, like many of these, um, um, equivalence statement, it, it sounds like a tautology. I mean, theorems are supposed to be tautologies, but some are more tautological than others. <laughs> and this one, um, essentially, you could say, you know, uh, that if you can compute it, then it's compositional, and the network is compositional, so if it works, it can be computed. That's, I think, what you said, and yeah. it's true. Um, yeah, I, I assume it should be, like, to, to prove that a neural network is computable, it should be as hard as proving that it's compositionally sparse, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, you can think of, uh, for instance, a network, a deep, lay, a deep networks as um, a series of layers, and each layer could be thought as a step or a small number of steps in a Turing machine, right? So from this point of view, 
you can say the equivalence of Turing machines, assuming in principle an infinite number of layers. Um, it, 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 it's what, what is going on. Uh, th there is the more subtle point of um, what happens if the functions are not smooth and it's not um, then completely clear to me um, the following point. You know, I did not mention this, but when I speak about approximation, I speak about constructive approximation, which means that you have to be able to construct an approximation of a function from values of the function. Um, there are some approaches that show that if you if you forget about this term, you make things, then you can avoid the curse of dimensionality. But of course, these are theoretical, not practical. So if you don't have smoothness in the second derivative, in the first derivative, then it's not even clear whether you could sample values of the function in any meaningful way. You know, you can have a, a continuous function support at discrete points and a completely different continuous function that has the same values of those points if you don't have any bound on the derivatives. So anyway, but that's a more technical Thank question. you. Hi, thank you for the wonderful and interesting talk. I am mainly just curious about this, the proposed theorem that you had. The, the class of, if I understand correctly, the class of computable functions is the same as the class of computationally sparse functions. Um, and, I, and I agree that com computation is, comp is compositional in nature, but I am sort of curious, it seems quite strong to me that every computable function would be computationally sparse for some reasonable k. And so I'm curious if, uh, when you say sort of computable functions, if this is sort of the classical definition or if it's something more modern like your discussions with Max Techmark, like com computable functions that come up in nature or something of this sort. Yeah, I must say, you know, um, <clears throat> for the last uh, six years, I thought that the assumption of compositional sparseness was a strong one. And, uh, um, uh, Max uh, Tegmark had said, well, because interactions in physics are local, you expect functions to depend only on a small number of variables and so on. I did not quite believe it. I said something like, maybe evolution has wired our brain so that uh, local connectivity is preferred. So our, our brain is made up to be able to deal with sparse function and not with non-sparse ones. And so the problems we can solve and we are interested in are the sparse, the sparse ones. But, um, but if you make some restriction of what you are saying, like this uh, statement about, about smoothness, uh, bounded first derivatives, it seems that all functions must have a sparse representation. This is, you know, I think the theorem is correct, but I did not publish it, and so maybe it's wrong. If anybody of you will tell me where the mistake is, I'll be very happy to hear that and solve the problem. So I'm a little bit surprised, but not too much, because um, I found uh, over the last four years very difficult to come up with examples of functions that are not sparse. You know, everything you come up with, it seems to be the composition of, you know, relatively simple functions. And the whole computer science is built, of course, in theory of recursive functions, is built on composing stuff and getting more complicated stuff. So um, maybe the theorem is correct. I, and I know it's, um, I know you have to qualify a few things to, to define uh, things precisely. For instance, uh, it's important to say efficient computability, not just computability. You, you, you want to have a Turing machine um, with a complexity. The program it's running cannot have exponential complexity. So that's the, the, 
that's not the standard definition. They, they, they're both standard, but this original one is the, the one without this restriction. Um, uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, it would be wonderful if this idea of, of compositionality, of the fact that you, we, can, we can decompose complex tasks in simpler ones, um, the idea of modularity and so on that pervades, is pervasive in engineering, in science, in many things would be kind of an intrinsic property of, uh, of the function we are dealing with in practice. Thank you. Thanks for the, for the interesting talk. So I, I, I did think that compositional sparsity is, is probably behind a lot of, you know, um, why, why we can learn interesting functions. But I wonder about the, uh, the sort of theorem or conjecture that you've shown about, um, you know, equivalence between Lipschitz, uh, functions with Lipschitz derivatives and, 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 and uh, efficiently computable functions and the relevance of that all for um, machine learning. Because to me it seems that, you know, uh, well, one, one thing I didn't see in this theorem is the dimension. So if you have, you know, Lipschitz derivative in high dimension, this is still as hard to learn as, you know, just having a Lipschitz function, right? So just that, you know, uh, so, so sort of the way you motivated your talk by saying that, um, you know, learning Lipschitz functions is, is impossible, uh, that, that still holds for functions that have a Lipschitz derivative in high dimension. So I wonder, like, the whole talk was about learning functions, uh, but not so much about data, right? And so in some sense, functions restricted to data should be compositionally sparse. But if, let's say, you know, you say, well, you know, support of the data is low-dimensional, so I can exploit that, but you don't know the support of the data. Um, then, yeah, I'm just wondering about the role of dimension in the theorem and the relevance of that, because uh, Lipschitz derivative is not, not much, right? Let me see. Can you... Rep I missed some of what you say just because... Ah, sorry. I, yeah, no, it's, no, uh... I, it's, it's not your fault. I... <laughs> I have, a, I have a cold and a long flight, and that's not work well for my hearing. But yeah. <laughs> no worries. I arrived five minutes ago as well. <laughs> I was just wondering, in, so in the theorem that you've shown about the equivalence between efficiently computable functions and you know functions with Lipschitz derivative, where, where is the dimension? Uh, because functions with Lipschitz derivative are about as hard to learn in high dimension as Lipschitz functions, right? So. Um, or in general, I think there was very little talk about data, um, right, in, in, in what you presented, mostly about functions. So my interpretation is that, you know, functions restricted to support of the data, in this case, are, are somehow compositionally sparse. But if you don't know the support of data in high dimension, then I, I don't see how this factors into your theorem or how this is then <laughs> closing the loop back to the motivation of the talk. Uh, well, in terms of, uh, you know, classical learning theory, this uh, result will transfer into, when you speak about the regression function, will transfer into the probability distributions that are involved in um, describing your data. So, I assuming there is a probability distribution, which we, usually we don't know, um, which generates the data. And uh, when I say there is this uh, um, compositional sparseness, this is really a statement about the underlying probability distribution. You can think of factorizing them or so on in different groups. So uh, I spoke about functions, but you can translate that into um, the process that generate the data that you are getting, you know, IID, um, during learning, like in the classical uh, machine learning situation. Does, does that answer some of the questions? Well, yeah, that, that, that part is clear. It's more about the role of dimension in that statement about, it, you know, um, efficient computability and, and Lipschitz derivatives. I mean, what is, uh, so how, how does the dimension uh, of the input factor into, into that theorem? Because it was just that if you have a function with a Lipschitz derivative, then it's efficiently computable. Yeah. So that does not 
doesn't they mention play a role? Um, okay, let's speak later because I, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Any uh, other questions from the audience? Just have a simple maybe question. Um, I was even more um, sort of interested in how do you define uh, a, a function that is composed of quote unquote simple functions? So what is your notion of simplicity in the functions that you're composing? Is it just that they are taking a few number of inputs? Uh, or, or uh, is their inherent complexity small? Or how do you define composing a large function by simple functions? So what is the notion of simplicity for those functions? Um, you're asking about com what, how is composition defined? Right, no, so, so I'm just asking that uh, the, since we are making statements about the complexity of the entire function. Complexity? Right, so, so, so where does the complexity of the functions that you're composing with uh, factor into the theorem? Or where does it show, into, show up in the, in the theorem statement? Okay, in, uh, um, take as an example the binary tree. Right. Okay, that's um, the function graph. Each node is a function of two variables. Um, then, uh, you know, the, the, there is um, um, a dependence on D, the, the total number of variables. So at the base of the tree, you have as many variables as you want. Um, if your binary tree is deep enough, you can increase that as much as you want. And, um, but the complexity, the bound on the number of parameters does not increase exponentially with D, increases linearly with D, but there is a constant which is exponential in two, which is the number of variables of the constituent functions at the node of the trees. So, I see. And, 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 and the complexity of those constituent functions does not play a role. Sorry? And the complexity of those constituent functions does not play a role. Those constituent functions can, you know, just be regular or just be smooth and, and should be fine. Isn't it? Yeah, and that complexity, you know, could be um, epsilon to the minus two in terms of number of variables. Um, instead of two, you have 10. It could be epsilon to the minus 10. It, it should be not too high, but that depends on the power of the computer you have at your disposal. The fact is that those are bounded, do not increase if you increase the number of variables d of the overall function. I see, I see. Thank you. Uh, so if you have more questions, please uh, uh, talk with Tommaso offline. And I would be happy to, yeah. And let's thank Tommaso again for the great talk. And <laughs> so our next speaker uh, will from uh, Professor Simon Du from University of uh, Washington. Uh, and he will talk about something very interesting about multi-task representation learning. So let's welcome Simon. Uh, thanks for the introduction. All right, let me check my slides. All right, okay. Um, all right, uh, thanks for the invitation and that's great to be here. So today I'm going to talk about our recent work on understanding representation learning and use the uh, theoretical understanding to derive uh, new data selection algorithm to improve the representation learning. All right, so to get everyone on the same page, uh, so let me give you an example of uh, representation learning, how we use it in practice. So usually, so this is called the multi-task representation learning uh, setting where we have some source tasks, uh, which is for uh, for training the representation. Usually, the source task can be uh, you know with a lot of data, 
and the goal is to train the representation. So the definition of representation is here. Basically, it's just a mapping from, say, input or image to the second of the last layer of your neural network. So, for example, you have mapped an image to this vector, and this is a representation of this uh, image. Okay? And this representation function is this mapping from the image to this uh, second to the last layer's vector. Okay? So, uh, what we do for representation learning, we use, uh, say, ImageNet to train uh, this neural network, okay, say, ResNet. And then we have a target task. That is a task we really want to solve. For example, here we consider this VLC7 dataset. It's a few shot learning task. Uh, we have 20 classes, and each class only have uh, one to eight examples per class. So that's a few shot learning task. Um, okay, so there's a big difference between using representation learning and without using representation learning. So if you don't use representation learning and you only use this small data set, okay, because you have few examples per class, you can only get 5% to 10% accuracy. Whatever method you want to use, like trees, neural networks, kernels, or linear functions, um, you know, because it's a 20 class a classification problem, even you use random guess, you can get five percent, around 5% uh, accuracy. So you cannot do much. But if you use representation learning using this framework, uh, you first learn representation, and then you just retrain the last linear layer of this uh, neural network for using for this target task. So you can boost performance from five to ten percent to fifty to eighty percent accuracy. So that's a huge performance boost for this image classification task. So this is uh, give you a flavor of uh, why representation learning is so powerful in today's uh, machine learning. All right, so this is uh, only one example for image, but you know, representation learning is a general idea have been widely used in uh, many uh, applications, including natural language processing and uh, graph representation learning, where we use, uh, say, hidden state. Nowadays, we use transformer, and also we can use graph, we use graph neural network to learn representation for each node or each graph of the, uh, uh, the input graph. All right, so the first part, I want to talk about um, like what are the theoretical uh, foundations, uh, so for theoretical foundation of this multitask representation learning. So we'll talk about what are the necessary and sufficient conditions that permit uh, the representation learning framework to improve the performance. So you can imagine if there's no, you know, you do not put any assumption between those source tasks and target tasks, they are completely irrelevant, so you cannot hope to you know, this representation learning to improve the performance. So you need some conditions. I want to dig into what is the conditions that permit this efficient uh, transfer learning from the source to target us using the representation learning framework. All right, to motivate the second part of the talk, uh, there's a trend on big models, okay? So when we use big models on big data, uh, so this is a data size. Uh, also, the, big, the data size here, we use a uh, 35 billion words to train the big language model, and for the model size, also increased as well. Nowadays, we use uh, this large number of uh, parameters in our model. Okay, uh, so this is also belongs to the general framework of representation learning, and because those data used for training language models or other uh, big model, foundation models are very uh, cheap. So you can just use as much data as possible in terms of the, um, because they are cheap, so you can just use it as possible if you have enough computation power. On the other hand, um, if you are not Google or Facebook or OpenAI, you are a small company or you're at school, you don't have enough computation resource or money to really train those big models, you really need to you know, develop some new methods to uh, leverage this model, for example, if you have for your own data. Okay? For example, for GP3, there are 175 billion parameters in these 45 terabytes of data. You know, the estimated cost around $10 million uh, to train the model. And I think most of the you know, small organizations do not have the, this amount of money to train one model. Right? So a more practical scenario would be uh, you have limited resources uh, which resource can be the money, the GPUs, or the engineers to uh, pre-process those data. And 
on the other, also you have only one or few target downstream tasks, or the basically the uh, target uh, task you want to solve. So here is different from the framework for GP3 or BERT, where you want to train one model and um, to use them for uh, all kinds of uh, downstream tasks. Here, suppose you only have one or a few target tasks that you really want to solve, and you want to leverage this foundation model of representation learning to improve the performance on the target task. So what do you do with limited uh, resource you have? Um, so this talk, we will um, describe one method to you know, give more efficient training for uh, this kind of scenario, where you have a limited resource. Uh, so our main idea is to do data selection and task selection. So in multi-task representation learning, you have a lot of tasks to choose from to train your representation, but not, not all of them are really useful for your target task. So we want to really only select those relevant tasks uh, for training the representation, so we can improve the, uh, the training efficiency, also all the engineering uh, burden of this representation learning step instead of using all the data available if you are not uh, because you are not Google or Facebook All right, so these are the motivations, you know generally the resource needed to scale with number of training pre-training data need So once we you do some selection, you don't need to use all the pre-training data Also, there are some recent studies showing that if you do some you know, data and task selection, you can actually improve the performance um, even if you can tr use all the data available. All right, so our general approach is active learning. So active learning is definitely not new. It's been well studied in uh, uh, machine learning for many years. Uh, but classical active learning mostly focus on single task uh, learning where you have a pool of data and you want to only select a few data to uh, curate its labels. Okay, so that is for classical active learning. What we do is uh, active learning for representation learning. Okay, so it's a different angle from the uh, classical active learning. So we select, so our goal is to learn good representation, and our goal is to select which relevant tasks we include uh, during your pre-training phase. Okay. And here, uh, today I'll describe our work on task level active learning for the multi-task uh, representation, representation learning setting. All right, so this is the uh, outline of today's talk. I'll first talk about our work on supervised multitask representation learning about the theory. The key notion here uh, to take away is the diversity of the task, which is important for uh, multitask representation learning for in this passive setting. And then I'll talk about our work on active multitask representation learning, where we need to define the task relevance between the source and target task and use this relevance to uh, sample uh, data from the source tasks, okay? And they will present some algorithms, theory, and experiments. All right, so let's start from the first part. All right, so to get, uh, you know, to get a little bit more technical, let's describe the setting here. So this is a multi-task representation learning setting where we have, say, big T, uh, T uh, big T number of tasks, and let's say input, there are x1, to X big T. So what representation learning do? Uh, we'll learn a common representation, which is H function, okay, from the input to uh, a representation learning, representation layer, okay? And this, importantly, it is shared across all the tasks. So all X1 to X T, uh, all these T tasks share the same representation learning layer. And then for the task-specific prediction, because they have t-tasks, they, you know, they have different labels, so you have a different uh, prediction layer, which, is, uh, which are this g1 to gt. Okay? And the composition of g and this h is your end-to-end uh, -end, uh, prediction function from the input to uh, the label. Okay? So this is a source task. We learn, use the source task to learn the representation. And then for the target task, we will fix uh, this representation, which is a small h, and then we'll fix this h, and we just retrain the last, line, last layer. Usually the last layer, you know, for both g or this specific f for the target task, there are kind of uh, simple uh, function classes, uh, like linear function or, you know, one or two layer neural network. Okay? Uh, by the way, if you have any question, you can interrupt me. I'm happy to answer during the talk. 
so this is a more formal formulation. Let's say for we have t source tasks, each has uh, n1 data points. So these are the notations for the source task. So you have x1t, y1t, to xn1t, yn1t, and t is from 1 to big T. So this is called the uniform pass of something because each task you have the same number of data points. Later I'll talk about active sampling where if you have different number of uh, data for different, uh, different number of data for different tasks, then you actually can further improve the performance there. So to learn the representation, which is this H function, what we do is to solve this kind of a bilevel optimization problem. So in the say, outer loop, uh, you try to minimize small h, and this h is shared across all t tasks. And here, let's focus on the linear prediction layer. So the last linear layer, uh, we denote them as w1 to uh, w big T. So you have t k dimensional uh, linear predictors. So k is the number, or k is the, the dimension of the representation. Okay. Uh, so you try to solve this uh, objective function where you have some laws. Let's say for today, we'll focus on quadratic laws. And your prediction is this uh, inner product between the linear predictor, wt, for the small t's task, and this representation, which maps input, say, it's xit to a k-dimensional vector. And this loss measures uh, how well you predict on this particular data. Uh, so here, for today's talk, we will not discuss optimization. We will assume you can really solve this problem using whatever algorithm, like we sent, and then we will analyze the solution of this, uh, um, of, this, uh, of this objective function. All right, so this is how we use to learn the representation. And then, uh, for the new task, we just learn the predictor. Okay, usually, you know, remember, for the future learning task, I described in the beginning, we have very few data from the target task. Let's say we have nt plus one data, which is usually much smaller than n1, okay? So this n2 should be uh, nt plus one. Uh, and so example from some distribution, and what we do is to learn um, this wt plus one. So we fix the representation learned from the uh, previous, uh, the source task, and we just learn this last linear layer. So this is a convex optimization problem. It's a linear predictor learning problem. Uh, so it's easy to solve. Um, so this is the frame, uh, setting we're gonna analyze. Okay. All right. Uh, so here, you know, we consider the setting that we fix the previous layer and there's some more recent work, I think by Jason uh, and Chi, where they also analyze the meta learning uh, where you can also change the uh, h uh, to some, you know, training training h during the predict, uh, predictor learning phase as well. All right, so let's first review what we know about the, from the classical statistical learning theory if you don't have representation learning, okay? So this is what we know. Suppose you only use um, the target task data. So you can get, uh, so you will learn both the representation and the uh, predictor together, and you solve this empirical risk minimization problem. What you can get is some theorem like this. Okay, so you have uh, remember for a target task, you only have nt plus one data. It's you know, very small, um, and you, what your loss can be bounded by this uh, term, which is ch plus k divided by nt plus one. Okay. So CH is a um, complex measure of this representation uh, class just for this H, okay? Um, you know, you can use number of variables, uh, which I mentioned, the number of complexity, uh, those kind of uh, learning theory uh, complex measures to capture the how complex this uh, function is. And then you have, because you have a K-dimensional linear predictor, you also have a K term here. Generally speaking, uh, the CH is much bigger than K because uh, usually we use like a very complicated neural network as representation, but you only use a uh, linear predictor for your predictor uh, specific layer. Okay, so this is what we know about, you know, if supervised learning is uh, well studied. Um, okay, so now what we need to show, we want to show and study is the uh, uh, when, you know, you can get a better bond using uh, representation learning. So this is what we know for only using the target task, but here we want to understand if you use representation learning, why you can do better. So you can, in terms of theory, you hope to get a better bond than this one, okay? 
All right, so what do we need? Uh, you can imagine, as I talked about before, uh, if you don't have any assumption uh, between the source task and target task, you cannot hope to uh, achieve anything from the source task. Okay, so you do need some assumption. Okay, the first assumption, which is pretty natural, at least for this setting, is that there exists a good representation that is a shared good representation that is good for both uh, the source task and the target task. Okay, so formally, Let's say there exists some uh, h star, which belongs to uh, this big h function class. Uh, so h star will map this input to a k-dimensional vector, and there exists a set of linear predictors, also k-dimensional, such that for both the source tasks and the target task, the composition of h star and t uh, w star will achieve, uh, say, zero loss. So you can also generalize zero loss to some small loss. But basically, there exists a commonly, sh uh, like a shared uh, representation H star that is good for both uh, the, the source task and the uh, target task, okay? So why this is a natural assumption? If you don't believe this is true, you should not use representation learning, at least for this framework in the first place, because this framework is really using you f first learn the representation and then you fix the representation to learn uh, the target task. So if you no such representation exists, you should not use this uh, framework or this um, procedure in the first place. Okay. So uh, the next natural question is that uh, if you have this assumption, then it is sufficient to show that you can improve the uh, sample, uh, like the the bond for representation learning. Okay. So here uh, we give uh, here. Let me show you a very simple example that this is assumption alone is not enough. Okay, so you need some further assumption in order to show that representation learning really helps. So let's consider this example. Say you have a one thousand dimensional zero one vectors. Um, so they are the input, and I can tell you that the good representation is the first one hundred dimension. So the raw um, input is 1,000 dimension, but the good representation is just the first 100 dimension. So, you know, a good representation function is just a mapping from the 100, you know, the raw input of 1,000 dimension to the first 100 dimension, okay? And by good, I mean that, you know, all the tasks, both source and target tasks, only need the first 100 digits uh, for the accurate prediction. Uh, and predicting, you know, rather, like the task can be you know, predicting the 10th digits one or predicting the sum of the first 100 digits. So let's consider this bad scenario, okay? So if the source task, okay, only, although they all share the good representation of the first 100 digits, but the first source task only to need to use first 50 digits. For example, predicting whether the 10th digit is one or not, but they only rely on using the first 50 digits. And there exists some target task that need to use all the first 100 digits. For example, predict the sum of the uh, first 100 digits. Okay? And you can imagine there can be some scenario like this where you know, the source has, although they share the good representation for both the source and target task or for the first 100 dimension, but in the real data you have, you, uh, you only need to use the first 50 digits for the source task. So you can not learn anything about the first, uh, 51st digits to the 100th digits, right? So in this scenario, you can imagine you cannot learn good representation uh, for the target task because it needs the first uh, 51st digits to the uh, 100th digits, right? And this is really the worst case target task, uh, which you know, even though both source and target task share common good representation, it's not enough for uh, representation learning uh, to transfer from the source to the target task, to improve the performance of the target task. All right, so what do we really need? We need kind of a, a, a diversity of the source task. Basically what, you know, intuitively, you know, representation learning is used for only if the source task, okay, uh, is, can give the full information about this representation, which is for the previous example, you know, the source task, should somehow cover the entire uh, first 100 digits information in order to you know, you know, to learn the entire information about this good representation. And that's why it can transfer to any source uh, target task in the downstream uh, 
uh, downstream stage. Okay, so here we need to give a formal definition of diversity. Uh, although this is and this diversity definition should capture this uh, uh, intuition. So here's our uh, definition. So here, remember, this is our first assumption. There exists a common good representation, H star. So what we need for this diversity is the following. So remember, we have t tasks, um, and it corresponds to, say, um, t k-dimensional vectors, w1 star to wt star. So this diversity, we mean it's uh, this matrix, which is big w star. It's a composition of w1 star to wt star. It's k by t matrix. It's a full rank matrix. Okay? So implicitly, we're assuming that t is at least big as k. So it can cover the span of the good representation. So why we call this is diversity? Because you know, this uh, W star, which is linear predictors for the source task, it really covers the entire kind of uh, uh, space of this representation, okay? So for example, in the counter example I gave to you, uh, the W star is not a full rank matrix. It is a low rank matrix and does not cover the entire uh, span of the representation, right? So here, let me give you some uh, sample theorem we have. Uh, based on these two assumptions. So with these two assumptions, you can actually show that you can improve the sample complexity uh, bound uh, compared with uh, not using the representation learning. So this is the first example, which is uh, called linear representation class. Um, so the representation function is just a matrix which maps a TD dimensional vector to a K dimensional vector. And K, D is the original input, and K is representation uh, dimension. And K is much smaller than D. So the first assumption will become like this. There exists some B star of dimension K by D, and this set of vectors, W1 star, WT plus 1 star, the composition of B star X and W star, uh, they achieve zero loss. So this is the theorem we can show. So under these two assumptions, we can get a bound like this, okay? So we have two terms. Uh, the first term corresponds to uh, learning the representation. And second term represents uh, corresponds to learning the target predictor. Okay? So we have dk or uh, n1 times the least single value uh, of this w star matrix squared. Okay? So this least single value under our assumption 2 is always uh, uh, positive because it is a full rank matrix. All right, so here let me give you some more concrete uh, example. So, so let's say in the benign case, um, if you normalize the, uh, the weight vectors for each task to be one, and then the least in the benign case where you have, say, constant condition number for W star, then your uh, least single value of W star can be as large as square root of T by K. Okay? So if you plug in the square root of T by K back to this bound, you will have N1T in the denominator, and you have DK score in the numerator, okay? And then you also have a second term, okay? So the DK term represents uh, learning this representation class, which is uh, BK by D matrix, okay? So if you compare in this benign case scenario and the, uh, uh, you know, directly learning the linear predictor without using representation learning, the bound will be D or NT plus one. So first, you compare the second term, k over nt plus 1, and d over nt, nt plus 1. Uh, k is much smaller than d, so our second term is much smaller. For the ter first term, the denominator will be n1 uh, times t. So remember, in the source task, we have a lot of data. And we have uh, n1 data for t task. And it's much bigger than nt plus 1. So the first term, if you have a large number of data in the source task, much smaller than, the second, than, than this term as well. So in this case, we show that under these two assumptions, you can actually decrease uh, the error rate by a lot because you have, for learning this representation, your denominator really the number of data in your uh, source tasks, okay? So this is for uh, the simplest representation learning class. It's a linear class uh, or substance learning. We also have a more general uh, result uh, where we have a general function class, H star. Um, and we have a similar result here. And instead of, uh, you know, have dk here, we have some complex measure of this function class, which is ch. 
And uh, the CH uh, is some complex measure for this representation class, can be Gaussian bits of this um, representation function class. So in the benign case, again, this um, sigma, uh, least single value square can be T or K. Uh, so we have this kind of bound, and you can compare this bound with the uh, result using representation learning bound. Um, so again, we change the denominator, improve the denominator from NT plus one to N1T. So this is a big improvement when the source domain data is much, uh, number of data is much bigger than the number of data in the target task, okay? So we show that these two assumptions, um, they are uh, kind of enough to show that they are, you can improve the sample complexity uh, using representation learning. Okay, so key take of main message is that these two assumptions, the existence of a good representation for both the source and target task, and this diversity of the task are the key conditions that enable representation learning to improve the sample efficiency. Okay, so yeah, so this is pretty much about the first part of the talk. Um, the second part of the talk, we want to further, you know, give a fine-grained characterization between the source and target task. So in the first part of the talk, uh, the target task, basically you can be any worst case target task. If you have these two assumptions, you can show improvement. But what if you have some more fine-grained uh, connection between the source and target task, and then you can actually do better uh, by doing more active sampling of the data. All right, so what we really need here is the notion of task relevance. Okay, so remember our goal for active learning is to select the most relevant source task for the target task. Suppose here you only have one target task, only one that you want to solve instead of the many or the worst case target task. And you know this task and you want to just select the most relevant source task uh, to train your representation for the target task. So here we need to define, say, a relevance or like index between each source task and the target task in order to do the sampling. Okay, so here let me give you an example I gave you before. So again, we have 1,000 dimensional input vectors, they're one vectors. Uh, it's a good representation, it's the first 100 dimension. So I give you this bad scenario where the source task only need to use the first 50 digits, but the target task need to use the first 100 digits. So in this case, if you don't have this diversity assumption, uh, you cannot learn a good representation for the target task. So, but here you can consider this scenario. The source task, again, only uses the first 50 digits, but if your target task also only uses the first digits, uh, then you're fine, like, because you already have the information about the first 50 digits, um, then you learn a good representation for the target task as well. So here, notice that this is not kind of the worst case target task. This is a more like a benign case uh, of the target task. But if you're in this benign case, you can actually do better than the worst case. Okay, so here, let me give you the formal definition of our task relevance. So again, we have this assumption. Uh, we still need this assumption like you have a, you know, uh, existence of good representation for both the source and target task. Um, so here's our key definition of the task relevance. Okay, so first, uh, we still need to assume the, um, this WT plus one star, which is a linear predictor for the target task, lies in the span of the source task linear predictors, which is uh, W1 star to WT star uh, concatenation. This is a K by T matrix, okay? So in the previous example, as long as, you know, it's equivalent to say that, you know, the first, um, the, the target task also uses the first 50 digits. Okay, uh, so you still need to, at least you still need to cover the, um, the, the, the linear predictor of the target task, okay? But you don't need this uh, W star to be, big W star to be full rank, but you only need it lies in the span, a uh, double key point star lies in the span of this big W star, okay? So now, uh, given this assumption, we know that there exists some vector such that you can, you know, represent WT1 star using the vectors of W star. And there are many uh, to kind of interpolate WT plus star using the vectors in W star, okay? And there exist many uh, such uh, coefficients. So uh, here we define um, this, uh, like kind of the optimal interpolation in terms of the minimum norm of uh, this interpolation coefficient, okay? So there are many coefficients that can interpolate uh, WT1 star, T plus one star, 
uh, but we choose those coefficients with a minimum uh, L2 norm, okay? Okay, so this will give you the uniqueness of those coefficients, okay? So this uh, new, which is uh, the coefficients, or this new star with the optimal coefficients, is a t-dimensional uh, vector, okay? Because you have t tasks, and each task, we have a score uh, to calculate the uh, relevance between the source, that source task and the target task. Okay, so in total you have t tasks. So uh, your this vector will be something like this, okay? On, on, the, on my left, it's like 0.3, 0 0.4 to something like 0.5, something like that. Uh, so the S entry is the relevance between the source task I and the target task. Okay, so it's a uniquely defined with this um, WT plus and star and double star. Okay. So, um, so here we minimize the warming to have a unique new star. And um, uh, so if you have new star equals one, it's equivalent to say that you have one source task that equals to the target task. And the others are orthogonal meaning that, you know, WT one stars or this vector is orthogonal to the other W stars in big W star, okay? So this is one case uh, where you have one uh, new star equals one for one tree and zero for the other entries. All right, so here let me show you uh, with this um, task relevance why we can improve the bound uh, using uh, active learning. So first let's review what we know for passive learning. Okay, this is new definition. So what we can show here uh, is basically the same proof as before, but we can show that you don't need, if you, uh, this new star exists, okay, so basically WT plus one star lies in the span of double star, yeah, then this is a kind of benign case, you don't really need the uh, uh, full rankness of double star, then you can actually have a bond like this, okay? So it's DK times the uh, norm, the new star uh, norm square divided by N1 plus uh, this uh, second term. Okay, so here I uh, want to do some active learning to further improve this bond, okay, from the theoretical point of view. And later I'll show you some experiments as well. All right, so first uh, let's imagine we know this new star. This is definitely a very strong assumption. In practice, you don't know this new star. But let's first design uh, like a hypothetical algorithm with this known new star. And later we estimate this new star uh, iteratively. Okay? So instead of, uh, remember for passive learning, we have same number of data per uh, source task. But here we have, we sample the data according to this um, uh, WT, uh, new, sorry, new star uh, T square. So for the small T uh, source task, we sample uh, proportional to this number, okay? So let's say in total we have N1T budget, just like the passive setting, but we don't sample them uniformly, we sample proportional to this new T star square. And the other uh, steps are the same, we still learn this representation uh, using the bilevel optimization, and we fix this H and um, learn uh, the la last layer for the target task again. Okay, so the only thing we change is that we, instead of using a uniform sampling, we use uh, like non-uniform sampling according to this uh, task relevance. All right, so this is what we can show for um, uh, for a no one new star, so we can have improve a bond something like this. Uh, it's kind of approximate sparsity. Uh, so let me explain here. So you have dk s star uh, times new star square, uh, new star norm square, and the second term the same for both uh, active and uni or passive learning. Okay. So this s star is kind of um, truncated approximate sparsity. So if it's uh, bigger than some threshold, then we truncate it, it to be one. If it's smaller, then it's zero. Um, and it's uh, defined in this way. All right, so uh, if, remember if you have a positive something, you have dk times norm, this uh, new star norm square divided by n1, okay? Uh, so you can, first you can show that this bond is never worse than the positive something, so we're not losing anything if you can do this active learning. And here for certain uh, scenario, we can do much better. So here's kind of this example. 
So there, you have one source task equals to the target task, but the others are orthogonal, and you know this task relevance. So here, uh, you can show that a star equals one, new star equals one for one entry, and then if you compare this to bond, okay, so you have a star equals one in our the active learning bound, and in the passive learning bound, you don't have this a star, and a star equals one. So you have one, one over t improvement over the passive sampling. Okay, so this is one scenario you have a clear improvement. So what is the intuition for this example? So suppose you, know, you have in total t towards source task, and there's one source task that is exactly equal to the target task. And you can do you know, uh, active sampling from this source task. So what you should do? In the passive sampling, you just uniform sample all the, from all the source tasks. Then you are waste most of your data because you are sampling from those orthogonal tasks to the target task. So what you should do is just you just use all your budget to sample from this source task that is equal to the target task. So use all your budget, just sample from this one particular task. Then definitely you will have a one or t improvement in terms of the sample complexity. Okay, so that's the intuition. Again, uh, but our bond is more kind of adaptive, it adapts to many other scenarios as well. But this is one uh, takeaway example that if you have one source task that equals to the target task, then you should just sample uh, just from this source task. And you should not use waste your sample from the other orthogonal task. Okay? Uh, so if you don't know this new star, we can actually just iteratively estimate it. Um, so basically, we have two ideas, kind of similar to online learning or bandits. Uh, we can estimate new star iteratively and use a doubling schedule. So uh, we first initialize some other estimation, new hat t to be one for all the tasks. And we each, at each epoch, we sample according to our formula, which is proportional to this estimated new t hat star, uh, square. And for the j apple, we sample say two to a portion to the, say two to the j uh, uh, samples. Okay, and then we learn the representation. We learn the linear predictor for the target task, and we solve this uh, uh, linear program. Um, uh, sorry, this convex program uh, to estimate this new star, uh, new hat, okay. and then we repeat it. So this is a you know, doubling schedule, and we iterate estimate new star. Uh, so if we have unknown new star, we have some, some lower order term uh, which accounts for estimating this new star. But the other terms are the same. So you can still get some improvement. You have uh, generally large amount of data. All right, so here let me show you some interesting experiments. Uh, we will compare um, you know, active learning and uh, passive learning. Okay? So this is a data set. It's called Amnist Corruption. Uh, so we formulated it as a multitask representation learning setting. Here we have there are 16 types of uh, corruptions. So you know these are the 15 types, and there's uh, like original image, which is uh, uh, the 16th uh, type of uh, corruption, which which is basically no corruption. Okay. So and so here we construct a multitask learning uh, setting. So each we have. Uh, uh, 10 digits and 16 types of corruption. So in total, we have uh, 160 binary tasks. And each target task has 150 source tasks, which correspond to uh, 10 digits and uh, 15 other types of corruptions. So we have in total 160 you know, target tasks uh, for testing. And uh, for each task, we con uh, construct like 150 source tasks to learn representation. So here, uh, we consider two kind of representation function. One is a linear low rank representation, or basically self space learning, and the other one is a two layer neural network for this image data. Okay, so here's our experimental results. On the left is the heat map of the improvement. If it's positive, it just shows the uh, improvement uh, of using active learning or active sampling or the uh, passive uniform sampling. So you can see here the majority of the uh, most of numbers are positive, and um, uh, there's some summary statistics. So, so for every, so, okay, so for uh, each column, it corresponds to uh, one digit, and each row corresponds to one kind of uh, corruption. Okay, so uh, the average improvement is 1.1 percent, and this is still significant because the baseline error is around 8 uh, percent. 
and the positive improvement is uh, 136 or in total 160 tasks. And on the right, you can see this histogram um, where this orange uh, uh, curve corresponds to our active learning. It's called ADA. So it's, you know, shift to the left, which corresponds to, you know, with a smaller arrow. Or, and the blue curve is the original non-adaptive sampling. Okay. So this is for linear representation. You can get this kind of improvement. Uh, oh, by the way, so, you, you know, this is, uh, you know, you improve, this is using the same number of uh, budget for source task. So if uh, you have, you know, in another setting where you have some target arrow, then you can, it's equivalent to say that you, for a certain target arrow, you can use fewer data to achieve this error rate. So using this active learning. So this is results for convolution neural network. Um, the results are similar. The baseline is stronger because we use a stronger function class for representation. The baseline error is 6%. Uh, and then here we get 0.68% uh, improvement. All right, so another, uh, yeah, and uh, most of the tasks we had in positive improvement. All right, so in the last part, I want to talk about one interesting observation from the, our experiments, is that you can actually, you know, learn this reference, this actually you have some expandability um, using our definition of task relevance, okay? So, uh, so this is one uh, example from our experiments. Uh, there are many similar examples, so this is for uh, that our target task is to classify whether an image is DJ2 or not, and the corruption is called glass blur. And this is the heat map uh, we learned um, uh, for the task relevance, the new star we, we learned, okay? So you can see here, um, um, you know, we have 150 source tasks, and this is task relevance for those source tasks, for task relevance scores. So you can see here, because this target task is about classifying whether the, the image is two or not, you can see here we find that the task relevance score for other score tasks is also about classifying this uh, image, image two is, is two or not, has a much bigger value, which corresponds to the, the third column of this uh, uh, left heat form. Okay? So you can see here there are many bright cells, um, and those correspond to a very large task relevance score uh, for those source tasks. And they are also about classifying whether a digit is two or not. So this is, can be used in a way to uh, provide an expandability for uh, representation learning. So this is for linear substrates learning. For ConvNet, the situation is more complicated. The many cells in um, DJ2 is still very bright, but uh, there are also any, many other cells that are also bright as well. So, you know, for convolution neural network, it's nonlinear, so there's something unknown going there as well. And this is left as an open problem. All right, so this gives you some, uh, you know, explainability about, you know, the relevance between tasks. And this is purely learned by the data. You know, we did not pr uh, impose any prior knowledge about this. Um, uh, you know, these tasks. All right, so in summary, um, for the second part, you know, I believe active learning is very useful uh, in representation learning and is underexplored, okay? And here we give a formal definition of task relevance and we show that it can be stronger than passive learning in both theory and practice and also uh, the score gives you some interpretability as well. Uh, for future work, uh, generally I believe there's a huge potential of active learning for representation learning uh, or general data selection. We can do some more principal methods to uh, learn representation learning for pre-training. Uh, here we learn everything from scratch, but nowadays if you have a GP3, uh, you do not purely learn from scratch, you will have some pre-trained model and then you fine tune on top of that and you can still do active learning for that. Uh, there can be other definitions of task relevance uh, not using our uh, minimum norm, but there can be other uh, relevance to capture the uh, connection between different tasks. And then lastly, uh, you can also study other you know, representation learning frameworks like uh, contrastive learning. Can you do active contrast learning there? Uh, that's concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, thanks, Simon, for the great talk. Any questions? 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for the very refreshing talk. Uh, I have two quick questions. The first one is, how sensitive are these results to the realizability assumption? Ah, that's a good question. So uh, you can show some uh, like agnostic bound uh, for supervised learning. For the uh, active learning part, we didn't analyze. I believe you can some, get some similar bound. And experimentally, no, just definitely not realizable and it still yeah, works. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Great, and, and the second question uh, pertains, th this assumption of task relevance. So if the predictors that I have are linear, then it's very clear that I should enforce my target uh, predictor to be spanned by the previous yeah, ones. Yeah. So how should I understand this assumption in the nonlinear case? Uh, it's largely open, I would say. Uh, there's at least one paper studying that using some kind of eluder dimension to capture the uh, the connection between the source and target task, but for uh, it's hard to you know, generalize that to the active learning setting. So yeah, it's still open. Um, I, I, I think it's still kind of open for nonlinear predictors. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other? Thank you. Hey, how did you define the V star for the convenient experiment? Was this in the parameter space or like? Oh, it's always in the, like, so new star is always defined as the last linear, la using the last linear layer. So you can always define it, whatever, define this uh, task relevance or this new star uh, whatever, um, on whatever representation function uh, you're using. As long as your last linear, your predictor is a linear layer. I see, so there's, there's no nonlinear part before. Yeah, so nonlinear before for representation, and there's a linear for predicting. I see, okay, thanks. Uh, in your assumption, you had that uh, W star lies in the span of the other uh, Ws. Uh, is it possible to also get a bound where there's not a perfect W star that lies in the span, but there's something else that lies in the span with a very small error? Uh, I think should the uh, analysis should work there. Like you have some uh, agnostic uh, bound that depends on the uh, complementary space of the WT plus one star. Okay, thank you. Um, could you comment a little bit more on how the S parameter depends on um, the doubling procedure or how you sample from new star? Ah, okay, so the S star parameter is kind of a approximate sparsity. Like uh, if it's very sparse, then uh, which means that there are only a few uh, source tasks that are actually relevant to the target task. And you, so it's also, you know, it's defined through new stars, so you can sample according to new star uh, based on that. Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, I was, I was basically interested in sort of uh, how does the norm that you minimize, so, so essentially you take the minimum L2 norm new star. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So here uh, we use, we use uh, L2 norm because we can kind of recover the result in the surprise learning. But uh, there's a, we also have an ongoing work. We actually can, you know, this, we can generalize L2 norm to some L1 norm and actually can get better bounds. Uh, I think we'll release it in, uh, in a few months, yeah. Right, because more pointy norms may, may make more sense because you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. right, right. And especially for sparsity, uh, it makes more sense to use L1 instead of uh, L2 there. Right, thank you. Um, have you looked at how sensitive Newstar is to changes in the initialization or maybe the architecture? Uh, I think we've done some ablation study there. It's not very sensitive, at least for our, because we, are, we only tested uh, kind of simple representation function, uh, so not very sensitive. But yeah, we, uh, it's interesting to test on larger models in terms of initialization. Hello, uh, so in your, in your setting, you train only for, for the target task, you train only this linear, uh, linear of uh, dimension k uh, vector, right? Yeah. So it means that we can easily have uh, uh, some like under parameterized uh, situation there, for example, the number of, even in target task, the number of samples is less, is bigger than k because this k is usually, k, it's like 1,000 or less. Uh, yeah. 
So is it, do you, do you expect something here, um, so some quality of different behavior if we have this target task is under parameterized or over parameterized? Because in, in our like standard cases, usually it's important in which uh, regime we are over parameterized. So yeah, so most of, uh, all my work uh, so for this talk is kind of under parameterized setting where uh, the N is bigger than the complexity of the predictor. Uh, there are some work that extend to the over parameterized setting. Um, but will, the, the bound will be more complicated and depend on certain complexity of the, uh, the predictors and the function class. Okay, thank you. So uh, due to the limitation of time, uh, let's thank uh, Simon for the great talk. So uh, after the talk, we have a coffee break until uh, 11.30 and the talk, the session will resume. Uh, around 11.30, thanks. Oh, there's an other poster session uh, during the coffee break, yeah.
ちょっと話を聞かせてもらいたい。<笑>はい、皆さん、こんにちは。コーヒーブレイク。そう、この最後の質問の時に、は、プロフェッサーの千里です。彼は、何か質問を受けたときに、質問を受けたときに、質問を受けたときはい、um, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for inviting me.、Uh, so, today I'm going to talk about reconstructing training data from the model gradient or the loss gradient. So, this is、um, joint work with my student Zihan and Jason over there. Okay. So, we know that、uh, we have been making a lot of progress of machine learning and、uh, it has been applied to different areas. And we,、uh, during our exploration, we are interested in improving the models in different directions. And、uh, for the people who know me,、uh, I mostly, previously, I worked more on the improving the computational and、uh, sample efficiency for machine learning. And、uh, I would say that that is our current, like, at least, efforts in pursuing each direction in machine learning. Like, most of the time, Accuracy or the performance is like the top priority. And、uh, we also like sample efficiency, like、uh, what Simon talked about. We want like few s h a r e learning and、uh, to be at scale. So, in two days, there will also be a session about like system and machine learning. So, people will improve the like、um, to train models with large scale and also robustness to adversarial attack, robustness to.、Um, Distributional shift. Like、uh, in any conference or, at, or even in this workshop, our attention to exploring different directions is proportional to this、uh, shadow here. While、uh, the realizable,、uh, reliable and、uh, fairness is also a very important part for machine learning, but we have much less attention to that. And today I'm going to talk about privacy, which is a very important part to make a machine learning model reliable so that we can really、uh, use it in practice. We can trust our machine or、uh, like、safely use it. So,、um, about the,、um, to have a reliable model means that we want our model to be. Robust or like not vulnerable to different types of, of attacks. So, what kind of attacks are there? So, there is like attacks against integrity, which means that it's possible to make the model like、uh, mislead the model in some specific types of、uh, images or samples. And another type is against system availability. So, like poisonous attack to change or mo maliciously modify a small portion of training data, but、uh, consequently hurt the model performance、um, as a whole. And the last part, which is the focus of today's talk, is attack against privacy and confidentiality. So, based on some information we acquire at hand, Some adversarial,、uh, advers adversary will want to infer information about user data. Okay. And in terms of privacy attack, there are also different types. 
I want to talk a little bit about them so that we understand the relation between them and the, like what is the current progress. So there is a membership inference attack and a reconstruction attack. So these are relatively more popular or at least exist more in the uh, relevant literature. Well, for membership inference attack from the name, you can see that they want to infer whether a training, uh, whether a sample specific data point is in the training sample. For example, you have an information of a specific client. You want to know if the information of that person has been used in the training data. And the reconstruction attack is like you have the information about the model gradient or information about the um, the model, and you want to like infer or uh, reconstruct what kind of training um, samples are there. So you can see that a reconstruction attack is actually stronger than membership inference attack because if you can reconstruct the training data, you will know whether a sample is in the uh, training sample or not. And other types include like property inference attacks and uh, model extraction attack, which are relatively uh, less in the uh, literature or in the existing of different types of attacks. And today my focus is reconstruction attacks. Okay, so, uh, so to describe uh, where the attack or like the vulnerability exists, we can see that it exists in the scenario where like training data, model and API the interface do not like co-locate together. For example, in uh, federated learning, we are talking about uh, uh, soon, the model and training data are not located together. So uh, it is possible that the data set is sensitive and uh, if people try to like uh, reconstruct data from, from the model gradient, it will be a problem. So what happens is the diversity can have access to like the interface and they might want to infer information about the model. Like if you play with chat GPT or like the model that is not uh, released, but you can play with it. Now whether you have enough information to reconstruct the model from the queries you have. And another type uh, we are talking about today is like you might have access to the model or might have access to the model gradient and you want to reconstruct information about the training data. And all the things happens when they are not co-located together. And it will, uh, will like um, um, create some kind of vulnerability. Okay, so uh, let me talk about like the setting we are considering which is federated learning. So federated learning is an uh, interesting um, framework proposed by Jacob and Brendan in 2016 and popularized in 2017, et cetera. And uh, with the like, design of federated learning, it is like trying to make, uh, give more privacy to our data. So different from our, like, the training procedure we are more familiar with, we are not like collecting data first and train the model. Well, in federated learning, all the data are kept in private in the local machine, like the, the local client. And the data is never transmitted to other uh, client or to uh, the parameter server. Well, what has been exchanged, the information being exchanged is the um, local update or the gradient computed from the local machines while well, they exchange the current model and the local update. So a natural question is whether like there exists privacy leakage in distributed learning, especially when the data and model are not co-located. So like the model was like um, up being updated and aggregated by the parameter server, while the data is kept like in private by the local data. Uh, by the local client, okay? Um, so in these settings, uh, since each, um, each phone or the local client, they keep their local data, there might exist very sensitive data. Like if I 
type, like my credit card is some something, and uh, we train the model to do the next word prediction. How um, terrifying if they can reconstruct the samples or the sentence from the model gradient. So our question today is, does local update review the training data? Or in other words, is federated learning really like protecting the privacy of our training data? Okay, so interesting, just a few days ago, uh, Professor Kamas has proposed a poll on Twitter, and uh, I guess many of you might have the same question here. So is the following statement true or false? Okay, so federated learning is an effective way to protect the privacy of individual training points. And that was like the, um, at, at least the purpose to propose federated learning in the first place. Okay, so apparently a lot of people believe it's true, or at least um, they said, I don't know, show me. So today I'm going to show you that this is, uh, federated learning is actually not private. Okay, so to talk about the problem, let's look at the formal statement. So the problem is like this. We have local batch of data, so data set uh, written as S. And uh, we have the prediction function that maps from each uh, individual point to the function F. And the information that is being transmitted between the local client and the primary server is the local update, which is the gradient or partial gradient calculated by the batch of training samples. So uh, in a general form, it is uh, written like this. So L is the last function. The last function depends on the prediction and uh, the label Y. So our question is, from the information of the local update G, can we reconstruct the training samples S? So the fundamental questions here is first, is the model gradient G sufficient to identify the training samples? So this is a statistical question. It doesn't involve computation thing. So if we have like infinite computational power, is the information being uh, potentially being reviewed from the Model gradient. And the second question is more practical. So if it is sufficient, is there, does there exist like uh, efficient algorithm to actually recover the samples? So those are two questions um, interacting with each other, but also two separate questions. Okay, so I will talk about some prior work first. There are several attacking methods regarding the reconstruction of the training samples. So they want to uh, learn to generate the training samples from a local user. Some method they use a generative model to first model the um, distribution of the data and uh, trying to learn that generative model. So that is a little bit less terrifying. They just want to learn the distribution of the data from a local uh, client but not like individual data. And uh, another more terrifying thing uh, is with reconstructing individual samples, what they do is to match the gradient because you see like we have the gradient information, they simply just minimize certain loss, like L2 loss between the gradient and the, uh, the dummy gradient with the variable Xi and Yi. So in this setting, the, the data Xi I, why I here are dummy variables for the training samples and they want to match the difference between the actual gradient and the computed ones. Yeah, so the problem is this function is highly non-convex and uh, in most cases it's very hard to find the global minimum for this point even though we know there exist. Okay, and uh, There are this kind of attacking methods. And there also exists certain defending methods, uh, including like quantizing the gradient. For example, they just remove 
if a certain coordinate in the gradient is uh, small, or like add noise to the gradient. So both methods will like downgrade the performance a little bit, but uh, will potentially help us to improve the privacy. And from the previous empirical work, so I want to emphasize all the previous work are like empirical. They don't have like understanding about whether or indeed we can identify the training samples from the gradient, or they don't know uh, when their method uh, fail, whether it is because uh, statistical problems or their just optimization method failed. Okay, so there are certain beliefs from the previous empirical findings. For example, like at what parameters to query the, the model gradient. So people believe it is like uh, more efficient to query at moderately trained models because if they query at initial uh, model or like the random initialization, they think that uh, since the random network hasn't memorized the data or hasn't seen the data, it uh, didn't provide much information about the data. So they don't want to query at random initialization. And they also don't want to query at well-trained models because at that point the gradient vanish. Of course, if the model is well-trained, the loss approaches zero or approach to the like station point, then the gradient is almost zero. So there is also like little information about the data. So they want to query at moderately trained models. That is from previous empirical findings. And also, um, previously people also asked whether the gradient alone is enough to identify the images. And the uh, previous work believed not. And uh, that is from their empirical findings because in many cases, if they directly do the gradient matching algorithm, they fail. And they just uh, indicate they, they think that that is because the gradient is not enough to identify the images or identify the samples. And what they do is they introduce some prior information of the training data. For example, they assume the data are from a general model to reduce like uh, the unknowns in their computation. But in this talk, uh, this will be a theoretical work. I will give some like uh, negative or, or like counter examples to uh, this belief. And I will say that all these are wrong impressions. Okay. So let me introduce the setting. So as a warm up, let's look at two layer neural network for first. And uh, all the algorithms, all the results can be extended to a uh, higher to like um, a deeper neural networks, okay? So the, the prediction function is like this. Um, so W will be the parameters of the first layer and A is the parameter for the second layer. So as a fully connected function, uh, Fx is like the summation of each um, hidden layer from the first, first layer and the average of them. Okay, this is two layer neural network. And our problem is choose to query WJAJ um, at a pro proper point, find the gradient, and see if they can help us identify the training samples. And uh, we can see the gradient with respect to AJ is uh, quite simple, is summation over uh, the loss function, the derivative of each loss fun function, times sigma, sigma is the activation function, over wj transpose xj. Is there any questions to the formulation? Okay, yeah, this is a very common setting for like uh, any like deep learning theory work. And uh, the difference is uh, previously many people want to like learn the weight, learn w, or A from the data, but now we want to learn X from the gradient. So sort of like a do problem. And 
Um, let's also have some warm up that you can understand very easily. Let's look at some caveat on the linear and quadratic activations. Let's see if like with simple activations we can, what kind of information we can get from the gradient. And uh, normally people will think that with like linear activation, the problem is simple. Let's start, get start from uh, linear functions. But in this case, it, it is much different. And the information we can get with linear activation is very limited. You see, if the activation is linear, if we compute the gradient, the partial gradient with respect to A, the second layer, and the gradient with respect to W, the first layer, the gradient looks like this. It is W times uh, this factor, which is a linear combination of Xi. And with the gradient with respect to W, it is also another matrix that is a rank one matrix, which is A times the same uh, vector, which is a linear combination of each Xi. So this is to say that like with this gradient information, at most what we can learn is this linear combination of the data, but not individual Xi. We can only learn a direction that is a linear combination of each data. Well, for the quadratic setting, it is a little bit better, but we can still not learn the, the training samples. So the gradient with respect to A looks like this, Wj transpose sigma Wj. Well, sigma is like a kind of a second moment with the data, which is the quadratic form of, again, L prime. Uh, L is the loss. So the, the derivative of individual loss times Xi Xi transpose. So this means like with quadratic loss at most, even if we have a lot of information of W and A, at most we can recover this sigma uh, bar that depends on the data. So we cannot reconstruct individual Xi. We can only learn like the span of the data because just because like the decomposition of matrix are not unique. We can only learn the span of Xi, but not individual Xi. Do you agree? Okay. Yeah, but uh, from this, we can also see hope. So if magically we can get information to the like the third moment of Xi, if we can get Xi, uh, outer product with Xi, outer product with Xi, which is third order tensor, then we can reconst reconstruct each Xi uh, because the tensor decomposition under some mild condition is unique. Okay, so we already say that with linear and quadratic activations, there's no hope. But for other more common activation functions, we can actually construct Xi. And that is from a, a simple and a elegant uh, lemma, which is Stein's lemma, or like more generalized version of Stein's lemma. So for a function uh, g, if uh, it depends on w with a transpose w, then expectation of w, well, w generated from a standard Gaussian distribution, if g a transpose w times the Hermit function h w, if we can ca uh, calculate this, this actually is equal to the expectation of the piece derivative of the function g times a to the piece power with outer product. So this is uh, Stein's lemma, uh, but it's a generalized form. For example, the hp is the Hermit function. Um, for example, h2 will equal to ww transpose minus identity matrix. H3 is W to the third power outer product minus W uh, outer product with I and symmetrized it. So basically, it's a nice way to calculate the gradient of any function G with some random samples W. And 
you will see in a moment how this can help us. Because you see, uh, our function g will be sigma w transpose xi, where sigma w transpose xi just comes from the modal gradient. So if we have a multiple uh, sigma w transpose xi, we can query at different w and just make the summation. And with the help of Stein's lemma, this is uh, we can get like the, the piece derivative of sigma times x to the piece power. So that is used when the order p is, uh, if we can use when the order p is three, then we get the third order tensor. Well, we will be able to reconstruct xi because this is a nice form of xi to the piece power. So we will we'll be able to approximate this t where this is a, like a, a low rank tensor where it is of this form and we can potentially reconstruct this xi from the tensor. So this is sort of like the only mass in this uh, algorithm. And uh, if you have any question, I'm happy to stop here and uh, like give you more explanations. So basically you see um, G, W, J will be each coordinate of our gradient. And we will do the summation of that and uh, use things lemma to know that it will, the expectation of that will approximate this nice form, which is like a sort of like third moment of, X, of uh, Xi. And uh, if P is greater or equal to three, we will be able to reconstruct each Xi. Okay, so uh, that means we can like actually query the gradient and at random initialization at like random a standard normal Gaussian W, it will be good for us to get this form of tensor. Okay, uh, remember this G W J is uh, the gradient with, is re with respect to the AJ, which is the each coordinate of the second layer and is of this form since this is like roughly sigma over WJ transpose XI, we can use things lemma with that and get this nice form. Okay. Um, so the, the, the main idea, the main next step is of course, tensor decomposition. If we can, so we show that with the um, gradient information we have from the um, federated learning, then we can estimate this TP, uh, which is of this form. And as long as P is greater or equal to three, we can uh, uniquely identify x1 through xb if they are linearly independent with each other with tensor decomposition. So of course, in general, tensor decomposition is hard, but this is to say that from the um, gradient information, we are able to identify x1 through uh, xb. I mean, this is a statistical result if we have like uh, enough computational power, we are able to identify that. So that is to say that we are able to query at random initialization. We can ran randomly sample AI at, uh, and WJ to, to be able to um, identify the training samples with the gradient. So the previous idea that they think that, that with random initialization random internalization, it is not enough, that is false, okay? So, of course, uh, there is a problem in the previous analysis, because if, um, you see, we don't actually have the expectation of this form, but we have like uh, multiple samples, and we want to approximate of this tensor. But if we do a naive approximation, uh, 
like the number of samples will easily blow up to the dimension to the third power. So, I mean, this m is the number of samples we have or, or the dimension of the gradient or like the uh, number of hidden nodes or the width of the neural network, so what m is. So if we're naive, we just approximate to this tensor with the, uh, the gradients, then uh, the dependence of m to the dimension d will be m to the, uh, will be d to the third power. That is uh, very bad, but we have some way to improve that. So this, uh, this idea actually stems from the previous work John et al, uh, but they were designing method to optim optimizing over two layer neural network, um, but it is um, similar to our setting. It is sort of like a dual problem. We can also apply to this problem where we reconstruct X, the training samples from the weight. Okay, so the idea is like we want to first estimate the span of the training data x1 through xb by the second moment, or like uh, use things lemma with p equals to two, we can reconstruct the uh, matrix. And, and then, suppose like from the second t2, we get uh, decomposed it with v, v transpose. So here, uh, v will be the same span as the training data. And uh, the second step is like to find T3 operating on V three times. Then it will be a much smaller tensor with uh, V times B times V. So B is a batch size. Usually the batch size is very small, for example, 16 or, or whatever it's, we can view it at a constant. And we can conduct tensor decomposition of that and get the vectors u1 through ub. And then we project back to the original space. And the idea is with the second order to estimate just the span of the training set that will only require m to scale with d, the linearly with the dimension. So overall, the whole procedure, we only like need the, the, the width m to scale linear nearly with the uh, data dimension. Okay, so the uh, conclusion is like this. So the idea applies when the sigma to the third derivative of sigma or the fourth derivative of sigma is not zero. And uh, the reconstruction error, so the, the L2 difference, the average of L2 distance between our reconstructed x and the true x will be less or equal to square root d over m. So d is the data dimension, m is the number of hidden nodes. So uh, in practice, d will be like a few hundred, and m will be like, for example, 5,000 in like ResNet, etc. And m to be, scale, uh, to be scaling linearly with d is already very good, okay? And uh, so uh, sigma to the third power or sigma to the fourth power um, not equal to zero is very natural because as we see with linear or quadratic activations, the problem just fail fundamentally. It is not because of any computational reason, but it's just there's not en enough information hidden in the gradient, okay? Um, well, here is to say that if like the third derivative of sigma doesn't vanish. For example, it's uh, cubic, or it's value sigmoid 10 h or liquid value. This is not zero, then it applies. And I also want to mention that um, even though the previous analysis was on two layer neural network, but uh, that's naturally extend to like or deeper neural networks, because like previous finding is to say, uh, we can view this part as the new input. So if the last two layers are fully connected, then uh, from our previous analysis, we can reconstruct to the last but two layer, the, the feature from that layer, 
uh, with our analysis. And if we can like design the uh, network so that the previous layers are like uh, a bijective, then we can find the input data as well. And uh, actually, this kind of idea was also uh, existing in some previous empirical work. For example, this kind of idea, uh, it doesn't depend on the modality of the data, whether axis, image, text, or graph. Uh, well, in some previous uh, work on like um, sentences, they can first reconstruct the uh, embedding and then use some other methods to reconstruct uh, the, the sentences or like the input data. So this is similar. We can like reconstruct the last part two layer first and uh, find some ways to invert the like input images or input samples. Okay. So there are some uh, certain discussions I want to talk about. First, about identifiabilities. Basically, what our conclusion is like, if the expectation of sigma to the third power, uh, sigma to the third derivative, or sigma uh, fourth derivative of sigma is not zero. So, and this works for most activation functions. Uh, then, uh, and also the number of hidden nodes M scales at least linearly with D. So under these two conditions, we will be able to identify the training samples from modal gradient at a single query, okay? And uh, uh, another thing is like uh, from, this is just from our algorithm, but not in general, that deeper neural network does not help or hurt. But potentially, uh, we will hope that when we are dealing with deeper neural network, neural networks, we should be able to um, make use of the information in a better way to get more accurate uh, reconstruction. But uh, our current analysis uh, doesn't help. And I also want to mention that the distinction to linear case or convex optimization. So uh, one evidence is that Previously, I just mentioned if the activation is linear, which means just we have when we are dealing with linear prediction functions, then this method doesn't work, or like we cannot identify the tra individual training samples from modal gradient. It is impossible, not just because of our algorithm. So linear models and neural networks are really like fundamentally different in the um, in our considered settings of like gradient leakage. And uh, another evidence is in some previous work on like differential privacy, people have like learned that the model is more private at uh, random internalization as, as they train the model better, the information being leaked is just increasing. So that is also not the case in the neural network setting. Okay, and uh, some other inspiration on defending algorithm, uh, at least in our algorithm, adding noise to the gradient does not uh, hurt our performance, which means it does not help the privacy. So that will mean that perhaps quantizing the gradient or th some other ways to perturb or like encoding the data will potentially um, be more effective defending algorithms. So these are like some, um, some conceptual information we can get from our work. So it was not only just some empirical algorithms to like reconstruct the data, but more importantly is that we have some like uh, theoretical messages from the algorithm. Like under what kind of conditions we can identify the training samples from the gradient. And since this is like one of the initial work, uh, I mean the theoretical initial work on understanding reconstructed training samples, of course there are some drawbacks or like disadvantages in our analysis. For example, we only deal with fully connected neural networks, not like convolutional or like attention layers. In the future, we might want to analyze that as well. And uh, 
also we haven't done much uh, experiments and uh, we are working on that. Hopefully we can have uh, good results soon. And uh, I think it is very important to study uh, these directions and uh, especially put more like theoretical efforts into this domain because there was um, uh, very limited work. And uh, that is the end of this talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chief, for the great talk. Any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, so I think there was an assumption that the data is linearly independent. Um, isn't that a strong assumption on real data? Like, could you comment on that? Thank you. All oh, right. So the data being linearly independent is not uh, a strong assumption. So it, because you, you think, so being linear dependent means a certain data is equal to the linear combination of the other data. Uh, that is a very weird thing. So in most of case, so in other words, if the, you believe the data is uh, uh, generated from a random distribution, then with probability one, they are linear independent. So it's not a strong assumption at all. Thank you. I think it's working now. So th this was a cool idea, but I think there might be a way to defend against this by using secure aggregation, which is something that people actually do in federated learning. So you may want to look at that. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a very good point. So yeah, uh, I also want to mention that because like, uh, as I mentioned that I think the important thing is for us to understand. So for example, we know that adding noise does not help much from the algorithm. Quantizing may be helping. And what you said, we can uh, do many local updates uh, in each client first and then only uh, transmit the information after that. That will be helpful. So, so not only is that uh, effective defending algorithm to our algorithm, but uh, to many other like uh, existing gradient matching algorithms as well. Yeah. So there essentially is a cryptographically secure way to aggregate the gradients, uh, and that's called secure aggregation. Oh. Uh, so you mean it's prob probably uh, provably secure? Yeah, in terms uh, of aggregating the gradient. So, but, but yeah, we, we can discuss this offline, but I think that you know, that's what secure aggregation provides. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. But uh, so uh, what the main message is like, uh, what like uh, when and how does the gradient of review or like can identify the information of the training samples? So one gradient can definitely identify that. Uh, but if you aggregate it uh, some other secure ways, that will be helpful, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, just a question regarding the, some technical assumptions. So how do you define like the third and fourth derivative for Redo, for example? Do you define some generalized derivative of the the Dirac mass or something? Oh, uh, I, I didn't Okay, hear. so so there in the identifiability. Uh, can you move uh, okay. away a little bit from C the Can map. you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, so in that assumption, you, Which assumption? Like the I identifiability. Oh, uh, yeah, so first so, line, second line. Yeah, exactly, first line. Yeah, first line. So okay. you want the expectation of the third derivative of, and the fourth derivative of the activation Not fashion? and, or. So or one of them. One, one of them, okay. How, how do you find this derivatives for Redo, for example? Because you, you know the, the first derivative of Redo activation function is just the indicator function. Then the second de derivative exists in the distribution sense, so it's yeah, a, the Dirac it's, mass. Uh, yeah. But for you the third. You should think about it in the distributional sense. So like okay. with ReLU, it's like the third derivative of the expectation of ReLU. 
Okay, so yeah. it's so, the third derivative so of the expectation. It's like arc cosine something. Arc cosine. Okay, okay, so, yeah. so it's, 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 it's different. It it's yeah. the derivative of the expectation, not expectation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. right, thank you. you. We don't need sigma to be continuous. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, is there a way to um, design a uh, defense algorithm by uh, um, revealing a gradient that's uh, imperceptible but changes the uh, higher tensor a lot? Like, like basically defending by making it hard to do tensor decomposition. Is, is, does your work, uh, do, do, you find, do you think there's a way to do that like based on your results? or like uh, your work has an inspiration for that kind of method? Oh, so if the data is, has very, very small norm of, or like the coordinates with respect to, I mean the, the component with respect to certain data is very small in the tensor, then it will be harder to reconstruct that. Yeah, that is possible. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, you mentioned scaling to deep networks. Um, but uh, the way you scale to deep networks is that you um, go down layer by layer and try to reconstruct a higher layer and then try to reconstruct a lower layer. Uh, doesn't that imply that your error keeps growing exponentially as you go down the layers? Uh, so there's no like noise in the previous layers. So that is different. So um, right, that depends on like the Lipschitz of the function. So um, if we are able to query at a speci specific point and we know the model, the, then we can like just do the reconstruction. There is no noise. So uh, the noise, uh, the, the error doesn't aggregate. Um, I see, no, no as, as in, uh, the, the, the guarantee says that x star minus x recovered is bounded in L2 norm by, let's say, square root d over m. Now, when you do it over multiple layers, doesn't this keep growing as a factor uh, uh, for every layer? Yeah, for example, uh, let's, let me say in this way. For example, if you consider the first previous layers are ReLU, hmm. and you are able to actually reconstruct an identity function. So the the error is just exactly the same on the last part two layer. It doesn't aggregate. There's no noise in the previous layers. I, I, see. I yeah. see. Thank you for the question. Uh, sorry, I had one more. Oh, uh, sure, go ahead. Um, so um, in, the, in the reconstruction, you, need, you needed the expectation over random initializations. Um, how does, uh, so, how does this scale in practice in the sense that in the practice you'll only have finite samples from, from the distribution? Um, so uh, does, the, does the reconstruction concentrate very highly on the expectation or uh, can uh, you comment on? So, so uh, that is our analysis. We have analyzed, so uh, there's two separate things. Uh, first is like uh, there are two settings in the, uh, in the attack so one is like whether we do eavesdropping, so we only observe uh, at certain modal gradient. So in that case, it's like if we have uh, the modal at the random initialization, and uh, what people do in practice is normally random, uh, random Gaussian or random uh, noise, then uh, random weights, then this method work. And another setting is like we can query at a specific point, so we control the parameter server to query at a specific point. Um, so in that case, our method works even better for like the deep, deeper neural network because we can control it. Um, so uh, can you repeat your question again? Um, yes. Yeah, so so in the in the randomly initialized case, at some point you need an expectation to be taken over. Um, yeah, so our analysis shows that if, like, uh, in the two settings, whether we are eavesdropping or we control the primary server, as long as they are random Gaussian, uh, the weights are random Gaussian, 
then we only need m to scale with linearly with d to have a good re reconstruction error. I see. So that is the concentration part. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let's thank again uh, Chief for the great talk. So this is the end of morning session. Um, so in the afternoon, the, the afternoon session will resume at uh, one uh, thirty, and the side will be the moderator. Thanks. Hiram, by the way, the, the lunch will be at the garage, uh, the garage restaurant. That just you turn turn right and you can find the restaurant called Garage.
three. One, two, three. Yeah, that's working. One, two, three. Yeah. The talk is in one hour, though. It's in one hour. Yeah, so. Yeah.
Hello? Does it work? One, two, three. Hello? Good. Now I cannot have coffee.
Hello? All right, so welcome back to our afternoon session. And this is going to be a session on image recovery. We have four speakers lined up, and uh, our first speaker is going to be Rene Vidal from Johns Hopkins. And he's going to be talking about parsimonious, parsimonious representations for robust and explainable AI. So uh, over to or on to training. Hello. Maybe it's, it's a little loud. Good afternoon. Still a little loud. <laughs> Happy New Year. Still loud? OK. So um, as it turns out, the New Year has come out, and um, I've changed affiliations overnight as I was flying. Uh, so I was with John Hopkins. I've been with Hopkins for the last 20 years, uh, and I've recently moved to the University of Pennsylvania. So you will see the slides are half and half between my trying to adjust to, to Penn, but most of the work and almost everything has been done at Johns Hopkins. So <clears throat> deep learning has been around now for 10, 15 years, and it's changed the way we do things. And originally, it was impactful in academic, settings, uh, like ImageNet or playing games. But today, it's really in our real life. We all use uh, voice assistants. We all are heading into the idea that we're going to have self-driving cars. And as AI begins to impact our daily life, it's important to make sure that the predictions that AI systems make are not only accurate, but also maybe fair robust, even, you know, we would like to make sure that the predictions that are made are explainable to the end users. So in this talk, I'll focus on two of these properties, namely robustness and explainability. And by robustness, what we mean is that these AI systems, even though they work very accurately, we don't know why they work when they do, and we don't know why they fail when they fail. And it turns out that it's very easy to make them fail. Uh, if you look at this image versus that image, they look nearly identical. But the prediction of the AI system in this case is a stop sign, in this case is a yield sign. And if you put that into a self-driving car, you're going to be into trouble. And so how can we prevent that from happening? The second example might be you're making a clinical decision with an AI system. And you're trying to explain why you made that decision. And in this case, you predict that based on an MRI scan that you've got Alzheimer's disease with 98 probability. But why is this the case? You might want to have an explanation as to it's because, you know, the ventricles are enlarged in a certain region. So how do we do that? So the approach that we've taken to look into both of these problems is connected to the idea of parsimonious representations, sparse, low rank. And by and large, the approach is fairly generic, you would say. We are going to take high dimensional data, X. We're going to map it to some latent representation, Z. Actually, not necessarily latent. And then the idea is that from some representation, we're going to predict whatever we want to predict. So the key question is going to be really what parsimonious representations are adequate in order to ensure robustness or in order to ensure explainability. In the case of robustness, and this is going to connect very well with some of the things that were talked about yesterday in the tutorial, we're going to be using block sparsity as the way to uh, ensure that the latent representation has a particular structure that allows you to be robust to uh, those adversarial attacks. In the case of explainability, the notion of parsimony is going to be information theoretic. We are going to really use low dimensionality, or in our case, is going to be the minimum expected code length with respect to some dictionary. And that dictionary is going to be semantic and explainable by construction. 
And therefore, in this second case, uh, the parsimonious representation is going to be explainable by design uh, if this query set that I'm going to be talking about is explainable. So let me get into the details for each one of the two cases that I mentioned thus far. So again, uh, the idea here is that we can take an input image, X, we can add a small perturbation to it, uh, and we can produce another image that is nearly identical to the first image. And if we do that, the performance might go from 99% to nearly 0%. And why does that happen? So how are these uh, attacks or these perturbations delta computed in order to make the system fail? Uh, this is here the, a deep network parameterized with parameters theta. And you, uh, I don't know why the clicker is not working. Uh, and so the delta here is the perturbation. And so you, what you do is that you choose the perturbation delta to maximize the loss with which you train your network. And there are lots of sets that you could use in order to define what small means. The classical in the simplest way, and this is probably mathematical convenience, is simply to say that they lie in a small ball of a certain radius. So epsilon here denotes the radius, and p here is the p norm. Okay. And so, as a consequence, most of the computation of these adversarial attacks is simply solving an optimization problem. And the optimization problem can be solved using gradient ascent, or for whatever reason they call it gradient ascent, but it's gradient ascent. And so that's the famous PGD algorithm that all it does is to try to maximize the loss with respect to delta. The critical point that I'm trying to make, which will be relevant to the talk in two or three minutes, is that you need to compute gradients uh, of the map F in order to compute these attacks. Okay? What are now ways to defend against these attacks. There's been a large number of defense methods, uh, but one of the most commonly used today is adversarial training. Namely, that during the training process, we present the algorithm not only with the original data, but also with examples that are perturbed examples, where for each training example, you compute an attack in the way that I mentioned later. There are other methods, but I'll really, the, this talk is really more connected to the denoising style defenses, where we take the corrupted example X prime, and we try to reconstruct the original X in order to have a X that is not attacked. And this has been going on. People propose an attack. People propose a defense to patch the attack. And you have these cat and mouse games where you get better and better attacks. But after many years of doing this, what seems to be working in practice, uh, adversarial training continues to be used. Uh, but the challenge is that it's computationally difficult. Because for every training example, you've got to generate these, these attacks. Now, it is true that um, you can defend, again, a specific attack. But the problem is also that if you make an algorithm that defends for one attack, it may not work for a different attack. And so here's one example. The rows here correspond to different attacks. These are the norms. L infinity is the attack that I mentioned in the previous slide with the infinity norm, two norm, and one norm. The first column here is the performance. When there is no attack, you can do 99%, 98%. When you get attacks, that's what I mentioned earlier, you get 0 or 48, 44 uh, percent accuracy. These different columns are, if I defend the algorithm with adversarial training, train with examples with L infinity norm attacks. This is the defenses with L2 attacks during training. And as you can see, the main thing I want to point out is that the diagonal 90.3, 69.2, and 74.6 are much larger than the off-diagonal terms. Meaning that if you do adversarial training with the cor correct norm, then you get better performance. But if you say, do adversarial training with the L-infinity norm and then test with L2 norm, then the performance is not as good. Now, it is possible, of course, to do adversarial training with all possible attack families that you might want to have. But this becomes really costly because for every uh, as you're doing the training, you need to generate new attacks, right? The, the attacks keep changing as the network is being trained. 
So it is possible, to, you know, if I had a family of 100 different kinds of attacks that someone came up with, we could potentially do adversarial training, with training with all possibilities, but that it's really computationally challenging. So the goal of, of this work is to try to reverse engineer the process, because if I could figure out what was the attack family ahead of time, then I could potentially have a defense that is specifically targeted to that family. And more broadly, what we're going to do in this uh, paper in particular is the question of whether we can do both at the same time. Namely, if you give me X prime, which is the attacked image, uh, can I recover the clean signal? And can I recover the attack? And if I do, then I can classify each one of them uh, potentially independently. So I could, I could solve my classification task now on the clean images, and I could also identify which attack family was the one that attacked this thing. So that's exactly what I just said. We're going to take X prime, and we're going to decompose it as the sum of a clean signal plus the attack, and then classify each one of the two independently. And in order to do that, we are going to use uh, block sparsity to represent both the clean signal as well as the attack delta. Why do we do that? Where do we draw inspiration to do this? Uh, there was this great work by John Wright and Yima in 2008 where they were trying to do face classification with corrupted images. And so you begin at the left with an image of a face that's been corrupted and you decompose that image of a face in terms of a dictionary. And the dictionary here is the clean training examples. And this dictionary has a collection of different blocks, the red, the blue, and the green block, and they correspond to faces of different individuals. And then, if you try to do a uh, decomposition as, you know, the X prime, I write it as a sparse linear combination of this dictionary, you typically get coefficients that are sparse, and you get non-zero coefficients. These red coefficients come from the red block because the red block is the, corresponds to the correct identity of the person. And then there is a residual, and this residual is also assumed to be sparse, meaning that not the whole image is attacked, but only salt and pepper style noise in, uh, in a few pixels. And so uh, what we did later was to enforce block structure because you could get a sparsity level of three, let's say three non-zero coefficients, but these three non-zero coefficients could correspond to one red, one blue, and one green. And then you would not be able to identify the correct class. And so what you want is the block to be non-zero, not sparsity on coefficients. And both works came with a lot of theory and analysis. For the first case, it was the cross bouquet model, with conditions in which if you do this, you could recover the exact original X and the exact uh, perturbation delta. And for our analysis in 2012, we had conditions on which, under which you can recover the correct block, which gives you, therefore, the correct class by constructing, and the correct delta. But all of this work from 15 years ago Delta was just a perturbation. There was no notion of it being adversarial or notion of it being an attack. Moreover, as you saw from the previous slide, these adversarial attacks are typically dense. So it's not necessarily the case that we can use sparsity on delta in order to solve the problem. So the key question was, well, how do we maybe take insights from this work of 15 years ago, but now adapt it to the adversarial setting? And what do we do about this delta, which is no longer sparse and no longer you know, fully random? It is actually a crafted attack based on the gradient to a, a particular network. So what we do appears to be extremely simple, and I'll explain why this makes sense in the next three slides. So for the, for the time being, just, just follow me. What we're going to do is to simply, you know, it seems very naive. I'm just going to take the delta, the second term, and replace it by another dictionary. So what, what, what do we do specifically? We're going to have two dictionaries, one dictionary DS for the signal. And this is the same thing as before. It's going to have one block for all of the 
training examples from class one, the red block, the blue block, all of the training examples from class two, and so on and so forth for all the classes. So this doesn't change at all. The main change is that we're going to do the same thing now for the attacks. We're going to have one block that corresponds to attack family number one. Say this could be the p equals to one in the LP norm. The second block is going to be, say, p is equal to two. And for each family of attacks, you're going to have a different block. But then within each block, we're going to have a sub-block, which corresponds to the fact that we can compute attack family number one for examples from class one, or from example from class two, three, four, and so on. So each sub-block here, as you can see, it depends also on, on, on the class. Okay. So as a consequence, we have a two-block structure, one that comes from the family of attacks, and a second block that comes from the class of the signal. And therefore, the dictionary of attacks is nothing but you take your training examples, you take your family of 100 different attack types, and you just compute the attacks for each one of those uh, families and for each one of the training examples. That's what the uh, signal is. And then with that in mind, we're going to do something super classical. We're going to try to reconstruct the attacked example X prime as a linear combination of both the signal dictionary and the attack dictionary. And we're going to minimize uh, two group style norms. Uh, these group norms are simply trying to encourage that you want the block that uh, is obtained from the signal block to correspond to only one class. And likewise, the attack needs to come from the correct attack family, but also from the correct class. So the CA actually has uh, this two block structure, as I mentioned earlier. And this 1,2 norm is nothing but the sum of the uh, two norms uh, within each block. Okay. So you might wonder, well, why? Why does this make sense? So the first question is, why can we assume that X prime has this block sparse decomposition? So for the signal part, this may or may not be true. And this is your classical setting, right? for phases or for many of the computer vision examples we worked out 15 years ago, if the signal does come from multiple classes and each class comes from a low dimensional subspace or has a sparse representation, then we can apply this. So the interesting aspect of the work isn't really why this works for signals, which it's already known for the last 15 years, but why does it work for the attacks? So are there networks for which we can assume that the attacks do have this block sparse. And here is one example. This is true if the network is a ReLU network. And why is it true? As you know, the input-output map of a ReLU network is piecewise affine. So this means that for a particular X, uh, the input-output map is a, a fine transformation. And remember that I said earlier that these attacks are computed by computing gradients. And so as a consequence, the gradient of the output with respect to the input is go at, at a particular x is just going to be a linear function. And so effectively what happens is that you take the input space and you divide it into different cells. And for each cell, you have a different affine map. And therefore, for each cell, the gradient, they're linear combinations of each other. Okay? Therefore, if I have a number of training examples, say, in the yellow cell, and now at test time, I'm going to have a different x, but the gradient of the network at that different x is going to be a linear combination of gradients, a training example, in the same cell. And therefore, that block sparse decomposition does exist to begin with, because you're always going to say for a test example, the gradient, which is the, all of the attacks that are going to be based on those gradients, are going to be linear combinations of only gradients from that block. And therefore, you have a one block sparse decomposition when you consider all the gradients of all the cells. So that's the first uh, contribution. The second one is the theoretical, like the same question we would ask 15 years ago. If I give you a corrupted X prime, can you decompose it as the sum of a clean signal plus the attack that you used? 
And so the question is, what are the conditions on this dictionary? The DS is, again, the set of training examples. And the DA is, again, the set of all attacks applied to all training examples. And there were conditions under those dictionaries. Can I recover the correct signal class and the correct attack class? And you saw from the tutorial yesterday and from classical sparsity that when you do that for L1 minimization, typically you have null space conditions or incoherence conditions or restricted asymmetry properties. When you're trying to recall, uh, recover blocks and when you're trying to recover classes, you don't care about a unique sparse solution. You care about recovering the correct block. That's sufficient to determine the correct class. And so that is much more related to the subspace clustering literature where you look at subspaces and you want the subspaces to be sufficiently separated in order to determine the correct class. And so extending those results to the L1-2 setting and to the adversarial setting, which is what we have here, uh, the theoretical result is effectively of that nature. So there is a particular correct class I and a particular correct attack family J, and that defines a sub-block of the dictionary for both the signal and the attack. That sub-dictionary spans some subspace associated to, again, the correct class and the correct attack family. What this theorem says is that if you compute, this is the far right here, the theta 1, 2 is sort of the angle between that true subspace and the atoms of the dictionary corresponding to all other blocks. Okay? So that angle needs to be sufficiently large. That's what it says. That's what's on the far right here. And so this means that the all of those blocks of the dictionary that I was talking about need to be sufficiently separated as measured by some angular distance, theta 1, 2. And that angular distance is adapted to the norm we're using. Okay. On the left, that gamma is a measure of how well distributed the atoms of the dictionary are within those, the corresponding subspace. So what the theoretical condition is then on the training data as well as the attacks is that you need the, uh, you, you need the atoms of the dictionary to be sufficiently well distributed within their subspaces. And then between the true subspace and all other subspaces, they need to be sufficiently well separated. Okay. Last challenge is computation. How do we obtain this sparse decomposition? By and large, this is standard algorithms at this point, right? Uh, you just run your favorite block sparse. Uh, the challenge is that these dictionaries are now very large. In the work of 15 years ago, it would just be the number of training examples. Now is the number of training examples times the number of attack families. So you cannot expect to solve this efficiently, and you need to do this for every, uh, at inference time for every example. So what we do is to exploit what we know. We know that only one block in theory, should be non-zero, right? So therefore, rather than using the whole dictionary, we can ideally just select one block. Now, the question is always, of course, which block should we choose, right? So that's exactly what we do. We have an active set algorithm where we relax the problem by putting some penalties on the regularizers. You know that if the penalties lambda s and lambda a were very, very, very large, then the optimal solution would be with the coefficients being all zeros. So that's the sparsest possible. And you know from uh, homotopy continuation methods that as you reduce the lambda little by little, you eventually are going to get to a solution that has one block that is non-zero. And so that's what we do exactly. You, from, from the optimality conditions of these convex problems, you can determine what is the value of lambda that allows you to have one block that is non-zero. And, um, and so the details, you can attend the, the poster. I think Darshan is here, and he'll be presenting the details this afternoon on how to do all of this, so you can ask him. But by and large, that's the idea, that we can solve the problem efficiently by having a method that allows us to select the right block in a, in a greedy manner, and then we, we can do this more efficiently. You will see in the poster many more evaluations, uh, but here I just wanted to summarize what happens in practice. This is on uh, the MNIST data set, so if you have a network, you train it, you get 99.99% .99 accuracy. 
if you attack the CNN now, the accuracy might be 20 something percent. If you do adversarial training, you get back the accuracy to 75 percent. In this case, all we did was to solve as sparse the composition of the attack signal and use the selected block to determine the class and use the selected block to determine what attack family it was. And you can get above 80% accuracy. So you can actually do better than adversarial training, and you can do better than even taking the clean signal and passing it back through the, um, the original network. So even just the sparse decomposition and these block sparse classifiers do better than the network networks themselves. Of course, this is true for simple data sets for which this block sparse assumption on the signal makes sense. So this works, and you will see in the poster for FACES, for MNIST, and those kind of data sets. But the key open problem is how do we extend these to signal classes that cannot be well approximated by these block sparse decomposition on the signal space? And we are actively working on that at the moment. So in summary, for the first part, how low dimensional representations help robustness. The key observation is simply that these attacks are based on gradients, and for ReLU networks, these gradients can always be expressed as sparse linear combinations of other attacks. And we also derive conditions on the data and the attacks under which this block sparse recovery is guaranteed to give you the correct class and the correct attack family, and uh, develop efficient algorithms to do this in practice. Let me move now to the second topic, uh, explainability. So as we know, this is a critical problem today. And the challenge is that when we look at the way in which explainability is done today, is done in a post hoc manner. You look at a network, the network makes some predictions, and then you try to look at what regions in the image were most relevant for that prediction. There are lots of methods to do that, but the simplest, the original ones like GradCam, they simply are sensitivity style analysis. Is I compute something like the derivative of that pixel prediction, whether it's class one or class two or class n, and compute the derivative with respect to the input image, and I look at which, re which regions in the input image I have high activations. And when you look at the results, um, well, is it really explainable? I think people just end up debating as to why the network came up with this region. And in the case of medical applications, you can have regions that are red, therefore they have high explainability power, but they have nothing to do with what the prediction was being made. So the good way, the good thing of doing this post hoc analysis is that, you know, I have a high performing network, I know it works very well, I don't need to retrain it in order to, to produce an explanation. But these explanations might be really bad, and it's not clear why they are true explanations. Many people are extremely concerned about this. Uh, here are some quotes uh, from Zachary Lipton, uh, who is really uh, worried about the state of the art and explainability of deep learning. So what we advocate is to do things backwards. We should really be thinking about explainability from the beginning, not at the end. So we need to, to do the following. We think that an explanation is not just a region, but for the end user, it might need to be an explanation in terms of words or patterns about the reasoning that led to the decision of the network. We think that the explanations are not unique. They are, depend on the task. They depend on the user. For example, if I or if a medical doctor is explaining a diagnosis of a patient to another medical doctor, number one, it's going to use a particular vocabulary that is targeted to medical diagnosis. The way in which that clinician explained that diagnosis is going to be different if he or she is explaining that to another clinician versus whether it's explaining that to the patient. And therefore, the explanation needs to be adjusted to the user and depends on the task, and depends on the domain as well, because the vocabulary is going to change depending on what is it that I'm trying to explain. One way to capture this idea of explaining things in terms of words 
and in a way that is task-dependent and user-dependent, is by letting the user tell you what is a good explanation for he or her. And the user can do that by providing a potentially large number of questions about the predictions, and the AI system will be expected to answer each and every such question. It's like you're listening to my talk right now, right? You're, I'm a poor speaker, you're gonna understand just a fraction of it, but at the end there is a question session. So you can ask questions, and if I realize, based on the question that you asked me, I realize, okay, I didn't explain this very well, I'll adapt my explanation as well. Some people ask me, is the user going to provide you a large query set ahead of time? Well, it turns out that for many applications, you can come up with the query sets naturally. So here are four different examples. On the top left, the task is to classify birds. And the, I have no idea how people classify birds, but the expert typically look at attributes. So is the belly yellow? That might be a natural. And there are data sets already that comes annotated with attributes about the birds. Uh, in the middle one, the task might simply be to describe the scene with a caption or describe the content. At this point in time, object detectors are working fairly well. So the queries could be, is there an object of class one, two, or three in this region of the image? And that already gives you a very large vocabulary of such questions because for every object class times the number of bounding boxes in an image, that's the set of all queries that you ask. You also have ways of asking for relationships between pairs of bounding boxes. Um, on the right here, this is medical diagnosis. What are the, what's the way people are diagnosed today? Well, you go to the office and they ask you, do you have this symptom or this other? or then each test can be considered as a query. So this sequence of questions about uh, symptoms that the patient might have are relevant to making a prediction as to what is the diagnosis. And then at the bottom left here, uh, this might be a classification of a document. Uh, there are lots of ways in which you could find the query set. What we did in this work is the trivial, is a particular word present or not? So we selected on the order of uh, thousand words, and the queries are really is the word present in the document, yes or no. So once you have this query set, which is application dependent and user dependent, the deal is what, you know, the, the query set might have a million queries. And here is where low dimensional representations come to the rescue. What you want to do is to select a very small number of such queries. How many of you have played 20 questions? Right? So, you can, I've even done this with my 10 year old son, right? I said to him, hey, I have a number in my head from one to 10. What, ask me a question. He said, is it more than five? Why did he do so? Because you split the space in half by asking a question that is the most informative question, right? And so the idea here is, can I come up with an algorithm that will sequentially select out of a million possible queries, the first one to roughly split the decision into half, and then condition on the first one, I select the second. And so this is exactly, this is the output of our algorithm, by the way. For this input image on the left, it selected as a first query whether it has a shape perching light. And the answers here are yes, no, yes, no. And then the algorithm stop after seven questions here out of 300 attributes. And it predicted with 99% probability that this is a green J. And we're gonna see various examples throughout the talk as to how the probabilities of what class it is is changing after one question, two questions, three questions, and so on and so forth. What is an explanation now? I predicted with 99% probability this is a green J. Well, here's the explanation. It is a green J because it has a shape Pershing like and it does not have upper part colors that are yellow. Okay. So the sequence of questions and answers that the algorithm produces immediately provides the explanation for why that prediction was made. Okay, so that's the motivation. So how do we actually do it? So 
first, we need to define the queries. I already touched upon that. And for, for now, for this talk, I'll assume that the queries are given. And I gave you four examples of what those queries are. The next is how do we select the queries? So as I already said, and this is the, the, the correction here, we're going to select the smallest possible number of queries that are sufficient for prediction. So minimality and sufficiency of this is, is the definition of a parsimonious representation here. The algorithm is going to be information pursuit, which is this algorithm that selects one query at a time based on information gain. And this is going to have connections with information theory. Naturally, each query can be interpreted as a bit. This sequence of queries is sort of a semantic code for the scene. And the principle uh, based on which we stop is, is the concept of semantic entropy. So, mathematically, what do I mean by that? So, capital Q is going to denote the set of all possible questions that I can ask. And when capital Q is applied to a particular X, that's going to denote the answer to that question. So Q is the question, and Q of X is the answer to the question for X. And when I use capital letters, it's because I'm talking about all possible questions and about any random input X that I could potentially consider. So what do I mean by sufficiency? You know, we are going to ask a sequence of questions up until I'm satisfied. Okay, how do I write that down mathematically? What we want to do is to predict Y given X. So we want to estimate the posterior. That is the definition of the task. The idea of a query set being sufficient is simply that rather than uh, that the prediction of Y given X is the same as the prediction of Y given the answers to all of the queries about X. So again, this is the idea when I'm trying to classify a bird that I don't need the image of the bird. I just need a small number of attributes for the bird and those are sufficient for predicting Y. And this is just captured mathematically by saying that P of Y X is the same as P of Y given the set of all answers to queries uh, about X. And so, with these definitions, each query is a basic unit of semantic information, so it acts as a bit, and the set of all query answer pairs define my code. The code here um, depends on this letter E, because I have to have some algorithm that I have not told you yet that is going to select what queries. Okay? And depends on Q, because obviously the, the query set is, is given. So here is the notion of, of the algorithm that I was going to talk about. We're going to have some encoder that given the input, it's going to select, in this case, five queries out of one million possibility. That's the encoder. And then the decoder, what needs to do is, given the sequence or the history of questions and answers, is going to predict the posterior. It's going to predict the class of Y, just given the attributes, let's say, given a small number of attributes. And so here is the definition of semantic entropy. So what we do is the following. Uh, here on the right, you've got the code. This is the sequence of questions and answers about X that this algorithm E has produced. This bar is just the cardinality. So this is nothing but the number of questions and answers that you've asked. And then you compute the expectation with respect to the input X, which is a random variable. So this is the expected number of questions you need to ask in order to predict, say, the class of the bird with high probability. And what we want to do is to select the encoder, which is the algorithm that selects the question, so that you minimize the expected code length. Subject to the constraint of sufficiency, which is that the code that you produce should be sufficient for predicting Y. And that's the constraint that P of Y given X is equal to P of Y given the code. Now, how do I parameterize the encoder? How do I solve this optimization problem? Well, before I do that, actually, there are a few theoretical properties of, of, this, um, of this method. First, what is this notion of semantic entropy between X and Y? In some particular cases, it reduces to classical notions you are aware of. So if 
what you're trying to predict y is the same as x, namely you have a reconstruction task, and you're allowed to ask any possible binary question about x, then semantic entropy reduces to classical Shannon entropy. The second property is sort of related to classical coding theory that said that the entropy is within one bit of, um, so, sorry, the, the expected coding length is within one bit of entropy. The same thing is true if y is a function of x and q is the set of all possible binary queries, then this notion of semantic entropy is going to be bounded below by the entropy of y and bounded above by the entropy of y plus 1. And there are other properties that I think are going to be useful for multitask learning uh, problems where, uh, well, the first two are sort of the obvious ones that the semantic entropy is non negative, that if the x and y are independent, then the semantic entropy is zero. But the last one is probably useful for two tasks. What if I compute the semantic entropy for the same x? I have two tasks, y1 and y2. Then the semantic entropy of the joint task is bounded above by the sum of the semantic entropies of the individual task. Okay, going back to computation. The, the challenge is that computation is generally intractable. And so you need to have an efficient method to, to do it. We will exploit the fact that out of the million possible queries that I'm after, I probably just need a small fraction. And so we do this with a greedy algorithm that was proposed by Don Giman in 1996 called information pursuit. So here's how it goes. The first query is selected as the query little q that has maximum mutual information with respect to y, which is what we're trying to predict. Notice capital X and capital Y here are random variables. So this first query is selected without looking at the input image. So this is like what the example that I gave you about my son. I just tell him, uh, asked me a question, and he said, is the number more than five? Well, he did that without looking at the number. He doesn't know what, what number I'm looking at. Right? And so the first question, therefore, is going to be the same, no matter what the input image is. It's the most informative one. The second question is the one that it's dependent on the image. So little x here is the input image. So now you're going to do the same, select the query that is most informative with respect to y, given that I know the answer to the first question. In fact, this is very related also to PCA. PCA is a particular case of this, where you select the first principal component, then you select the second principal component, but it needs to be independent from the first, and so on and so forth. But the criterion of maximizing mutual information is always the same, and so on and so forth. And then eventually you stop, and you stop when all remaining queries are uninformative for Y, given the, the queries you have thus far. So how do we, you implement this? Well, at each step, you need to compute that damn mutual information. And do we know how to do that? Well, we have formulas. But when x is a million pixels and y is many classes, you actually need a generative model to compute this. So before I even do all of this, I need to have a, a model for the joint distribution of images and the answers to queries, and why, which is what I'm trying to predict. There's been 50 years of research in computer vision as to building generative models for images. It was nearly impossible to get them to work. When GANs appeared a few years ago, it was the first time there were some generative models that were good. But you've seen it, right? The last five years have been amazing progress on getting good generative models for images. Here, the thing is a little bit more complex, though, because we need not only generative models for images, but we also need, con you know, we need to compute conditional mutual information here. It's conditioned on the answers. So it's like, can I have a generative model for MNIST digits conditioned on the fact that pixel 2,3 is black? Once I have a second query, it's conditioned on these five pixels, I know them. This is nearly impossible because you're going to run of training examples very quickly because you might have begun with 80,000 training examples for MNIST, but after you put a few conditions, the number of training examples is going to be dramatically reduced. So this is a big challenge of training generative models that can solve this, this problem. So we've tried two things. This is exactly what I just said. Need a joint distribution of Q of X and Y given the history, and this is extremely hard to estimate empirically. The first thing we tried 
was simply to use variational autoencoders, um, which allow you to do conditioning. Uh, this, uh, explaining this slide could, could be, it should be several slides, so I'm not going to get into the details. So think for the time being that is one of your favorite uh, uh, generative models. But still, these, training these models requires uh, sampling. It requires, uh, and this is very, very costly to do. I don't have the precise numbers, but let's say classifying MNIST digits with this approach ended up taking, I don't know, several minutes to just do one image as opposed to milliseconds, which is when you pass it through an neural network. Right? So recently, and this is unpublished work, uh, we came up with a variational formulation that allows us to speed up this significantly. So rather than taking images, queries, and answers, and building a generative model of everything to then just compute mutual information. And then we not only need to compute mutual information, we just need to actually maximize it. We need to select one query that is maximum. Well, that's just a means to an end. We don't need to do that. If, if I had a mechanism that tells me what's the most informative query, I don't care about the precise value of mutual information. I just need to know which query is the most informative. So this is exactly what we do now. We're going to have two networks. One, which we call the querier, that selects the next most informative question. The other one is the standard classifier that selects what the class is for that input. And so this is now based on this history of questions and answers. So at the very beginning, this is empty. I know nothing about the input image. So the classifier will probably predict 1 over 10 for each MNIST digit. It will give you the prior. And the querier is now going to try to select what query to ask about that MNIST digit in order to predict its class the best. And it does that according to this mutual information criteria. But as it turns out, we were able to prove analytically that finding the query that maximizes the mutual information is the same thing as minimizing the KL divergence between the posterior and the posterior conditioned on the history thus far and the new query that I'm asking. And therefore, we can use this right-hand side, the KL divergence, as the criteria for training both the classifier and the query. And then, once we select a new query, we pass it back as an input again, and we repeat the process. So this is a recursive uh, method. OK, let me show you the algorithm running. So what we're going to do here is apply to the MNIST data set, but in a very unconventional manner. How? You can train a network to do 99.9999. So this is a stupid example. But rather than doing it, as usual, we want to do it in a way that we select only one pixel at a time, or maybe one patch at a time. So at the very beginning is, can you predict what image, what class this is without looking at the image yet? But then tell me what is the most informative patch. So here is the algorithm running. At the very beginning, uh, this is an image of a number two. So this is the input. What you see here is what the algorithm sees. At the beginning, the algorithm sees nothing. And what you see here is what the algorithm predicts, is 1 over 10 for each one of the classes. Which 3 by 3 patch should you look at first? Okay, you can guess that it's probably going to be in the middle, right? Looking at a pixel in the corner, they're all black, so that's uninformative. So that's the pixel, and this patch is the same for every input image of the MNIST data set, because it's the most informative one according to the generative model, if you wish. Given that, and, and you can see immediately that the distribution changes, right? The algorithm now thinks that it's possibly a 0, possibly a 2, possibly a 6, possibly an 8. All of those numbers are consistent with that patch being white. Given that that patch is white, the algorithm next selects this one, and now it thinks that it's more likely to be a 2. This is the third most informative, fourth, and you can see how the posterior is changing. Here, the algorithm is a bit confused. It thinks that it could be a 1. This is after seeing um, just five patches. And look, a 1 is probably consistent with those two patches being white and the other three being black. 
but it takes here it thinks that it could be a zero because it saw that white patch on the on the right and the zero is consistent a slightly slanted zero would be consistent with that so it took the algorithm about eight queries to finally converge to the fact that it's a two and in this particular case with 11 queries 11 looking at 11 patches of the MNIST data set you were able to classify it you can now do this for each and every image on the MNIST data set. And the average number of patches you need to look at is about 11. And the accuracy you get is 99.5 by just looking at those 11 patches. If you now look at different data sets, what is it that you can see? The KMNIST, you need more patches in order to classify it. So th this semantic entropy, expected number of patches that I need to look at in order to classify binary images, it's sort of a measure of the task complexity because the more complex the task is, the more number of patches I need to look at in order to produce an accurate classification. I already mentioned this example, so I'm going to go quickly. This is the bird example. What is being shown here is exactly the same thing as before. Left is the input image. In the middle is the prediction of the probabilities as to which class this bird is. Green means that the answer was yes. Red means that the answer was no. And with nine queries, the algorithm is able to figure out that this is a great crested flycatcher. This is uh, now text classification. Here, the main thing I want to tell you is that the quality of the query set matters. And we chose a very poor query set here, which is, is a word present or not. The key difference is that we don't do this now with 10 questions or 11 questions. Here, we needed a 125 questions to determine the document. And the reason being that if the query set is whether a word is present or not, in most cases, the answer is no. You see, uh, I skipped a lot of the, but see, you see a lot of red. Okay. And so selecting a good query is important to do it. Uh, and the last example here, this is a medical diagnosis data set called SIMCAT 200, uh, where a patient has a sequence uh, there is a sequence of symptoms and whether they're present or not associated with every patient. And again, in all cases, uh, what we're trying to do is to select the most informative symptom, the second most informative, and so on and so forth, and then predict uh, the disease uh, label. All right, so I think I started 10 minutes late, so I'm hopefully still in time. Uh, the summary of it is we really think that interpretability needs to be done by design and by construction as opposed to post hoc. And we think that this information theoretic approach of selecting a sequence of queries that produce an explanation is a, an important step into having a framework for interpretability by design. Of course, there is lots of things to be done. Uh, selecting the queries, what queries are adequate for each domain, how do you determine whether a query set is sufficient for a task or not? Those are all important questions. But for both applications, I think the underlying theme was that low dimensionality and parsimony are important. In the case of robustness, parsimony was in terms of block sparsity. In the case of explainability, parsimony was selecting the minimum number of queries that are sufficient for the task. Thank you very much. I think we have time for questions, given that we ended a little early. Uh, maybe I can start with a couple questions. So for the first part, you, uh, I, have, I was wondering, how do you, because there are infinitely many possible attack families, and so how, how do you choose the attack families and build a dictionary in a given application? And that was one question. And then the second thing was, it wasn't still clear, it wasn't still clear why the linear combination of attacks inside a block would make sense. How many training signals would you need for it to be representative of an attack inside a class? So, yeah. Great questions. So the, as I said, new attacks are coming all the time. And so I think this is an Im Im immediate limitation of what we've done. 
we need to know a priori what are the attack families, and we need to compute attacks on the training samples a priori. And that defines the whole uh, dictionary. So the question of how you extend it to a new attack family you didn't know about, uh, it's, I think, outside the, the research. We wouldn't be able to do that with, with the framework we've uh, provided thus far. Computationally, uh, it's not that much of a problem, we, we hope, because, uh, as I said, the algorithm is just selecting uh, as ideally one block. And so even though the dictionary, in principle, could be very large, what you get to use when you're computing is, is very small. The second uh, part of your question was, um, how do we uh, ensure that you have sufficiently many representatives within each cell? So you're totally right that the number of possible cells can be combinatorially large, and you might not have enough training examples. In the way we've implemented thus far, we assume the dictionary was attacks applied to the training examples. But the reality is that you don't need to do that. You, uh, the key critical ingredient is computing the affine map that defines every cell. If you have that affine map, and, and that affine map doesn't depend on the input, and doesn't depend on any training example. If you, if you were able to compute one affine map for each training cell, you could use that as a dictionary instead. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that dictionary would be sufficient because any element, e even if you have no training example on that cell, if you have the affine map for that cell, it's enough. Sounds good. Oh, thank you very much for the talk. So um, with the explainability, um, it seems that the choice of the queries is really critical. Like, so for example, you know, with the birds, um, like it, it sounded like it really requires expert knowledge, uh, for example, to know, oh, you know, like the, uh, the belly is important, color of the belly and so on. And do you have any ideas on how to uh, mm, get like good queries, like in a principled way, maybe based on data? Yes, um, so that's, I think, critical. I, I had that as the, op the key open question uh, moving forward next, but a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one of them is how do I, I think the, the, the way to, to look at this theoretically is how do you check for sufficiency, right? Because at the end of the day, I, I did have that written down. And I conjecture that one approach to doing this is uh, based on building a dictionary of queries uh, in sort of a lifelong learning fashion. As new data is coming in, you can ask the question, is it well represented by the query set that I have thus far? And if not, can I add it? There are a lot of approaches based on clustering uh, that are currently being explored for, for related purposes where effectively at the very beginning you know nothing and so you might just have one cluster center and as iterations proceed you keep adding new clusters that capture new concepts. In a certain way, some people argue that concepts, so some people argue that concepts uh, are sort of made up by humans for the purpose of compression. Like if we're going to use this concept repeatedly, we better give it a name. And then we can use the name instead of the, the concept. So how can we capture that and build algorithms that will be able to build a query set and eventually figure out, okay, I need a concept for this. And so I think that the idea of using some form of clustering where each cluster corresponds to a concept and you keep adding more concepts as you go along, which is probably the, the way to go. But right now, as I said, we don't have an algorithm that does so, uh, and so those are the lines we're thinking about. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Bihan from NTU Singapore. Uh, thanks, Prof. Rene, for the nice presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in the first talk, uh, robustness of the adversarial uh, denoising, because I work on block sparsity and also adversarial uh, attack. So I think that's interesting. So good to know that you know this block uh, sparse coding idea works for classification, right? Uh, but I'm, 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 I fully understand that we have to know the type of attacks beforehand to train the dictionary. 
But I'm, I'm just curious, even for the same attack, uh, if the attack, say, the budget changes, right? I mean, the, the L2 norm or, or like L1 norm, like constraint changes, uh, will that affect the classification accuracy? Like, without having additional type of attack, the same type of attack, but changing the type of, uh, say, budget or constraint, will that affect the classification accuracy? Yeah. I'm just curious, yeah. I don't think we've had a concrete experiments to answer your question uh, experimentally, but my sense is the following. Um, unlike classical sparsity, where uh, maybe I'm given the level of sparsity or I choose it based on our regularization parameter, when it comes to classification, you have the additional information that you know or you expect that the signal to be classified comes from one class. And so as a consequence, you're not looking for block sparsity in general, but really one block sparsity. And therefore, you can always tune the regularization parameter to just select one non-zero block. Experimentally, we have observed that if you just stop at the first block, that, never, that works worse than maybe letting it choose two or three blocks, and eventually you're going to select the top one. So, so it is true that in practice you need, it's a little bit more complex than what I just said. But, but I think that makes uh, what we do much easier from the perspective that we just need to select the, the one block. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, in the interpretability uh, aspect, like you have a set of queries, right? And uh, <clears throat> um, how is the query answered? Like it is answered by another model. Um, if yes, then the model answering the query might not be um, based on like interpretable assumption, right? Yes. Where are you, by the way? I don't see you. OK, great. So yes, the, the answer question. might not be um, produced by interpretable model. Like it might Great. be another black box model, right? Yeah, fantastic question. So some query sets might be what are the pixel intensities in this patch? That can be automatically answered. And, and, and the example of the MNIST that I give, that's what it is. And that corresponds to sort of the classical post hoc interpretability. In the case of the bird, example, you can train a deep network to predict the attributes of the bird. Some people might ask, well, doesn't that go against the principle? It's like, that is not explainable anymore. I think it's critical in interpretability to choose the right level of resolution at which you want the explanation. And for the bird classification example, the right level of semantic resolution was what are the attributes of the bird. More generally, depending on the task, you might need to do some pieces of it in an uninterpretable manner, and you just need the explanations to be at the, uh, at the right level of semantic resolution, is what I would argue. And so it is perfectly fine to, to train and leverage state-of-the-art systems in order to make the predictions and the answers to the queries. I gave the example of using object detectors as one other example, if your queries are whether an object is present or not in a different region of the image. So long story short, how do we answer the queries? You just train. Um, for example, you could use a visual question answering system if you wanted. Or depending on what the query set is, you just train a network to answer them. What we have not done, and that's also a great question, is if you do that, then the answers to the questions might be noisy. So you need to do 20 questions with noise. There is research on, on that as well, uh, and we're working on that as well. Yeah, thank you. OK, so I think in the interest of time, maybe we can wrap up our talk. Let's thank Rene Vidal for this excellent talk. Uh, next speaker is going to be uh, Prof. Mahdi Sultan al-Khattabi from uh, University of Southern California. 
And the title we have is, I don't know if it's the same type, title you have. Demystifying feature learning via gradient descent with applications to medical image reconstruction. So uh, over on to Marty. Yep. Uh, thanks uh, a lot. It's actually great to be back in UAE. I think I was here 25 years ago as a kid, so it's been a while. Um, so, uh, and, and also thanks a lot to the organizers for putting this together. It's a really exciting workshop. So originally, I've, I've deviated from the abstract a little bit because some of the theories are not there. So what I'm going to talk about is going to tell you about uh, new approaches for deep learning in, in, in MR, and then also tell you a little bit of theory for feature learning via gradient descent. But that at the end, I'm going to try to connect the two a little bit to, to see how these kinds of theories could actually apply for, for inverse problems. Okay, so that's the plan. But before I do that, let me just, uh, because I'm going to talk about a very specific uh, MR problem, let me motivate the general area a little bit at a more higher level. So this MR problem that I'm going to talk about, in my view, is just a, one of the simple examples of AI for sciences. And of course, different people mean different things by AI for the sciences. What we focus on is, uh, is the following which is imagine, uh, you know, basically in the sciences, you often have some sort of measurement apparatus, right? If you're not happy with the quality of your measurements, right, what you typically do is you actually go and buy a more expensive equipment, right? You, you buy like a fancier telescope, uh, like a larger microscope and so on, right? And this is how you get the, that, that higher quality signal or image. Now, what there is, a lot of promise for using AI in this field is that maybe you can actually use your low quality uh, images or measurements, but augmented with powerful kind of AI ML algorithms to actually reconstruct the higher quality measurements from this, right? So, so that, that, that's uh, like the promise. And so obviously there's a lot of promise in doing techniques like this. You, you could really gain a lot by this, but uh, there's also a lot of challenges, right, in this area. So one of them is like a reliability challenge. And, and so, so here's a cool example, right, uh, where you could actually potentially hallucinate when you do MR reconstruction, uh, you could actually hallucinate uh, details, which, which is actually diagnostically significant, but it's not there, okay? So, so definitely you have this issue. Uh, you could have critical reconstruction errors, right? So you, in this case, this is a nanoscale uh, image application where you could actually see like a chip there where it's not, right? Uh, it's actually a critical mistake. So that's kind of what the reliability is a challenge in this field. Uh, another issue is bias. This is actually a Twitter famous image, uh, which is like it's a super resolution application where you're trying to super resolve this picture of Obama, right? Uh, using a kind of a super resolution scheme. But when you super resolve it, it actually becomes white, right? So, so, so there's a, a lot of bias uh, that you, you also need to tackle. So that's one challenge. And then, then uh, finally, like uh, maybe a really important challenge is that there is, you have a data scarcity challenge in the sense that if you look at a, a lot of the modern neural networks that work well, they typically work well for applications uh, in, in like, uh, I would say internet-like applications where data is uh, available on the internet. This is like whether you look at computer vision or NLP. So, so in this kind of cases, data acquisition is easy because you, you, you take data off of the internet. And you know, the cost of gathering data is fairly low, uh, and at least uh, labeling it. And, and finally, you, know, you have lots and lots of data because it is the internet. Uh, you know, but how about scientific data? So if you look at the scientific pipeline, so you have some sort of phenomena that you're trying to measure, you have some sort of sensing, so you get a data point, you gather different data points, and, and uh, then uh, you, you finally you have your algorithm. So if you look at all three parts of this pipeline in, in scientific domain, there, there's challenges, right? The acquisition could be very slow or costly, unlike internet data. Uh, the data set collection, again, is costly, it could be actually harmful, right? If it's a medical domain, it might be harmful to the human. 
uh, sometimes the image gets destructed uh, or, or the sample gets destructed when you image it. And, and finally, the knowledge extraction is also more difficult because the data that you're dealing with is typically more complicated. So all parts of this pi pipeline is, is uh, much more heavy. And again, like a, a particular example, if you look at some of the medical domain, data acquisition be, could be slow and or harmful. Uh, the cost can be very high. Uh, you know, like stuff like MR machines are not cheap. Uh, and then uh, unlike internet where there's lots of data available, you have very small limited public data sets, right? So, so this is yet another kind of challenge. And then finally, this is less of an issue, but there's also a computational complexity challenge in, in the sense that actually like uh, scientific data is actually higher, even higher dimensional, right? So if you look at even imaging, right, the, the data is of much higher spatial resolution. There's more challenge, the channels, there's some, sometimes it's complex value and so on. So, so even the nature of the data sets are typically larger, right? Uh, at least the individual data, even though we don't have that many data points. So th these are kind of issues that we have to be aware of. And, and so before I jump to the specific of the MR, I, I have to say like again, AI for science is a very active field. There's a lot of exciting things happening, both in computational imaging, there's really a lot of cool stuff happening. And even in the basic sciences over the past five years, there's really a lot of exciting stuff. The focus of this talk will be very narrow. At the first part will be on just doing deep learning for inverse problems and medical imaging in particular. But the wider discipline, there's a lot of exciting things happening, which I'm not going to talk about. So, so with that, I'm just going to focus on this specific problem of MR reconstruction and tell you briefly how we can maybe address some of the issues that I mentioned very quickly. So, and, and in particular, uh, this, is joint, this part of the talk is joint work with Dalam, Fabian, and Bertinas, both our students at USC. Uh, so, so the MR reconstruction pipeline is actually very simple. So what you get to see, if you want to image something, what you get to see is samples from the Fourier domain, right? Uh, so at least the toy model is, you, you have Fourier transform plus undersampling plus noise, and the question is how do you go from the measurements to, to, to actually the, the image, right? So this is the question. Well, in reality, the pipeline is actually a little bit more complicated than that because what you have is like the, the body part that you're trying to image, then there are certain coil sensitivity maps because typically you have multiple coils. So, so then you, you do the Fourier transform, there is noise, and then you undersample, right? So, so that, that's the more practical pipeline these days. So, so you get measurements of this form. Um, and then you're trying to reconstruct. Classically, what you would do is, is like kind of the compressed sensing reconstruction scheme is that you say, okay, I have two terms. Uh, you have a data consistency term. You make sure your, uh, the model is consistent with your measurements. And then you have some sort of regularizer, which is supposed to capture prior knowledge about the signal, right? Uh, so that's how classically things work. But these days, uh, you know, uh, the, at least the approach that seems to be dominant, and we will talk about this, is to just do end-to-end -end deep learning reconstruction, which is just you gather a bunch of uh, training data, consistent of the input uh, images and the corresponding measurements, and from these, you just want to find a network that directly goes from measurement space to the image, right? So, so, so it's just based on training samples. So this is often called end-to-end -end reconstruction in this area. So uh, luckily for MR reconstructions, there is actually a very nice large public data set available. This is a, a joint effort by Facebook and NYU. Uh, and this is a pretty rich data set. It has, uh, at this point, it has multiple body parts, uh, different scanners, you know. It's a, a pretty rich data set. Uh, and if you look at like the, well, the leaderboard uh, at least two years ago, uh, you see uh, all of these approaches are based on a certain technique, which is end-to-end -end deep networks, right? Uh, so, so that's why I'm going to focus on that. And you can notice that over the past two years, uh, essentially the top uh, performance have not changed. So the kind of, it seems like the results have saturated a little bit. I'm excluding one team from here. It's because it's from a private company and then they don't make their code publicly available. Um, so, 
uh, but uh, that, that's essentially the, the status of the field. So all of these networks happen to be based on unrolled methods. So let me tell you a little bit what they are. Uh, so remember like the classical compressed sensing inverse problem formulation. So unrolled methods kind of are based on that in the sense that you know, now if you try to use an iterative algorithm to solve this kind of problem, well, what would happen is uh, you, you would have kind of two terms, right? You have the gradient of the first term, and then you have the gradient of the regularizer. But of course, the critical question is what regularizer do I use, right? Because we don't know, right? What is the good regularizer? So the idea behind end-to-end -end methods is actually to say, you know, instead of trying to answer this question, is like I'm just going to replace the gradient of the regularizer with uh, basically some neural network, right? So you parameterize the regularizer gradient by a neural network. Uh, and this actually also connects very well to, to the talk you gave yesterday. So, um, so, so then the pipeline becomes, you know, I have a data consistency term. I, I have like kind of a neural network to model the gradient of the regularizer. And I just repeat this, right? So I, I repeat this pipeline multiple times. And then, uh, you know, on the training data, I just train all of the parameters of all of these networks, right? And, and then uh, at, at reconstruction time, I just use this network to directly reconstruct. And so these are the end-to-end -end methods that work very well in practice. And in particular, the end-to-end -end methods that uh, work well, uh, there's some other tricks, is often you, you have to do this unrolling in the Fourier domain. So, so that, that's one trick that it actually turns out to be important. So you have to unroll in the Fourier domain. And of course, the entire pipeline is a little bit more complicated because you, you have, again, multiple coils. So you have to kind of uh, contract them to a single image. Then you apply the neural network, and then you go back. And uh, the coil sensitivities themselves are also typically uh, you know, basically found out based on data, learned from the data. And you have like a smaller network. This is a shape matrix estimation network to actually even find the coil sensitivities. So this is kind of the entire pipeline uh, for end-to-end -end training for MR these days. And the typical denoisers that are used are kind of these unit architectures, which uh, have kind of a multi-scale feel to them. These are the networks that seem to work very well, uh, in particular in the state-of-the-art E2 Eva Barnett model that, that was the top performer. And so the question we asked uh, was given, uh, you know, uh, like the excitement about transformers is like, can we do better with like modern architectures in particular with transformer models, right? And so, so this is like a story of how we went about coming up with the right transformer network for this domain. And so this is the network we will we, we come up with, which we called HamasNet. It's uh, very appropriate in the Middle East to use that, right? Even though as I'm Persian, we do not have hummus, but you know, <laughs> uh, we were going to steal that concept. Okay, so, so let me tell, tell you the different components. So first of all, let me also tell you why, why do we think transformers are good in this context, right? So, so there are two benefits of transformers that I think makes them particularly well suited to this case, which is, uh, first of all, the convolution kernels are content independent, right? Uh, so convolution kernels are content independent in the, sen in the sense that, you know, whether it's a bone or some other structure, they don't care. And uh, second, uh, convolutional networks are not very good at capturing long-range dependencies, right? So you could have a piece of bone on one side of the image and a piece of bone on a completely different side of the image. And obviously convolutions, at least shallow ones, would not be able to capture that very effectively. And so, uh, you know, transformers are, are known to be better at doing this. So, so there is hope that in this context, they would also work well uh, through like the self-attention mechanism. The details of the self-attention mechanism are not too important. This is how it works. The issue that we are going to have to face with is that this self-attention model, unfortunately, is quadratic in the number of patches. And so this is going to be a problem for us. Uh, uh, so so that, that is something we will have to contend with. And so one, one way of dealing with that, that is kind of becoming well established in the literature, is you, you kind of use local window attention. So you calculate these dot products only in blocks, and then you change the patterns of build blocks uh, between uh, the different settings. And so this is where you get these kind of swine transformers, right? 
uh, which are known to work for some reconstruction problems, for example, for super resolution. So they end up being like a convolutional transformer hybrid, which actually seems to be working well in all sorts of different domains. So, so then they kind of have the benefit of long range dependencies coming from the self attention mechanism. They have the implicit bias of the convolutional networks and they kind of do single scale processing. So, so they're, they're, they're really good for this context. But when we tried this it kind of swine transformer, so, so you, you know, remember for the gradient of the regularizer, the, for the denoiser, you could just now plug in maybe one of these swine transformer models. So if you do this and you pick the largest ones that fit into your GPU memory, because that's usually the constraints that you have, it actually does not work that well. So, so if you use an unrolled swine transformer and you pick the largest ones that fit in, into the GPU, it, it will actually, the performance will degrade significantly. And by the way, this is the SSIM score. It's very sensitive. So it's so actually 1% drop is actually quite significant. So it, it really does not work that well. And, and so, so we have to figure out a way to fix this. And, and so, so there's, the, the issue here is that, uh, you know, uh, one, one fix we, we realized is that well, these, uh, these swine transformers are not multi-scale in nature. We know in a lot of signal processing applications, we know wavelets work well, you know, multi-scale is very good uh, in signal processing. And in particular, the unit model that I mentioned, right, is, is somehow multi-scale, the, the, the existing models. So the first idea, which is simple, is like uh, we were going to try to make swine transformers multi-scale in nature. And, and so, so we, we, we do a bunch of uh, downsampling and upsampling. Uh, to achieve this, and so you, you end up with a multi-scale hybrid feature extractor. So if you now use this and pick the one, the largest one that fits into GPU, you, you get, uh, you know, much better numbers, but you're still not there, okay? So you, you, you're kind of getting close to the state of the art uh, already by doing this idea. So, so then the, the, the child, to, to go further, we have to somehow fix this memory issue, right, uh, to, uh, to do this. So, so it, and it, it turns out that the reason memory is such a bottleneck, particularly in these problems, is that, you know, so for image reconstruction tasks, the input images are of much higher resolution, and the prediction task is also much denser, right? So if you look at the, class, the classification pipeline, you, you could have fairly large image patches, so this is how a vision transformer would work. So you have these image patches, you get token embeddings out of that, and then you pass it through the vision transformer. And then finally you get the classification, in this case, like an African elephant. But uh, if you look at the, if you do the same thing for MR reconstruction, it turns out because you have such high space or special resolution, you actually have to pick much smaller patches. In particular, we had to pick patches of size one. And in a moment I'll tell you, you cannot pick anything larger. So, uh, and that means that the token embedding is much, much higher. And so this is what is causing the me memory bottleneck. Uh, and, and uh, you know, one reason these token embeddings have to be large for the network to work well is because, you know, the, your prediction task is not just a single classification, it's an entire image, right? So, so uh, naturally these token embeddings have to be of much higher dimension. And, and so these are uh, the reason we, we hit this memory bottleneck. So now uh, to, to fix this, uh, so the, the idea is uh, simple. And, and just before I tell you how we fix it, if you use larger pie sizes, it will not work. So if you go by two by two pixels, right, the, the performance will drop significantly again. So you really need very small patches for this idea to work. And so the fix we have is uh, kind of what we do is we extract higher resolution features via convolution and we we pass those through the transformer network, and, and then we combine them again uh, using another convolutional layer. So, so that, that, that's kind of the approach. And we, we also wrap it as is, uh, I think, somewhat typical in this area in a residual network. And so this is how we get the denoiser block for, for, for our network. So, so this is kind of homelessness its entirety. And then to achieve further improvements, we use two common tricks, which is very common in this area. We add unrolling, as I discussed. So, so this is, uh, everybody does this. And, and another idea is like this idea of adjacent slice reconstruction, which is also very important. Instead of doing reconstruction based on just a single image, you do it based on three adjacent images. 
And then you just use this to reconstruct just the middle image. So, so it turns out this is also important. So we also use this trick. So if you combine all of these tricks, so then uh, you know, we, we, we finally get our result. So this is like the you know, state of the art. We, we can kind of slightly improve on it. Again, the numbers don't look much higher, but again, this, this measure of accuracy is quite sensitive, right? Uh, so again, if you look at the, 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 uh, the top of the leaderboard, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll realize this. We tried it on different data set. We, we tried it on FastMR. We tried it on the Stanford uh, PD data set. So we, we observe improvements across data sets. And uh, you know, so, so we, we kind of beat the state of the art. And again, you can see that numbers are at the top are very, all very close to each other. Right? So this uh, sensitivity measure is uh, very, this measure of accuracy is very sensitive. OK. So, so, so that, that's uh, our result. So here are some images of reconstruction. You can see, like, uh, compared to the ground truth, we, we actually get, uh, this is actually very good because this screen is the only screen you can see all the fine details. So uh, you, you can very get uh, very high quality images. And, uh, but, but of course, you know, like, the reason we're interested in, is, in using transformers is not to get, like, this minor improvements in performance accuracy, even though we, we were happy about that. The real reason is to tackle some of the other issues that I talked about earlier, right? For example, how do you reduce reliance on the training data, right? And, uh, you know, actually, it, it, it actually drops very significantly if you use much less training data. So here's a picture where on the x-axis, I show you the amount of training data the algorithm sees versus this uh, SSIM score. And you actually see a significant drop as you use less and less training data. So, so like the, that's the baseline in, in, in blue. Uh, if you use some kind of data augmentation techniques, this is stuff we worked out with uh, Reinhardt in the audience, you actually can improve this, this curve a little bit. Um, and, and so if, if you end up using some contrastive methods, you can do even better. But uh, the hope is that using transformer models, you could do much better. I mean, we're not there yet. So Hammersnet is at this right corner, right? But, uh, but transformer models combined with some of the data reduction techniques seem to be very good. So we're very optimistic that we could get much better results. And then the dream really is that you, know, you get uh, uh, basically the same performance of uh, the, the, the state of the art using only 1% of the training data, right? And again, because these numbers look so close, uh, there is actually a lot of difference in image quality, even with 1% difference, right? So, uh, so, so this is actually, uh, this drop in performance is uh, somewhat significant. Uh, so, so that's one issue that hopefully these transformer models are uh, better at fixing. And I do want to mention briefly that if you actually can uh, make the network learn with less training data, it also has all of the other benefits that I discussed, surprisingly. Uh, it, it actually improves robustness and reliability. So, so for example, uh, these are the experiments that show like it improves robustness to unseen scanners, it, you know, even unseen anatomies going from knee to brain and vice versa. And, and it even also removes some of the hallucination artifacts. So actually, if you train the network to, to learn with less data, surprisingly, it, it actually removes some of the hallucinations, right? Because you know, it, it avoids overfitting to, to the data too much. So, so that, 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 that is like kind of a side benefit. Uh, and then the real dream, the re real reason that I got into this area is like, how could we achieve a high performance low field MR? So this is still very much work in progress. But here the idea is that can we actually make a, a re do reliable reconstruction with low field scanners, which operate at a much lower magnetic field. Why is that good? Because it means that you could use much smaller coils, right? Uh, so, so instead of like the MR machine being like an entire room, it could be potentially even portable, right? So, it, it would be much lower cost. It, 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 it also reduces susceptibility to a lot of artifacts, right? For example, in normal MR machines, you cannot have pacemakers, right? Patients have pacemakers. If you can actually go to lower magnetic fields, you, you can uh, use, uh, patients could have pacemakers and so on. Uh, but that, that's uh, the advantages of doing this. But there's also a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cons. Uh, when you have, like, a, operate at a lower Tesla, lower magnetic field, you get much lower SNR, 
right? Because the, the, it, it is much noisier. And then uh, also, because you have very few scanners of this kind, there's actually very limited data of this kind. In, in fact, in the US, there's only three high performance low flow scanners, right? USC happens to have one of them, so, so that's why we got into this. But uh, basically, so, uh, so, so this issue of data is even more prominent in, in these applications. So, so that's kind of the dream for this area. So even though I focused on a very specific pipeline, right, uh, the hope is that we can eventually get to these more complicated pipeline. This is actually work in progress. We're gathering the data. We're trying to go there. Okay. So, and I want to zoom out a little bit and remind you that, you know, this is just one instance of AI for the sciences. There's a lot of more exciting uh, applications, right? I'm actually fortunate to talk a lot of basic scientists through this uh, Packard Fellows Network almost every year. It's really incredibly exciting of what, what people are actually get doing in, in the basic sciences these days. So, so I think there's a, a lot of exciting things happening. Okay, so that's kind of the first part of the talk. In the second part, you know, I want to try to eventually explain like the performance of these end-to-end -end networks, but we're, we're still not there yet. So I'll talk about feature learning via gradient descent more generally for, for a simple problem, which is low-rank reconstruction, and then I'll come back and, and tell you how, how it impacts like a simple formulation of these reconstruction problems, okay? So, uh, so, so let me briefly motivate why we need kind of theoretical foundations in this area, in particular given all of the exciting theory that, that ha has happened over the past few years. So the basic issue is, and I think Yi actually mentioned this very well, we have a lot of theoretical foundations, but uh, you know, there's a lot of limitations with it. So, so in some sense, the foundations are still a little bit shaky, right? They're not very predictive and so on, right? And so, you know, we are going to focus on, on fixing one small aspect of this, which has to do with feature learning, uh, and I'll tell you about uh, this. And uh, so, so why is it that we need these stronger foundations? Uh, there's kind of two high-level issues. One is that basically, you know, existing theoretical results, it's really incapable of even uh, explaining a lot of contemporary practices, right? So, so for example, you know, choice of the architecture, you know, none of the theory really explains why you need fully connected versus convolutional or a transformer model. Uh, a lot of things having to do with normalization. Uh, you know, a lot of things having to do with representation learning in general. Although there's a, a lot of cool work by people in the audience, and we heard some this morning, right? But there's still a lot of mysteries associated with these modern practices. But I'm not going to focus on those. I'm actually fo going to focus on even toyer settings, right? There is even problems in very simple toy settings. And, and so, so uh, really, like, current theory even fails us in very, very simple instances. And here's one good example. Um, so imagine you have a bunch of, uh, you, you just have a one hidden layer network, and you have a bunch of data points in 3D, and you just want to fit, uh, you know, this one hidden layer network to these data points, right? So uh, this is what the existing theory with the existing hyperparameters in Fury, this is the kind of reconstruction you would get, or you, the, the function estimation that you get. If you actually use like, you know, practical hyperparameters, you, you actually get much nicer, smoother surfaces. So the issue that I'm going to point out here is that basically existing Fury operates with unrealistic hyperparameter choices, whether it's like very small step sizes, very wide networks, or very large initialization scale, right? And it may seem that this is not important, right? Because it's just hyperparameters, but these are very rich function classes. And if we don't use the right hyperparameters, we actually may end up uh, you know, getting really erratic functions, right? And, and so, so existing theory does not apply in these practical regimes, right? And, and of course, so, so we will really talk about building that stronger foundations. So, so and uh, there's, one key issue that we have to focus for that is this, uh, this issue of over-parameterization without overfitting. Modern neural networks contain a lot more parameters than training data, right? And you expect this overfitting to happen, but, but in practice what happens is that you get a very nice fit to the data. And there's kind of two mysteries associated with that. One has to do with optimization. So, so the, the, and the, this, this actually, this very simple example that a lot of you are familiar with captures that well. 
So imagine a very simple toy setting where your data is generated according to a planted neural network uh, with free hidden nodes, and you train a model of the same size to, to fit to this data. So if you run gradient descent on this, you, you actually hit a local optimum, right? So in, in, in this very simple case. But if you over-parameterize in a sense that you add more hidden nodes, uh, you, you actually all of a sudden get to the global optimum, right? So, so the first question is like, what is the impact of over-parameterization on the landscape that makes this happen, right? So, so how do you get global convergence analysis by this over-parameterization? So, so that's kind of the first challenge. The second one, which is arguably much more important, is that, okay, you over-parameterize, so, so you actually have many global optimum in the training loss now because you over-parameterize. So how do you know that the, the global optimum that you get actually has good prediction power, right? So, so the training loss maybe have a lot of global optimum, but from a test perspective, not all of them are created equal. In particular, for example, if you initialize somewhere, you get some test loss, right? If you initialize somewhere else, you actually get a different personal performance. Uh, and this, even though this is a toy picture, this is not a toy, toy uh, phenomenon, which is like, even by just changing the scale of initialization, you actually get very different performance, right? You can get very different global optimum. And, and uh, let me show you that to you more clearly, right? You can actually reach different global optimum by just changing the initialization scale. And by that, I mean the standard uh, deviation of the random initialization, right? So, so here is, again, same simple one hidden layer neural network example. You're changing the scale of initialization. That's the only thing you're changing on the x-axis. And uh, on the y-axis, the reconstruction, you can see for all initialization scales, you get zero training error, very small training error. But the test error is dramatically different, right? So at large uh, initialization, the test error is high. This is where existing theory actually operates. And at small initialization scale, uh, it's much better. So this existing theory, which I'll talk about very briefly, is, is known as the NTK or the lazy regime or the linear regime, right? Um, and essentially, in this regime, neural network essentially behave like kernel methods, right? So, so it allows you to develop some bounds on the performance of neural network, but it's not very good because, you know, the features are frozen to the one at initialization. So, so in practice, you can get actually much better bounds, right? And so this is, in particular, the mystery we're going to, uh, to focus on, is how do you establish generalization of vanilla gradient descent with small random initialization, not large, right? Um, and, and so, uh, so let me tell you how this existing theory operates very briefly. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, so I can go over this very quickly. So, uh, so as a prelude, look at like a least squares problem in the over-parameterized case. So you have less training data than number of parameters. So n is actually less than p. So, so in this case, if you run gradient descent, it has like three cool properties. First of all, you get global convergence because it's actually complex here. You, you converge to the global optimum which is closest to theta zero, and also the total gradient path is relatively short. Modulo condition number, you converge very quickly. So it turns out that you can really basically directly generalize this into in the nonlinear case. So if you, and if you also have a nonlinear least squares problem now, so and if you try to run gradient descent on this, then the gradient has this form, right, which is like Jacobian transpose. Jacobian is just the first order derivative of the output of the model times the residual. So essentially in this problem, the Jacobian kind of behaves like the X for the linear problem. And so it's as if you're working with these nonlinear features of, of the Jacobian essentially. And so the way a lot of the existing theory works is under some technical assumptions in, on the Jacobian, which I'm not going to get into, you can show that along the trajectory of gradient descent, the function essentially stays linear, right? So, so that, 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 that's kind of the formulation. Uh, and, and so you can also show that these technical conditions are satisfied when, when you have both like a sufficiently wide network and a large scale of initialization. So, so and, and then obviously if you know that, if you can understand the trajectory, you can also get some optimization and generalization guarantees. But in this case, it would say that the generalization guarantees we get is as good as kind of the random features you use at initialization, right, of this Jacobian matrix. 
And, and so there, there's like a lot of theoretical results about this. We, we kind of did an argument like this using this linearization idea in a paper with Jason and Otto a few years ago. And then uh, this kind of idea was, uh, you know, a lot of people worked on it and it's like became really popular after these kind of NTK papers, uh, including by a lot of people in the audience. So uh, a lot of exciting things happened. But, uh, but then, uh, you know, the fundamental issue is that, you know, your features are frozen to that at initialization, and then you, you, this is not good, uh, you know, you don't get as good of a performance out of the network as you could, right? And this picture, I think this example kind of demonstrates that very well, this visualization. So, so for this visualization, what we're going to do, we're going to, and th this kind of, uh, you know, I think the first people that did this is, uh, Bach and Chisa. Uh, so we're going to embed the hidden nodes as vector in higher dimension. So what do I mean by that? So you, again, we focus again on the simple one hidden layer model. Uh, so corresponding to each hidden model, hidden node, we're going to look at the input vector followed by the absolute value of uh, the, the, the output weights, right? So for each hidden node, you actually end up having like a point in higher dimension. And you see three black lines these black lines are actually the directions of the planted model. Remember, like the original model generating the data is a one hidden layer network with three hidden nodes. The black lines are those directions. So in, in this kind of like non-lazy regime, this is where we don't have theory for, right? Where you start from small random initialization, something very interesting happens. All of those hidden nodes actually align themselves with one of those free planted models as you run gradient descent, right? Um, whereas, you know, in this lazy or NTK regime where we do have good theory for, uh, you know, you, you do get global optimality, but the features are essentially, the, the nodes don't move around too much, right? Because the features have to stay close to the one at initialization. And so you get much more erratic functions out of this, right? In some sense, you don't find the simple underlying model because you didn't learn the right features, right? And, and so, so this, I think this, uh, this kind of depiction kind of demonstrate the, 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 the issue very well. Uh, so, so in some sense, existing theory does not apply in these practical regimes, even in, for these toy models, right? And so, so this part of the talk is basically an effort to go beyond this lazy regime. And you know, we've done this for three problems. So one is low rank reconstruction. We've done it for one hidden layer networks. And very recently, we've looked at this for end-to-end -end training methods. So Jason is actually going to talk about the second one, uh, I think, tomorrow or Friday. So I will not talk about this, right? So, uh, so I'll only talk about the first one and briefly mention how it would extend to the last problem, right? So I'm going to talk about low rank reconstruction mainly. For one hidden layer networks, you can uh, come to Jason's talk. So it's a plug for him. Um, so, uh, so, so basically, uh, so for low rank reconstruction, this is joint work with uh, Dominic Stoger and Chang Zhi. Uh, Dominic is now a, a faculty in Germany. So, uh, so Low rank reconstruction, uh, which was talked about in, in, in the tutorials quite a bit. So, so here, what you're trying to do is, uh, you know, you have linear measurements from a low rank matrix, right? And, and uh, you're trying to reconstruct it. And let's say the underlying matrix has rank R star, right? So now, the way over parameterization manifests itself in this problem is also very simple. You just fit a model of higher rank, right? Instead of rank R star, you just fit a model where it has rank R bigger than R star. So you just fit a higher rank. It's, this is equivalent to adding more hidden nodes in, in your uh, neural network model. So, um, and then you, you just run gradient descent, starting hopefully with small random initialization, right? So even in this problem, which is a much simpler problem than neural networks, arguably, like the, these challenges exist. Of course, the non-convexity, the optimization challenge is there. So uh, it, you know, uh, in the tutorial, we, we, the people talked a lot about uh, how to address this, right? There's kind of two techniques, roughly, to address the non-convexity here, including by a lot of people in the audience. Almost uh, half of the audience have worked on some problem of this form. So, so one class of ideas is like 
you come up with a clever initialization technique using spectral methods, and then you kind of do a local convergence analysis, right? Which is like basically you come up with an initialization which is kind of close, and then you do a local convergence to get there, right? And then there's a second class of results. Uh, again, talked a lot uh, about uh, a lot yesterday, which is like, you, you kind of study the landscape, right? Figure out where the global optima are, where are, where are the bad local optima, where, where are like the saddle points, and then you come up with clever algorithms to, to avoid the bad regions. Trust region methods, you know, again, there was uh, an entire tutorial about that uh, yesterday, right? So uh, it, a lot of work uh, by John Wright and uh, his uh, you know, team, uh, former team who are uh, all in the audience now. So, uh, so, so then, uh, you know, but despite all of this progress, there's not a lot of work that actually just focuses on what happens if I just run gradient descent from small random initialization, can I get actually rates of convergence to global optimum, right? So even in this kind of arguably much simpler problem, this is not completely understood. And of course, the generalization challenge is even more, uh, you know, more significant here, right? So again, we're working in this over-parameterized regime. So it means the number of parameters of the model is actually bigger than the number of samples training data, which is also bigger than the true number of the parameters uh, in the original problem, right? So, so we're operating in this regime. And in this regime, if you have a large initialization scale, if you have a large standard deviation at initialization, using this kind of NTK lazy style theory is actually not too hard to show that you can achieve global optimality, right? So this is something we proved a few years ago uh, with a colleague at now Michigan, Thomas Oymak. So, so, but the issue is that here, because you're over-parameterized, you have many global optimum. So the training, like you can easily prove that the training loss is zero, but if you look at the test loss, which happens to be proportional to the error in reconstructing the underlying low rank matrix, it, this can be actually potentially large when you have large scale of initialization. And interestingly enough, you get exactly the same curve as you got for neural networks, right? So for different training data, right, you get, for, for different initialization scale, you get zero training error, but you get very different test performance. It's exactly the same plot. Again, like existing theory operates here, we wanna focus on here, right, which is, if you use small random initialization, how, how do I get uh, gradient descent to, to, to converge and also generalize? So, so that, that's kind of the challenge. Uh, so it turns out uh, there's a key idea that we use in, in the proofs. Uh, so before I tell you that in more technical detail, let me just tell you about the key idea. Roughly speaking, the, the idea is that gradient descent plus over-parameterization essentially behaves like running power method on certain matrices, right, or, or tensors in the case of neural networks. So um, again, I'll tell you what those matrices are, but here's a demonstration. So, uh, you know, in one case, I'm running gradient descent. In the other case, from small random initialization. In the other case, I'm just running power method on that fixed matrix, okay? So if you compare the trajectory, at least initially, they're the same. Eventually they diverge, but initially it's the same. Again, eventually they diverge. But this, this is uh, good because it says that if I want to analyze the trajectory of gradient descent, I could just analyze power method on a fixed matrix, which is very easy to do, right? So, so that's the basic idea. And then, you know, once I'm close, you know, they diverge, but maybe I could do a local convergence analysis again. And so here's a diff slightly different picture that shows this, right? Uh, it shows the angle between uh, gradient descent and power method with, with, the, with the underlying matrix. You can see initially the trajectory is really on top of each other. So this is not just a theoretical construct. It really is true in practice. Now, the interesting part is that we're running power method on this, these uh, certain matrices, equivalent to running power method on certain matrices. These are exactly the kind of uh, th this is exactly the initialization schemes we used to do to, to initialize these uh, low rank reconstruction problems uh, five, six years ago when, when we worked on spectral initialization followed by gradient descent. So here what we're saying is that gradient descent from small random initialization actually automatically does spectral initialization, right? Uh, which is uh, very exciting, right? Because it connects to all of the previous literature uh, that a lot of us worked on. 
So, so with that, uh, here is our, our result. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume the measurements are Gaussian and the condition number of the problem is order one. So, so uh, uh, we're going to assume uh, this is over parameterized. So rank R is bigger than R star. The training data that you see, this should be R star times the product, right? We, we need a little bit more. But then if you start from small random initialization, what you can show is that after a certain number of iterations, the, the generalization error uh, actually behaves like this. The polynomial is not important. The point is that it, it goes to zero with the initialization scale. So, so if you actually have a very small initialization scale, you get actually zero. Actually compared to the previous versions of this result that some of the main people of the audience have seen, like the dependence on alpha is much cleaner now. So, so that, that's kind of our result. Uh, so th this actually does capture what we want. As alpha goes to zero, you, you basically get a uh, perfect reconstruction. So what happens in the last phase? Because you may ask, okay, we stop at a certain number of iterations. So you can show that this last phase doesn't affect uh, the, the, the generalization performance. Uh, but the, interestingly enough, the convergence of the loss actually dramatically slows down. You no longer have a geometric convergence rate like you have in this phase. The training loss goes to zero, but at a rate that is polynomial, like one over t, right? Um, so, um, uh, yeah, and in, in fact, uh, you know, in certain cases, you can still show uh, that, uh, you know, you get a geometric convergence rate, but at a slower rate, and this is actually in, is very much in the spirit of uh, this result by René and uh, his collaborators, where, where they show that in this regime, you actually can get geometric convergence rate but it, it depends on the noise scale. It's not completely clear what, what is the best rate possible in this regime. So the last phase, there's still some stuff to be figured out. But let me make some comments about the results, right? So uh, this, uh, these kinds of Gaussian assumptions, you can relax them to the RIP. And in fact, even if the model is not over parameterized, when R is equal to R star, this is the only deterministic result that, 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 that can show this. So previous results in the literature, uh, including uh, by, by uh, some of the organizers, right, uh, so are based on random measurement results that require really one out analysis. Our result is purely deterministic. So, so in this sense, even for R equals R star, uh, you know, the results are kind of interesting. So there is an, another extreme case, which is heavily over parameterization. When R is equal to D, this is actually was a cold base paper award by, uh, um, from a few years ago. So compared to this result, we have some technical advantages. Our rates are better and so on. But the, the most significant issue is that in these uh, results, the sample size goes to infinity as the initialization scale goes to zero, whereas we operate with a fixed sample size, right? So those are some technical comments. There's additional technical benefits that I will not talk about. Uh, then there's kind of the issue of balancedness. Uh, so, so there's a lot of really interesting analysis of this problem in the, in the asymmetric population case when you don't have measurements on top. Uh, so, so and a lot of these ideas work based on the idea that you know, the, the two factors remain balanced. So, so that's kind of the idea. It turns out that this is not exactly true when you have random measurements on top. So, so the, the, these, uh, you know, like in the population case, you have balancedness, uh, but uh, you know, in, in the uh, in the empirical case, the ba the balancedness is at a much higher level. It actually grows, and so this this causes a lot of issues for the analysis, right? So that's kind of one key technical difference, uh, and and it turns out that you need finer notion of balancedness, which are a little bit technical. I'm not going to get into, right? So, so that's kind of like compared to a lot of work, including by people in the audience, that that's kind of another challenge that you have to deal with in this case, okay? So I'm going to skip uh, these proof sketch, uh, but uh, maybe, uh, so this is the kind of the sketch of balancedness, right? So let maybe very briefly tell you about the symmetric case, right? Uh, why is it that small random initialization helps? If you look at the first iteration of the gradient, it looks something like this. Uh, now, if you know that you have a small random initialization, you can basically pretend the second term is zero. So if you plug that into the gradient update, you end up with a fixed matrix times u zero, right? Now, if you repeat this, right? Uh, so in the first few iterations, the size of the matrix is going to be still small. So you can just pretend it's a fixed matrix to the power t times u zero. And of course, this is nothing but power math, right? 
Now, now why is this matrix a good thing to run power method on? It's because essentially in this case you can show that it concentrates very well around the underlying planted model, right? So obviously if I run power method on this, it works very well. Now in reality, uh, and this is really true in practice, so in reality th this is a little bit more complicated than that. There's actually three phases. This is the first phase, which is the spectral alignment phase. There's a second phase where you actually go away from the saddle points, and then finally there's a local convergence phase. So you have to actually have to do more work, but the, the spectral alignment phase actually turns out to be very critical, okay? Um, so I'm going to skip this, tell you very, you know, I'm running out of time. So again, one hidden layer network come to Jason's talk, so he's going to talk about that extensively. But at the very end, I do want to mention how it connects to end-to-end -end methods, right? And for that, I'm going to focus on a very simple version of the problem, which is how do I denoise uh, using end-to-end -end methods, right? And you know, in this case, I selected a subset of the audience and organizers. So, so here the problem is simple. I have noisy images. I want to learn, train the network to denoise the images, right? And, and so I'm going to focus on a very simple formulation for denoising, which is I'm going to assume that the signal is actually piecewise linear, and I add Gaussian noise to it, right? So, so that's the model. The clean data point is piecewise linear, the input is Gaussian noise, and I want to train a network, right? Which, which goes from the one hidden layer in this case, goes from the noisy images or the signals, and, and figures out the clean image, right? So, so that, that's kind of the problem. And of course, I use the least squares loss as with everything else, right? Um, so, and I run this from small random initialization. So you may ask, what is the effect of large initialization versus small initialization in this case? How does this feature learning manifest itself for the, in this problem? So if you use large initialization, you can see the reconstruction is actually poor. If you use small initialization, actually this is not playing. <laughs> okay, that's, can I go back? Okay, uh, so this one is not playing, but you, you get a perfect reconstruction. You actually get the piecewise linear picture. So in some sense, uh, large initialization is sort of like L2 interpolation. It's kind of like not very good. Small initialization actually perfectly reconstruct a piecewise affine structure. So it's, it's more like a bounded TV norm reconstruction. So, so that's going to be the key difference here. And I'm not going to talk about the theory, but interestingly, the general strategy is the same. If you look at the training at generalization loss, it has exactly three phases again. So, so it, there is like uh, three phases as you can see in this plot. There is a first phase where this spectral alignment phenomenon happens, which is basically essentially uh, the, 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 the parameters, the two layers of the net align themselves with, with the underlying basis of, of the affine mapping, uh, the piecewise linear mapping. So, so that's the first phase. There is also like a saddle avoidance phase. And then finally, there, there is kind of, which is certain minimum eigenvalues, right? The size of the network parameters grow. So, so that's the, 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 the saddle avoidance phase. And finally, you get local convergence in the sense that the error actually goes down to zero at a geometric rate, both in terms of test and train error, right? So interestingly enough, a lot of the, at least the high level strategies for low rank reconstruction carries over to this problem. We haven't figured out the details yet. This is why I had to talk about the low rank reconstruction problem, but uh, we, we're getting there. So, uh, so, so that, that's the story. So let me wrap up here. So I, I talked about kind of two different aspects. One was more on the applied side of things, which is like coming up with new architectures for MR reconstruction. Again, this is, uh, uh, you know, on a simple problem, there's a lot of exciting things to come next. And then the second part was focusing on feature learning via gradient descent, right? And the idea was, can we go beyond this sort of lazy training regime? And so there were two key ideas. First one was that I want to finish with is that gradient descent has some interesting spectral biases that you could utilize. And there's also a very intricate coupling of the trajectories, right? The, even though you have a lot of weights, they kind of coupled together in a very interesting ways which you can exploit to analyze the trajectory, both in terms of optimization and uh, generalization, right? And so I'm going to just end with the paper. So the, the, the MR reconstruction paper are out. Uh, we, we have two papers on both 
the small for low rank reconstruction in the symmetric case uh, and uh, with Jason on, on the neural network case. We, have, we also have an upcoming paper this month on, on the asymmetric case uh, and, and uh, another one also on, 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 the, uh, on the signal reconstruction problem. So I'm going to end it here. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. I have a question about uh, here, uh, okay, the, the first uh, story. So in the Hamas net architecture, um, the multi-scale transformer uh, structure seems to be quite flexible. I assume that it can also be used to uh, use some other tasks in addition to MR reconstruction, like other low level vision tasks, such as uh, uh, super resolution and uh, image segmentation. Uh, have you tried um, this task? Uh, we have not, but that would be very interesting. I mean, we, we, we've uh, really focused a lot on, uh, on MR. And to be honest, the goal was, our goal of using this model was not to improve the basic MR problem that right? I talked about. That came as a surprise to us, right? That we could actually improve it even though slightly. Our goal was the other problems that we were working on that I mentioned. So, so we've been very focused on MR, but that, that would definitely be very interesting. So, so I encourage you to try that if that's the area you're working on would be very interesting. Thanks. Hi, a couple of questions. With respect to the first part of the talk, it seemed to me that, I mean, the, the wisdom is that uh, transformers require a lot more data than convolution yeah. architectures. But your plots were showing that with only 1%, you can do well. So my question is, for those transformer architectures, maybe they were pre-trained on somewhere else. And so the question is whether the comparison is fair in yeah. terms of. So, so I think, no, well, I agree with you. Transformer models do require more data. But it does seem like when you augment, well, you add like data reduction techniques, like data augmentation or contrastive learning, some of which does require pre-training, right? They, they work better in, 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 combined with that, right? And there's some evidence of that in the literature. But you're absolutely right. Just like training a convolutional network versus transformer, obviously transformer require more data, but somehow they couple better with data reduction techniques, uh, such, such as data augmentation and, and contrastive learning and so on. So, so that's the hope, basically. My second question is about the second part. Um, the scale alpha, I think you show that you could get much larger step sizes because you have one over alpha in the, in the bounds for mu. Yeah. But the T also had a one over alpha, and so yes. doesn't the number of iterations also go to infinity with alpha um, going to zero? Uh, yes, uh, so, so I think there's a fix to that for, for that specific case of alpha going to zero, but so it doesn't really have to go to zero, you can cap it off, but, but I think in, in some cases, I mean, we, 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 the dependence should not be log one over alpha, it should be max of something and something, but definitely does grow. So, so this number T should really de grow with one over alpha, uh, but it should be capped off at some point, with, uh, which our theory does not do right now. So, so you're absolutely right. So it captures some aspects, of it, but not completely, yeah. And my last question is more about debate. Um, so when the neural tendon kernel stuff came out, I was very doubtful. Uh, it was several years ago. Uh, primarily because, okay, you've got to stay close to initialization. And yeah. so I asked this to uh, Francis back. Um, and the first thing, it was in the middle of the pandemics, so he said, am I being recorded? Uh -huh. <laughs> and so he admitted, so are you willing to admit that going into the neural tangent kernel direction was a bit of a mistake and led the community to towards thinking of a regime that was far from representing the situation where we should be working in? Uh, so that's a good question. I, I don't think, I mean, I think we, the community overdid it a little bit, right? But, but you know, like if you think about it, if 
10 years ago, or even seven, eight years ago, you asked me that we could get global convergence guarantees for the training loss of deep neural networks, I would have been surprised, right? So it is true that it's not in the correct regime, you know, the fine details are not good, but the fact that you can get that with somewhat of an elegant proof, I think is nice. But I do think we, as a community, we did, overdid it a little bit, right? Uh, you know, we focused too much on it. And so, so that's kind of, uh, you know, trying to uh, deviate from that right now, right? So, so it captures, like, as with any theoretical result, it captures some aspects of the problem, but uh, in this case, you can see it does not capture more finer aspects like generalization, right? Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have a comment and, and a question. So I think on the first question we got from here, it turns out that actually we married uh, fixed match, which is also one of these semi-supervised uh, consistency regularization algorithm, which actually uses uh, augmented data with AST, which is a transformer on audio data, and we got very similar results to yours. In other okay. words, actually it's very robust. The very good. So, <laughs> so, so there is something Independent there. confirmation. Yeah, so there is something, and it's completely different data, so yeah. multi-channel audio data. Yeah. So there's something there, obviously, right? The second question I had is in your first talk, um, so I've seen some papers using GANs and our diffusers for that reconstruction. So what are your thoughts on that, on how that approach compares with well, what you're doing. You're going to get me in trouble a little bit because I'm on record, right? But, uh, but you know, actually, the, uh, Reinhardt has, uh, this is a, a lesson I've learned from Reinhardt, who is going to talk uh, next in the afternoon, which is basically, it turns out that in, 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 in practice, right, uh, the GAN approach to solving inverse problems at the moment do not work that as well, right? And the issue seems to be basically that, uh, you know, uh, somehow, uh, GANs hit an error floor. Basically, uh, you know, like, uh, they can reconstruct well up to a certain error floor, but they cannot kind of get past these error floors. And all of the GAN models in the literature, the only thing that changes is the error floor. The error floor keeps going down, so at point, some point it might be small enough that we're happy with it, but at the moment it's still high. And, and so, so, that, so that's why, if you look at the leaderboard, <laughs> like the top 10 teams, none of them are GANs. Uh, diffusers, uh, there's not uh, an active result on the leaderboard. So uh, I think that they also share that, uh, that issue, but there's no <laughs> verification of that, yeah. It might be a great talk. Um, I have a quick question regarding the, the, the last part of the talk where you gave an example of total variation denoising. Right. Uh, so in that example, and you have three phases of learning. So, so this is clearly not an interpolation regime, right? So, so do you have the last um, um, convergence to to the interpolations, interpolating solution or not? Like, if it is interpolating with the noise, then it's clearly not gonna. gonna yeah, yeah, generalize. yeah. We, we don't we don't have exact right, but but you can show uh, you, you you basically. So actually. We, we actually have a proof for the last phase, roughly, or at least the, the strategy we, we can show empirically is correct. Uh, the strategy is that you actually try to show the, the TV norm is actually very small, uh, proportional to the stat statistical min-max error, essentially, right? Uh, but so so that, that's how we, we go about showing that, right? Uh, but obviously there's some error, but the, the, the point is that uh, you know, we can capture there in TV norms, so, so in, in some sense it would capture the piecewise uh, affine structure, hopefully, right? But again, you know, like for the last part, there's no concrete end-to-end -end theorem, so, so I, I, I hate to speculate at this point. I'm just trying to say that the strategy overall seems very similar. Yeah, in my talk tomorrow, I'll offer a slightly different explanation to how, how it works. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Okay, so... I think, well, okay, one, one, one. One, okay. Um, you mentioned this puzzle about uh, over-parameterization and generalization, but I think in the case of classification under the square loss, uh, as I mentioned this morning, it's pretty clear that you have a lot of the generate minima, um, and some are for very large rho, which is the product of the norms of the weight matrices. Those correspond to NTK. They are zero in, of the training empirical loss. Yeah. But 
um, like the standard Rademacher bound show, uh, the ones with larger rho are bad for generalization. So if you have a bias towards small rho, which you can ha have with even a very small weight decay, or with small initialization, then you get a select to select among all the degenerate minima of the empirical loss, the ones that are good for generalization. Yeah, so that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, and this is, by the way, the standard explanation in the, in the linear case. <coughs> yeah. You know, the pseudo, you have a pseudo inverse, you have an infinite number yeah, of, of inverses, and you, what you choose, you choose the one with minimum norm, where happen right, to be. Right, of course. The, okay, so, so, so. And that's why you use small initialization, because, you know, it minimizes the distance to initialization. If you use small initialization, it would practically be zero, right? Exactly. So yeah. I, I don't think there is a big mystery about uh, over-parameterization and generalization. Well, well, you know, going to the nonlinear case, I think, uh, and what, what especially I, the results I mentioned are for the nonlinear yes, case. Yes, but uh, what we're looking at is the gradient descent dynamics, right? Not just the. We yeah. are also looking at gradient descent dynamics. Actually, there is a quite a difference between um, between SGD and gradient descent. Right. But that's separate discussion. So we, we can discuss this, but uh, you know, even on the low rank reconstruction, if you apply any of the existing theory, it would not predict. Uh, we've include, looked at some of those results that you mentioned. It would not predict uh, like, like, like this exactly. So, so, but maybe we can discuss the details offline. Yeah. OK. Um, I probably have one more question, oh, and then okay. we can break up. So, I was, I had a question similar to what Rene had, which is uh, with the, with the multi-scale transformer, um, and you are going to less training data regimes, and there are many methods that now exist in the MRI literature for less, with low, tr less training data. And so I was wondering where does it, where does the transformer really fall in the spectrum, all the way to, you know, we have methods with no training data. So, and the other thing was, there's the question of, if you have less and less training data, what kind of theory can we come up with for explaining generalizability with less, uh, you know, in, t with in the limit of very little training data? So, uh, so just what are your thoughts on some of this? Yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know if I thought about the first one, which is like, do transformers allow us to bridge the gap all the way to, to kind of untrained methods, right? Uh, you know, I don't know, I mean, it might be interesting, so maybe actually Reinhardt might know whether they, there are untrained methods that are based on transformer networks, but how well do they work? So, so I think that, that might be a, a starting point, right, to see if those methods, if transformers also work with untrained schemes, right? So that might be an indication that these architectures are universally better. But I don't know if that had been, has been tried, so, so I think that's interesting. And uh, sorry, what was the second question? I, uh, it's more on um, trying to understand how how methods generalize in the low training data. Region. I see. Yeah. So I think my uh, thinking on that is well, at least the, you know our approach to it would be to try to analyze again gradient descent dynamics for for the heuristics that people use, right? But at a at a higher level, I don't know if I have a better answer than that, right? So so that that would be my approach, like take data augmentation or something like that then try to analyze gradient descent dynamics to see what the effect of that is in that. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's thank Madi for this wonderful talk. And I, I think maybe we can have an extra 10 minutes and then we can start at 4.10, is that fine? Yeah. Start, it's supposed to start, the next talk is supposed to start at 4, but we are at 3.48, so maybe we can start at 4.10. 4.15, okay. So we'll be back here at 4.15. We have a poster session and coffee break.
ஹலோ ஓகே வெல்கம் பேக் ஃப்ரம் த காஃபி பிரேக் வில் ஹாவ் வி ஹாவ் டூ மோர் டாக்ஸ் இன் தி இமேஜ் ரிகவரி செஷன் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஒன் இஸ் பை ரைன்ஹார்ட் ஹெக்கல் அண்ட் தென் நெக்ஸ்ட் ஒன் பை பிஹான் வென் ஸோ ரைன்ஹார்ட் இஸ் ஃப்ரம் த டெக்னிக்கல் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃப் மியூனிச் அண்ட் ஹிஸ் டாக் இஸ் கோயிங் டு பி ஆன் டிஸ்ட்ரிபியூஷனலி ரோபாஸ் டீப் லேர்னிங் ஃபார் இமேஜ் ரிகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் ஓவர் டு ரைன்ஹார்ட் all right okay thank you very much so i'm going to talk about distributionally robust uh, deep learning based image reconstruction so this is work with a number of my uh, colleagues so uh, mohammad is a, so i'm going to talk about um, four related papers and the first paper is um, a work by tobit klug the second one is by mohammad and the third one is a collaboration between um, daniel jiu and me and akshay is a collaborator who has been helping us with uh, making sure that all the mri um, experiments make sense all right so we consider the accelerated mri problem so the accelerated mri problem is as follows we have some image and it's uh, undersampled in this case by a factor of 4 and what you see here those lines those are the frequencies or the information that we actually see and the black lines that's information that we do not see and so from this undersampled information our goal is to estimate the original image so as you have already seen from the tutorial and from Mardi's talk we know that deep neural networks trained end to end give excellent performance so neural networks trained to map effectively the undersampled measurement to a clean image outperform classical methods by a significant margin and there are a number of ways how you can do this so you know first people have been using convolutional neural networks and then um this has evolved to people using uh, transformers like in in Mardi's work for example and again this performs really well both in terms of computational speed so it's super fast because all you need to do is like a forward pass through your network and it gives you really good imaging performance So now there are like two components to this right to this performance so the one component is the models and algorithms that are used for example whether you're going to use a convolution network and unrolled network things like that and then of course it matters very much uh, which data you train on so now if we look at some related problems in machine learning so for example in uh, natural language processing uh, then we have seen that scaling up the data set size and scaling up the models gave significant improvements in performance so here what you see is let's just look at this middle plot um you see a transformer that has been trained on varying data set sizes and as you can see the larger you make your data set size and if at the same time you also trans at the same time you also scale your model then you really get this um performance improvement right that follows the scaling law behavior and this has been pretty accurate and from this we we kind of know that if we for example um you know multiply our data by a factor of 10 then we get a certain kind of performance in- improvement and the same has been true for uh, image classification models for models in vision so what you see here is the image net error rate and you see again the performance as a function of the data set size and again what happens is if you increase the data set size and at the same time you increase the size of your model then you get a performance increase that follows this scaling law and so this has been um this kind of observation has been driving a lot of the improvements lately right because people have been just collecting more data and making models larger so now if we look at image reconstruction problems then we see that the data set size is actually really small so for example there is this uh, paper from 2015 where they uh, train cnns to perform a uh, denoising it works super well they only trained on 90 images then there has been um another paper where they um you know did compressive sensing for example on the fast mri challenge this data set is only 35000 images large right and many of these images are actually quite related because um they were obtained by like volumes and the neighboring images are actually really uh, similar so now if we look at what has been happening recently there the the very best performing model for denoising as of today is the swin transformer 
And the spin transformer has also been trained only on 10,000 images, right? So the data set sizes for imaging problems are relatively small compared to what we have been seeing in natural language processing and so on, and for prediction tasks. So for prediction tasks, we have seen that, you know, um, the state-of-the-art models for image classification and natural language processing, they have been trained on like billions of examples, right? So now the question is, can scale improve image reconstruction performance, right? Like with scale, I mean, what if we just take existing models, make them larger, and at the same time also scale the number of images that we train on, does this significantly improve performance? So is this like a way forward? So let's see what we would expect just by looking at like a very, you know, toy model. So let's say we have a signal X and the signal X is like imagine it's relatively high dimensional, so it's an image. Um, just for the sake of, you know, this toy example, let's assume it's drawn from a D-dimensional subspace. And the D-dimensional subspace is supposed to model, you know, some low dimensional image manifold. So let's look at a denoising problem. So let's look at a measurement where x or where y is equal to x plus some noise, and let's just consider Gaussian denoising. So for this Gaussian denoising problem, a linear estimator is actually optimal, but what we do is we consider a linear estimator that is trained on n many examples through empirical risk minimization. So that's kind of a toy model for a neural network. So now this is our risk. Uh, w times y, that is the estimate of our signal, and x is the original image. So what we assume here is we are, we are drawing uh, data from this, you know, um, like pairs of measurement and a signal, and then we are doing um, empirical risk minimization, and we, we look, well, how does the error behave as a function of the training samples? And it can be shown relatively uh, easily that the optimal early stopped estimator obeys the following bound. So the mean square error is small or equal to the mean square error corresponding to the optimal estimator plus some term that um, is, you know, some quantity depending on the dimension of the signal div divided by the number of training samples. So from this we can see um, that if we, from this we can kind of see the expected performance behavior for this toy model. So the expected performance behavior is as follows. If we have very little training data, then we are kind of in a regime where, where nothing good happens, right? So we expect, um, we expect like a relatively high error. Uh, after this, there's this power law region, and in the power law region, the error behaves roughly as n to the power of minus alpha, where alpha is something around one. But then at some point, the, um, the error that corresponds to learning the signal model becomes so small relative to the irreducible error that we reach this irreducible error region. And the irreducible error region would be the error that the optimal estimator achieves for our toy model, right? So this uh, holds precisely for our toy model, but that's really the behavior that we expect in general, right? So we really expect that there's going to be some power law region. In this power law region, increasing the amount of data should help. But then at some point, we come to some irreducible error region. And in this region, increasing the amount of training data should not help to improve our models. So then the question is, well, for image reconstruction methods, in which region do we lie on? It's really an empirical question. It's no, or at least I don't see a way to answer that theoretically. So we looked at this empirically. So we first look at the UNET, it's like a famous um, convolutional neural network, and it gives almost state-of-the-art performance for a number of imaging problems. So what you see here is the following. So like, let's just look at this point first. So this point means the model is trained on roughly 500 images, and so what we did is we trained like a number of models and we increased the size of those models. So what you see is, like for this particular size, look, let's say uh, 500, there is one curve. Uh, so, so here we train a model of a particular size on, um, on data set of size 500. You make the model larger, train it also on 500, make it even larger, and so on. So you see for every point, there's an optimal model size, right? So 
as you increase the data, you also have to increase the model size to get optimal performance. And so this plot shows the performance of like the, let's say, optimal model size or empirically optimal model size, right? <laughs> and so what we see here is, as we make the training set size larger, the, this power law behavior already slows at very, you know, very small number of training set sizes. So for example, if we have 10,000 images, then the, the scaling behavior that we get at that point is already so, you know, so little that even if we were to train on like a million examples, the performance improvement would be, or the expected performance improvement, I mean, we don't know for sure, would be extremely small, right? Okay, so this holds for unit-based denoising. So let's look at another problem. So for example, let's look at, um, or uh, sorry, let's, let's actually look at a trans transformer model next. So as uh, Rene, for example, mentioned, what we have seen in, in other problem is that transform, like, you know, if we scale the data and if we scale the, the models, then transformers perform actually particularly well. So for example, if we take a CNN, we just make a larger train it on, on more data for prediction tasks, we also sometimes hit like an error floor. But what we have seen is when we scale transformers, they typically show like a better improvement as we increase size and training set size. So then the question is, well, like for image reconstruction, the same could be true. But now as you see here, the transformer-based model has you know, exactly the same behavior as the unit-based model as a function of the image set size. It just performs better overall. It's just like a better model. But the expected performance improvement for, in this case, like the best transformer-based model um, is, is also not uh, higher you know, than what we see with the CNN. And this model here, that is trained on uh, 10 to the power of five examples, that model really gives state-of-the-art performance for like a number of data sets in denoising. So this is really like the best you can achieve so far. And uh, this shows that if you go from the current state-of-the-art, if you improve, right, if you increase the data set size, you do increase the performance, but it's just by such a tiny bit that you, you just can't see it, right? <laughs> okay, so the conclusion from this uh, experiment or from the study is that we see only very marginal in distribution performance gains um, or we expect only very marginal in uh, distribution performance gains as we scale the amount of data. What we also have seen kind of you know from the development in the past two years is that there are also very marginal in distribution gains from model improvements on things like fast MRI. So, uh, two, three years ago, people came up with these unrolled neural networks, right? And they perform extremely well. So now there are some things that have been improved. For example, as Marty talked about, if you uh, incorporate transformers in such unrolled networks, you do get a t uh, like a small performance improvement, right? But it's just, if you look at the fast MI data set in the past few years, what has been achieved by playing around with different models has been just like a very minimal improvement, right? <laughs> So from this, I would you know, uh, conclude that we have very marginal in-distribution gains by scaling data, very marginal gains from model improvements, right? But then the question is, well, like, is this like the best we can do? So now, um, this statement really pertains to what, what I would call, like, or what everyone calls, like, in-distribution performance. So in-distribution performance means we consider the following setup. We have a data source, so for example, we have MRI scanners from or MRI scans from a particular hospital, from a particular scanner, and so on, right? And then we take uh, this data source and we generate a training set and a test set from this data source. But the important point is it's really the same data source, right? And then we train a model on the training set and test on the test set. So that's how all these models are um, evaluated. Now this does not really reflect performance in practice. And what I mean with that is, in practice, you have a number of uh, robustness concerns. So there are kind of three robustness, uh, robustness concerns that come to mind. So the first one is adversarial robustness. We, we already talked about this yesterday in the tutorial, right? 
um, adversarial robustness in image reconstruction means if we have a network and we, um, you know, we reconstruct based on an uncorrupted measurement, we get like a nice image. If we perturb that measurement, then we get suddenly like a measurement, you know, like a reconstruction that doesn't look as nice. So now in image reconstruction, you don't really have an adversary in your MI scanner, right? So the concern is not that you have like an, an adversary messing with your data, but the concern is that you have, for example, a patient moving or that you have, you know, like a, a coil failing in MRI. So there, there are kind of worst case perturbations in MRI and imaging modalities. So we looked uh, uh, into these adversarial perturbations um, like ourselves and we looked at the lit literature and I think what one can conclude is that they, they are not as much of a problem in uh, image reconstruction as they are in classification. In the sense that like every method is somewhat sensitive to adversarial perturbation and neural networks are not particularly sensitive relative to things like L1 minimization. Uh, then there's a second concern, and that is related to reconstructing fine details. So here's an example that illustrates this, which is from the FASTMI competition. So what you see here is, you see the reconstruction of an image from, um, you know, from a knee. And what you see here is a pathology. This pathology is only a few pixels large. So in the competition, there was not a single network that could reconstruct this pathology. And here it looks like there is no pathology. And so the concern is that neural networks cannot reconstruct such fine details. So now if you look into this in detail, then it turns out that no method gets this, recon gets this pathology right, because of course if your pathology is so small and you're undersampling too much, then you just don't have this information about the pathology in your data. Now if you compare different methods, you actually realize that your best bet at reconstructing this pathology is actually the neural network. So if you look at a lot of pathologies and look how well are they reconstructed, then, um, then we found that the neural networks that give overall best performance also do best in reconstructing fine details. So it is a concern, but it's just, you know, if you undersample too much, uh, of course you can't reconstruct these fine details, right? So it's just like a general concern. <clears throat> and then there's this concern of distribution shifts. So Let's say you train a network on knees and then you apply it to brains, then you get like really poor performance. So turns out, you know, you know whether you train it on brains or on knees, so that's not, you know, a good example of a distribution shift, but there are other distribution shifts in practice that uh, occur. And based on what we found, the distribution shifts, that's really the issue in image reconstruction. So, training on, on a certain distribution and applying it to another distribution, that's really where we lose a lot of performance. So that's what I want to talk about for the rest of this talk. And the story is going to be that what we saw now is that there's very marginal in-distribution gains that are expected from scaling data. There are marginal in-distribution gains from model improvements, right? But it turns out that actually increasing the training set size by including more diverse data and by developing better algorithms, we can actually improve the performance in practice significantly. And what I mean with improving performance in practice is really making models that are distributionally robust, that are robust under distribution shifts. And it turns out this is very feasible in image, for image reconstruction problems. All right, but let's first start with an experiment to see what the issue is when we have a distribution shift. So let's look at a data set shift. So that's actually really a realistic um, distribution shift. So here the setup is as follows. We have the fast MRI data. It comes from a university, NYU. You know, it's collected with a particular kind of scanners and so on. And here we have a data set from Stanford. It also consists of knees, right? But there are some differences. It's collected with a scanner that has slightly different settings. The, you know, has a slightly weaker magnet, things like that. So there are small differences, um, but they turn out to, to, to matter. So now what we're going to do is we train methods on the training set, and then we evaluate them on the fast MI test set, so that would be in-distribution evaluation, and we also evaluate them on the Stanford test set, that would be out-of-distribution evaluation. And we're going to look at different reconstruction methods to, to illustrate a point. So 
we're going to look at classical reconstruction. So now if you, if you go to a hospital today, if it's not like the most modern one, most likely uh, a one minimization is going to be used for reconstructing, right? So a one minimization is technically a method that is not trained based on data, right? But if you look closer, it is actually tuned based on data because you have one regularization parameter and that regularization parameter is chosen based on data. So it's also data dependent, right? That's the point I want to make. And so yesterday we also talked about neural networks that are untrained. So the deep image buyer, for example, um, they are also not trained based on data, but they also do have hyperparameters. In this case, let's say five hyperparameters, just to be concrete. And those hyperparameters are also chosen based on data. Now, if we look at an end to end neural network, like a UNet, a variational network, or like a Hamus net, then it's, you know, it has like, let's say, 50 million parameters, 50 million parameters in our case, because that's what fits in, in our GPUs, right? Um, and what I want to look at now is, well, how do these different methods, like what would we expect, how, how, how do they perform relatively to each other on the fast MI data and on the Stanford data? So what you're going to look at is as follows. So let, let's just think this through. Like let's say we have a one minimization. So a one minimization doesn't perform as well as neural networks, right? Um, that, that's what we know based on the challenges. So on the fast MI data, maybe it's going to get performance like let's say 0 0.7, something like that. But it's all, it only has one hyperparameter, right? So we only have one hyperparameter that is you know tuned based on the data. So we expect it to not be so sensitive to a distribution shift. So maybe we would expect that we get a very similar performance on in-distribution data and on out-of-distribution data. And if we get a very similar performance on in-distribution data and out-of-distribution data, we would expect a one minimization to lie on this line, right? So now if we think about these untrained neural networks, they perform a little bit better, so we would expect them to, to lie higher on this line. So the neural networks now that have 50 million parameters we, they perform really well on in-distribution data, but at least I expected them to be more sensitive to distribution shift, which means that they would lie somewhere here maybe, right? Meaning that they perform really well on in-distribution data, but not so well on out-of-distribution data. So I was expecting something like this to happen um, in terms of performance comparison, just roughly. Another thing that could actually happen is that all methods perform a little bit worse because it could also be that the knees, the Stanford knees, are just harder to reconstruct than the New York University knees. So for example, if you have an MRI scanner that has like a bigger magnet, right, you have a higher signal to noise ratio and therefore you would expect better performance on such a data set, right? So it could also be that all the methods shift, but then we would have expected that the variational network and the unit, they shift more just because they have more parameters, right? So it should be more sensitive to a distribution shift. So now what actually happens is the following. So what we see here is um, just different methods. So L1 minimization, there are different ways how you can do L1 minimization. You can do total variation minimization, you know, you can do wavelet, uh, you can use wavelets as a regularizer and so on. Uh, same for units, there are different choices of units, there are different choices of untrained networks, and there are different choices of variational networks. So now what we see here is that all the methods perform significantly worse under the distribution shift, but the ranking of the algorithms is actually preserved, right? Meaning that the network that performs best on in-distribution data, in this case, the variational network also performs best on out-of-distribution data. And this holds true really broadly. So here we looked at a data set shift. Of course, there are other kind of distribution shifts. For example, there's an adversarially filtered shift. Same story. Then there is an anatomy shift, meaning that we train on brains and reconstruct based on knees. We see something very similar, right? So maybe you have seen these sort of plots before because there is a very nice line of work by, by Ludwig Schmidt and collaborators, and they found these very similar risk relationships for prediction problems. So prediction problems uh, are things like, you know, um, classification, regression, and so on, right? 
And what you see here, and, and that's uh, again uh, uh, from a paper from, from Ludwig Schmidt and his collaborators, what you see here is each point corresponds to a particular model, right? And then um, here you see, for example, the performance of, like, so the model is trained on ImageNet. So here you have ImageNet performance, and here you have uh, ImageNet v2 performance. So this would be in distribution, out of distribution evaluation, right? So we see these sort of um, linear risk relationships for prediction problems. So one thing that we were really curious about was, well, like if we see these sort of linear risk relationships in prediction problems and in um, reconstruction problems, then maybe it's something universal that could be potentially interesting to study. So now if we look at the theory for performance under distribution shifts, then here's the kind of theory that you find in a textbook or in, in classical papers. So let's say you have a distribution P and a distribution Q, then there are a number of theoretical results, so here's an example, that relate the performance on the two distributions for one model by bounding the difference in performance as some function of the distance between the distributions, right? So for example, if those distributions are really close together, then you would expect your function to, you know, lie some, the relationship between those two risk bounds to be somewhat in this band here, right? But what we would like to do is to have theory that relates the in-distribution performance and the out-of-distribution performance more precisely as a function, you know, like a, a, as a curve like this, essentially. So what, what is kind of desired is to understand for what sort of setups, so meaning distribution shifts and estimators, do we have a relationship like this that the out-of-distribution risk is a monotone function of the in-distribution risk, right? Because if such a relationship exists, it, like it has a number of important, um, you know, um, a, a num number of important implications. For example, if such a relationship exists, then you know that your method, if it's going to perform better on in-distribution data, is also going to perform better on out-of-distribution data. So this really does not hold universally, so there are a lot of examples where it actually doesn't hold. So here's one exa example where it actually holds. So let's say we have a covariate shift. A covariate shift is the following. Let's say data comes from a Gaussian distribution with some covariance matrix P, and then the data is somewhat labeled through some labeling function. It doesn't matter so much which labeling function. So this could be a classification problem, or this could be a regression problem, right? So for different labeling functions, we get either a classification problem or a prediction problem and different kinds of uh, problems. So if we have such a covariate shift and we look at regularized empirical risk minimization based on data from distribution P. So here the setup is uh, these examples, uh, Xi and Yi, they are drawn from distribution P. And then we, you know, we solve this regularized um, empirical risk minimization problem, and depending on how much training data we choose, and depending on how we regularize, we get different estimators. So this is really like a, a set of estimators. For different n, for different uh, lambda, we get different estimators. And it turns out, in the in a high dimensional setup, you can show that those, the risks observed under those, um, you, you know, like as a function of lambda and n, they obey such a monotonic risk relationship. And the particular function, so the, you know, the, how the monotonic function looks like, that depends on the particular distribution shift, so it depends on these matrices, and it depends on the labeling functions, and it depends on the loss that you are choosing. But the point is, for such a setup, you really have such a monotonic uh, risk relationship. Okay, so now, Another takeaway from this experiment on MRI was that the performance, no matter for which method, for a one minimization and so on, for the neural networks, it drops significantly, right? And significantly means not just by, you know, a tiny amount, something that you can't see. If you look at the images, it just performs significantly worse than a distribution shift. So it's like a really important problem in, in, in practice. So then what we would like to do is, we would like to improve the performance 
of those methods. And improving the performance of those methods really means moving them upwards here. I'm saying moving them upwards because we kind of know how to move them sidewards, right? Because that's what we have really been working on for years, right? Making them better and better. We can um, kind of, you know, walk on this line. But what we want to do is we want to improve the out-of-distribution performance. So now let's go back to, to Ludwig's paper. So it turns out that for classification, this is extremely hard. So for classification problems, natural distribution shifts are somewhat an open research problem. And I think this plot illustrates it really well. Because what you see in this plot is there are different kind of points. And if you look at the brown points, the brown points are models that are trained based on some robustness intervention. So essentially, there's a person writing a paper saying, you know, here's a robustness intervention, performs really well on some, some toy setup, maybe a covariate shift. But now if we apply this to real-world data, it, it doesn't really work, right? So that's the takeaway. The only thing that seems to work here is that um, if we train on more data. So there are some of these, so the green ones, those are all models that are trained on more data. What you can see here, there are some cases where if we train on more data, we get better performance. And training on more data in this case uh, means not just more of the same, it means somewhat more diverse data. Well, you know, it's difficult to measure, but that's, that's effectively what it is. So now if we look at this plot from classification and in just on the vast amount of literature that, or vast amount of things that people have attempted, it's kind of, you would think, oh, this is a really hard problem, there's not much hope. But it turns out that for image reconstruction problems, this, you know, adapting to distribution shifts problem is much easier than for classification. So there's, you know, there's a relatively simple solution. And I want to illustrate why it's a much simpler problem for image reconstruction problems, just to drive home this point. <clears throat> so let's say we want to improve the performance for a one minimization. So we don't really want to improve the performance for a one minimization, because even if we improve the performance for a one minimization, neural networks are still better, right? So we wouldn't, we wouldn't care, but just to make the point that the problem is really well posed. So for a one minimization, we really have only one parameter to choose. So if we choose this parameter right, we get much better performance. So how can we choose this parameter? Well, we can just take our data and split it into data that we actually train on and into a validation set. And then we can solve our L1 regularized um, you know, minimization problem. And we, get, uh, and we can do this for different lambda parameters. And then we can just choose the best lambda parameter. And by doing this, we perfectly, or pretty much perfectly adapt to the distribution. So this works really well because for a one minimization, we only have one parameter to choose, right? And we have quite a bit of data if we have, um, if, if we have like unassembled data from a whole image. So the same thing obviously won't work for a neural network because for a neural network, we have 50 million parameters. So then we would uh, somewhat overfit to the data, right? Because we can just fit it perfectly. But it, um, yeah, so, so, you know, for a one minimization, we can essentially take those points, move them up here. But, but then we are still not going to be better than the neural network. So what we actually want to do is we want to move the neural networks up there. So what we can do for the neural networks is conceptually something very simpler, uh, very similar. And it's called a test time training. So the idea is to introduce like a self-supervised loss and so here's, so this is a training stage. So the training stage we train with respect to the supervised loss and with respect to a self-supervised loss. And the self-supervised loss only depends on our measurement. So it doesn't depend on, on the ground truth data. So we train our model, but then at inference, we are not just using our model, we are performing first uh, test time training. And test time training means we are updating the parameters of the model by minimizing the self-supervised loss. So if we do that too much, we're going to overfit. But if we just do it a little bit, we are hitting a point that performs really well under distribution shifts. And then we reconstruct just by performing a forward pass through our model. Um, so let's see how this works. So let's look at the anatomy shift. So anatomy shift is as follows. If we train on distribution P, that means if we train on the brains, 
and then we test on the knees, that's the performance we get. So if we actually were to train on the knees and test on the knees, we get significantly better performance, right? So that's the performance that the model can give us if we train on the right data. And this gap, that is the performance gap. So that's by how much we, we can potentially improve for this particular model, right? It's model dependent also. So now if we do the following, if we train on Q and test on Q and do test time training, then we perform like a tiny bit better than this one here. The reason why we perform a tiny bit better is also really intuitive because what we do here is we are doing test time training for every single example. So we are adapting really well to every single example. So that's why um, we're performing even a little bit better, but really just a tiny bit better than if we train on that data, right? Because here we are using the same parameters for each example and here we adapt to each example so we get slightly better uh, performance. And here's what we get if we train on the distribution P, uh, P and test on Q and do test time training, then we you know, perform a little bit worse than that. And so this is what we call the uh, performance gap uh, after the test time training. There's still a performance gap, right? Um, but it's just like very minimal after this test time training. And this approach of test time training um, works really well. So if we look at different, you know, distribution shifts, then, I mean, it depends on the distribution shift, right? It doesn't perform universally well. But for example, if we have a dis an, an anatomy shift, so for example, we train on knee, a test on brain, then it closes this gap by 99%. If we have a data set shift from FASTMI to Stanford, closes it by 87%. And if we have a modality shift, um, then by 96%. And, you know, a saturation shift, um, 97%. So it performs really well for, for these common distribution shifts that we encounter in, in MRI. All right, so the conclusions are as follows. So there are marginal in-distribution gains from scaling beyond a few thousand examples. Um, but there are significant gains that can be expected in practice from building distributionally robust models. So there are really two ways how you can build distributionally robust models. So either you can adapt at test time. Um, that's expensive, right? Because you always have to update your model parameters. What the best option actually is to, is to train on more diverse data. So if you, if you are able to collect a data set that is very diverse, um, then this also gives your model that is relatively distributionally robust, right? <coughs> Um, and, and I also want to argue that uh, algorithms and better deep learning models have a huge potential to further improve performance for practical imaging problems, right? We saw at the beginning that if we just look at something very narrow, like for example, um, a serrated MRI, there's very little room for improvement. But if we go a little bit beyond that, then there's a lot of room for improvement. So one example is, let's look at cardiac MRI. So this is my heart, for example. You see, it's a really poor reconstruction of my heart in a way, right? Because it's moving while we're reconstructing. But this is actually based on several gigabytes of data. So there's a lot of room to improve the performance for these kind of real-world uh, imaging problems. All right, so here are the references. Um, those are the four papers uh, I talked about. And yeah, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. have time for questions. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. So my question is regarding the test time training. So you mentioned that uh, when once we apply the test time training during inference, the distribution gain, the gap between the gains is decreased. So uh, and it is used using a self-supervised uh, objective, right? So uh, during this self-supervised training, so my question is, what part of the model is being trained or updated? Is it the full model or some particular portion of it? Thank you. That's a good question. So in our case the whole model is updated, actually. There are variants of this idea where only part of the model is updated. 
So for example, in classification, there are um, versions of this approach where only part of the model is updated. And, or for example, you could take a UNet and you could only update the encoder or the decoder, things like that. So we played around with this a little bit. In our case, it performs best if we update the whole model, actually. Yeah. But for example, there's like a, a paper, I think it's called um, Gain Tuning, where they have a model for denoising, and they want to adapt to different signal-to-noise ratios, and then they update the parameters of batch normalization. Then you just have much fewer parameters. This, this also works well. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so there's the self-consistency loss that was added, that stems from the observation that the reason we, uh, the models earlier failed to distributional shift is because uh, when, you re when you do the measurement uh, of the reconstructed images, they were not close to the actual observed measurement. Um, that, that, that's a good question. So in a way, um, so when you, when you have an, you know, you, you you have certain frequencies, right? And then you, um, you that, that's your measurement. You pass that through your network. Then you're not actually reconstructing those frequencies perfectly, right? So, and if you have a distribution shift, typically you reconstruct them even worse than usually, and and that's um, kind of where we started off in a way. So it seems like there were two kinds of distributional shifts that you showed. One was when the types of scanner had different configuration of the same knee MRI, and the other was like knee MRIs versus brain MRIs. So how does the self-consistency loss addition help with the brain distribution shift? It's, uh, it's hard to say why it works. So we didn't, um, like so we found examples of distribution shifts and test time training where you perfectly adapt to your model, right? Um, but we, you know, like this kind of toy models, they like don't correspond to what we observe, right? Because in our case, like it, it's also really hard to model, right? Because what distinguishes knees from brains, in a way, uh, yeah. I, I mean, like brains, brains are just more smooth, right? And they like sometimes more dark and so on, depending on the contrast, right? Um, it, it's really hard to say why it works, to be honest. I, Again, I mean, probably works on some toy models, but the toy models don't really model these distribution shifts. So I'm not sure what to uh, take from this. I mean, in a way, it's also we really tried a lot of ways to adapt to these distribution shifts, and this just worked really well, right? There are two things that probably play a role. One is that um, the loss is still a good one, right? Because you want to do well on the fre you want to do at least well on the frequencies that you know. So, so it gives you some. Uh, some signal on where to go. The second thing that probably plays a big role is that if you actually have a neural network, like a CNN, it's a really good image prior, right? So even if it's completely untrained and you're doing this, if you're not doing this too much, you get really good performance, right? So even if you don't train your model at all. So probably those two things play together. Yeah. Um, also, uh, sorry for the last question. Do you have any idea on why this is much harder to do in uh, classification tasks? Yeah, the intuition is really like, I think the L1 minimization illustrates it nicely, right? Because for L1 minimization, you really have an example where it's really trivial how to adapt to a distribution shift. And the reason why it's trivial is because you really, like, let's say for classification, right? You have an image and you have a label, but you have no information about the label whatsoever, right? Under distribution shift. Um, but in, in image reconstruction problems, you are like you are, in a way you can split your data so that you have something that resembles labels, right? So you, you can actually also see how well you're doing, right? So you, for example, what you can do is you can take a MRI image, undersampled, and then you can reconstruct, and you just have a small holdout set, and then you can predict very well how well you're actually doing. For classification, there's no way of doing that, right? You cannot have an, like an image, and then there's no way how you can estimate how well you're actually predicting a class, right? There's just no information about that. Whereas for image reconstruction problems, you do have such information. That's the intuition why it's just you know, much easier. Like it's also a huge problem, distribution shifts, but just much, you know, much more well-posed in a way. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. For I was thinking about a few works that we have kind of related to this, which is uh, we tend to think of supervised methods as being population adaptive, so they are adapted to a certain population of data. And then we have these patient adaptive methods like deep image prior or dictionary learning methods that can adapt to every single image that you are trying to reconstruct. And so we have works where we try to integrate population adaptive and patient adaptive uh, models into unrolled networks. So mm -hmm. it seems like that, this seems related that you're doing test time training and then if you have these, if you have the models where part of the network is trained to the data that you're imaging and part is sort of already pre-trained population adaptive that would address uh, similar, issues. similar issues. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, good point, yeah. Any further questions? Yes. Oh, I have a question. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi. I have a question about the test time training for this one pr parameter family of L1 minimization. Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, how does it compare with not using the training data at all? Right? So for every image, you can split it and then just tune this regularization parameter with a cross-validation. So, mm -hmm. so that should already give you something. So how, how does the um, test time training really works here. Um, do you use SGD? Do you initialize with uh, um, already trained data on distribution P or, or other special tricks that you do? Like, so more generally, the question is about like, is it really working better than, than no training at all, basically tuning this parameter with one image? For L1 minimization works, like if you adapt to out of distribution data, it looks actually very similar to what we saw in terms of gap before. So like, for L1, like, so for example here, um, so in this case, so this is everything is specific for, for neural network, right? So now if you take L1 minimization, everything just shifts down essentially, right? Instead of 0 0.85, you're gonna have 0 point, I don't know, 0.75 or something, right? But other than that, it's exactly the same. So, yeah, so you, you also have like, so for example, for P and Q, the regularization parameter for a one minimization is like quite different actually, right? So you get like a big jump from getting that right. And then you get a tiny jump from for every single image getting the regularization parameter right, right? Because if you optimize that for every single image, you're also getting like a tiny performance improvement. So it looks, for a one minimization looks exact, like exactly the same, just shifted, yeah. Yeah, but, but again, like, you know, just want to emphasize for, I don't think this test time training is kind of the last answer because it's really expensive, right? Because what we really gained, like one thing that we gained by using deep networks for these image reconstruction problems relative to something like a one minimization is that it's so much faster. And this really matters if you have, you know, for example, the whole volume that you want to reconstruct. Now, if you do test time training, you're as slow as the optimization-based approaches again, right? So what you would really like to do is um, ideally train on something that is like on a data set that is very diverse and kind of avoid the test time training. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. My question is, uh, so w during inference, when you are given an out of distribution measurement, uh, you apply the self-supervised uh, loss to that by using the same A matrix that you use during training but it's possible that the measurements that you're doing inference on is generated by a slightly different forward model. So uh, I was wondering, like, could you give a comment of whether that would impact the performance of test time training? Um, so one example of, it also works, right? So for example, like all those methods actually use the forward model. So for example, if you have a unit, you're not, um, that your input is your first, rec like you're first doing these squares by using your forward model and then you get a very coarse reconstruction, then you map your coarse reconstruction, right? So all those neural network based methods actually use the forward model, right? But now if you have like say four times unassembled data, you really wanna like your, the artifacts that you have that your network is trained to remove are just different or slightly different than if you have 
two times unassembled data, right? Um, and that part you can kind of adapt to using the test time training. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, Thank you. but it's kind of a different story. Like, let's say your forward model, it could, it could also be that you get your forward model wrong, right? <laughs> then you lose even more. Because here we are assuming we, we, we get the forward model right. No. And you do get your forward model wrong in practical applications, actually. So, for example, like what's very common is that a patient moves. Like, even, even if you have a brain, right, and, and you're just being there and you think you're not moving, even through your, um, just your blood flow, the bra uh, your, your brain goes up and down, actually, right? Like, or if you swallow, it moves significantly, right? So you always have movement, and then your forward model is actually not slightly wrong, right? That also have, has a big impact on performance. That's why I think like things like um, you know developing deep learning methods that work really well for moving objects is is not exactly clear how to do that, but it's, it would be extremely impactful. But but that's another real world application where you know where you can really expect significant gains. Yeah. Okay. So if there are. No further questions. Let's thank Reinhardt for his wonderful talk. And our next speaker is Bihan Wen from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And his talk is going to be on beyond classic image priors, deep reinforcement learning and disentangling for image restoration. Over to Bihan. OK. Hello. Can you hear me? Is the voice clear? OK, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So first, I'm uh, really happy to be here to share uh, some of our recent work. Uh, and today, I'm going to specifically share some of the work we did for uh, you know, those methods, which is slightly different than the classic image prior for image re restoration. And specifically, we're using deep reinforcement learning and uh, you know, uh, joint modeling and disentangling for image restoration. Right. Oops. Doesn't work. Okay, good. All right. So I mean, uh, we have already got, got three afternoon uh, talking about image restoration. So I'm really working in a similar field where we really want to kind of have a good method and model to recovering the image from different sensing modalities, like people talking about MRI, people talking about CT and image restoration. So basically, you know, we are trying to sense the real world, like analog signal, to get some digital measurements, and again, we want to reconstruct the analog images with the high quality. And the question is, how can we come up with an effective method to do that? And this is really the fundamental question like we are all working on. And uh, well, and in fact, most of the, I mean, many of the image restoration problems is in fact a linear inverse problem. And for those of you who are familiar with that, and they can be actually generalized using the, you know, a very simple linear equation, like y equal to ax plus e, where your y is your uh, whatever measurements you have in different domains, and you want to recover the x as, as, as bad as, as, as good as possible. So this includes many inverse problems. I mean, the most fundamental one probably is the image denoising. You want to, you know, recover your or underlying images from your noisy measurements, right? And also, you know, many of you are now using smartphone, and probably there's a module called super resolution in there, which will try to recover the high resolutional images from low resolution measurements. And this is also another example of inverse problem. And you know, just now many speakers mentioned about MRI, right? MRI is also a very perfect example for solving a EOPOS inverse problem where the sorry where the measurement is no longer in the image domain, but in the case space. If you do under sampling, you are having a under sample case space measurement and you want to still recover maybe, maybe the images of your, of your brain and or maybe other parts of the images. And then the question is like, what is the, uh, you know, the, the, the key ingredient or factors to come up with a good solver for, you know, for all of these in inverse problems? In fact, um, many of the problems were actually solving this uh, fundamental MAP problems where you want to minimize the fidelity term together with the regularizer that you develop for your images. Right? So here the Y stands for the measurements, A is your sensing matrix, X is the signals you try to recover. Right? And in fact, what we are working on is really the second term, right? the regularizer. 
and we are trying to work on different um, data models, priors to construct such kind of regularizer. Uh, maybe some of them are based on you know the well-known image priors. Some of them are data-driven. We're using learning to come up with a data-adaptive uh, kind of models. Some of them are based on the specific structure of the signals. Right. So I mean, fundamentally, this what the role of this data model is to differentiate or to trying to figure out what is the images right you want to recover from something else. Right. If it's denoising, you are trying to differentiate images from noise. If it's like MRI, you are trying to differentiate images from different you know, aliasings, artifacts. And this is really the fundamental role of data model. Right? And, you know, and then if you, if you take image denoising as an example, right, where, what we are normally doing is really um, in the following form, where you're trying to kind of uh, analyze or project your noisy images into some latent space, which we call that encoding, and you impose certain structures in this latent space. And then, after imposing these structures, you're trying to recover the images. And hopefully, this recovery will be better, will be more like the underlying clean image. And what kind of structure you, you want to impose in this latent space, right? There are really many uh, models, methods people have developed. Maybe the, the most popular example is the sparsity, where in this case, Z well stands for the sparse codes in either the dictionary domains or transform domains. And you know, people have worked on this for many years. Like you can trace back to the signal processing approaches where people use DCT, we use wavelets to come up with the sparse representation for image compressions, for different applications. Um, and you know, recent, uh, I mean, more recently, people are working on dictionary learnings, you know, synthesis dictionary, analysis dictionary, which people are trying to learn a better representation or models for uh, certain images or certain data such that the sparsity becomes even better, right? And actually, I myself and the Sai and our you know, PhD advisor, Yuan Bressler, we work on you know, not learning dictionary, but learning transform, which is another way around, which we can not using the predefined transform, but we learn one from a and hopefully this one gives us a sparsity and eventually better denoising results. Right? So, so I mean, not only sparsity, like I think yesterday, you know, many speakers like Prof uh, Yimai and other uh, Ching talk about like no matter whether, th whether this is sparsity or low rank, this is nothing but a low dimensional representation of the data, right? That's what we want. So also there are many people working on not pr really projection onto a union of subspace. They're just finding a subspace for uh, you know, low dimensional representation. Also we can use this for denoising as well on top of sparsity. And you know, by, by having this you know, a success of dictionary learning, you know, analysis dictionary, synthesis dictionary, it shows that well, uh, it is kind of true that using data-driven approach, like learning-based method, can give you a more effective, you know, data representation or, or model comparing to those analytical models, such as like, you know, we use TV, we use sparsity with mixed transforms, and they turns out to be more effective, right? So following this line, uh, you know, now, now the trend is more like say, hey, we don't want to use maybe a simple transform or dictionary. We go for even deeper structures. We come up with a deep neural network, and that is the one we use as the encoder here, and such that now your latent space representation becomes a deep feature embedding, right? You kind of make your embedding or encoding process more flexible. You allow like much richer structures instead of just a single layer transform, right? And we see some of the successful works and some of and also mentioned by the previous speaker, like you know, those one used for denoising, super resolution, and they show much better results or effective results for lots of applications. Right. Okay, so no matter what kind of model we are using, right? What we are doing actually, we are trying to say uh, restore the noise images to the clean image estimation using all sorts of structures like sparsity, low rank, or even deep prior based low dimensional. Right. So all of this, I mean, most of the works we have seen so far are focusing on how to model the images in the effective way, in the accurate way. But actually the question like we are, you know, thinking recently or we're trying to argue is that, well, we kind of overlook the other part, right? So besides the image we're trying to recover, there's also one part we removed, which is the noise, the corruption. So what about the model for that noise we, we remove, right? Is there any kind of constraint or penalty or regularizer to say something about the part that we remove that we kind of don't want eventually? Because that part also have some structures or have some distributions, right? We should say something about that, right? So this is actually uh, some of the kind of the questions we, we're, we're, we're kind of investigating. And I can show you some example, right? So for example, this uh, actually DNC is well, it may not be the state of the art, but it's one of the popular deep denoising network people use for uh, restore noisy images, and they can actually recover 
uh, images from, sorry, they can recover images from like noisy measurement and get a pretty good reconstruction results, right? But if we look at the still the residual, definitely it's not perfect. There's still some, how to say, modeling errors or residuals after reconstruction. But if we look at the noise map or the residual amplitude, uh, we still see some structures. I mean, you can clearly identify the correlation of this residual and images, right? This is not a good sign because those correlated structure may correspond to the true images that you accident, accidentally removed. And those are the sources give you the oversmoothing or artifact. And we really don't want this. And our kind of argument is that, well, it's because we didn't impose any loss on this part such that they accidentally removed the true images, which is something you want to kind of avoid eventually. So that one gives our, uh, like, a, a pose of question to us, like, well, we, were, we would like to argue, well, sometimes, even though they, we have so many good deep image prior data structures, it may not be good enough to only set constraints or penalties on X, right? So how about we should add some noise modeling as well in the loss or objective function explicitly on top of the image regularizer? Or maybe uh, if it's not the noising problem, it's other image restoration problem, can we uh, jointly modeling the corruption model as well? S suppose that the model itself is not accurate. I think just now, uh, you know, uh, Prof. Reinhardt, they also mentioned about like, you know, distribution shift and also a forward model uh, inaccuracy in the in practice. So this one kind of tri uh, triggers some problems for uh, jointly refining the forward model together with the image restoration. So this is the first kind of, uh, how to say, question or problem we are trying to investigate. I'm going to share some of the results we have. Another kind of problem we are thinking is that, well, instead of solving the whole restoration problem in one step, right, sometimes this is hard, especially if you have highly u post problem, solving directly as a one-to-one -one mapping may not be like robust or accurate enough. So instead, how about we solve this problem in a, in a progressive way, right? Don't have to be one step. We can do this in multiple steps, such that we, we would like to argue that, well, Deep reinforcement learning is a good tool for like, some, some of the challenging image, image restoration problems. So later, later we're going to share some examples to demonstrate that uh, there's some promise on this direction as well. Okay, so let's look at the first question, right? We would like to uh, share something about, say, joint image and noise or, or degradation model modeling. Okay, so I, I used the same example just now, right? Just now we're saying that, well, uh, even though we have a really good model, image model, say, deep, uh, learn deep priors or other models, um, most of them are just for images, right? Sparsity is low rank as well. Um, and I think yesterday, uh, you know, I attended, you know, Prof. Must talk, you also, he also mentioned that, well, in fact, there's no exact model for images, or there's no perfect model for images. All of these things, like sparsity, low rank, they are approximate models, right? We, it's like some assumptions we make for Right. And because these are not perfect models, there's always modeling error, which will contribute to a reconstruction error or residuals. These are something uh, we call that remaining noise or modeling errors, and we trying to avoid, like we don't want to see this kind of highly cor correlated residual that is to the images, and we try to avoid that. We try to minimize those kind of, uh, you know, structure patterns in the residual map, right? Okay, so what we're, I mean, what we're trying to propose here is instead of having a, like regression type of problem from noisy to clean images, um, we should maybe try to reconstruct it jointly the images and the noise, right? So what we're trying to propose is that, well, instead of like just mapping from noisy Im noise Im to clean image, maybe we should jointly reconstruct, say, noise image as well as noise image to noise, right? So then you have like, a, like two layers or two regularizers jointly apply to this reconstruction process. So, uh, you know, in terms of formulation, uh, you know, conventionally, we're, we're looking at some denoising problems where, where we minimize the loss function, which is completely, uh, you know, built up or designed based on the image prior, right? But instead, if we're talking about joint modeling, right, our objective function should have two parts. Like, one part is mainly for images, the other part is based on our prior knowledge or assumptions on the noise or the corruption themselves. So, jointly, uh, we believe that the learned parameters can perform a better job for like uh, image restoration, okay? So, I mean, uh, there are, I mean, in fact, there are many choices of the so-called encoding process or decoder we are going to have, but, you know, our, our preliminary work, we choose this specific method called neural flow as the encoder. I mean, the reason is that this neural flow uh, method give us some good property as 
so-called invertible linear transformation. The reason is that, well, we want to jointly recover, recover both, so we want to make sure that the whole encoding process is lossless, meaning that you're not just removing things, you want to keep the things you remove as well. So neural, neural flow is kind of the good candidate we choose as the encoding process we use in this preliminary work. And in fact, what we're doing here is in the training stage, we're trying to encode both the noise images and the clean images uh, jointly, and we're trying to set up loss function and the object function for every part of them, like reconstructed loss, sorry, reconstructed noise, reconstructed images, and also uh, we also swap the, uh, you know, the, 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 the noise uh, features between the two branches and trying to come up with some like, adversarial loss between the noise images and clean images, right? So eventually you will have some kind of hybrid loss to uh, model them jointly. And for the noise, I mean, this part will depend on the noise you have. I mean, this is one example. Suppose we know the noise is ID Gaussian, but in fact it may not be ID Gaussian. If it's real noise, probably you are going to change the noise, uh, the loss term for the law, noise, right? Maybe it's just independent, not necessarily ID, right, in this case. But I mean, in the training stage, we have a hybrid loss, but in the testing stage, the denoising step, it will be super easy, right? So what you have to do is once you have this train encoder, you just need to encode the noise image using your encoder, and then you just zip or maybe like randomly replace the noise factors with the small perturbation, right? And after that, you exact, use exactly the inverse flow to reconstruct the images. And interestingly, we find that, well, if you think about the whole pipeline, right? If you replaced here the flow, which is a deep network, let's say we do not learn it. We use the conventional DCT and wavelet as the transform. Right? The whole process is, is, is exactly like the very familiar with like transform-based shrinkage method, right? What you're doing here is you transform the images into your transform domain and, you, and you're trying to recover it, right? But the only difference here is that we are trying, we're replacing the transform with something more complicated, right? But still, the nature is the same. We're trying to find some kind of compact and sparse representation in the latent space for denoising eventually, right? OK, so, um, but then the question is, does it work? Well, we have some preliminary results, right? Uh, this is actually the result I just showed you, like without any modeling of the noise, just by training, a, say, a DNCN for, like, as an image prior. And you, we end, end up with some, you know, really structured noise or residual map. After the noise modeling, I mean, jointly with the previous uh, image modeling, we kind of, well, still you, you, will see some, you will see some structure there, but kind of l more random than the previous noise map. And you can see that, well, the PSR also increased a little bit. Uh, I think approxim approximately 0 .2, 0 0.5 to 1 dB comparing to the, you know, the, the conventional regression-based methods. And more importantly, if you compare the restore images like side by side, you will see that, well, this method, our method by joint modeling, they will preserve more high frequency components, right? You kind of get rid of those over smoothing artifacts, which are pretty common for like say, uh, regression based deep learning methods, right? So visual quality, from the visual quality perspective, we think this is quite effective. Um, and we also do a lot of testing. And this is actually uh, quite similar to the talk given by you know, Ring, uh, Prof. Ringha just now, right? We're, we're thinking about you know, uh, robustness or generalization in practice, right? Because in practice, we cannot guarantee that the, the sigma or the noise level in the training will be always matched with the testing, right? It's, it's possible that you get some images which is even noisier than your training images. So, and we find that this is a common challenge for existing you know, denoising methods because for example, here, if we, if we set the training sigma, the noise level, to be 15, you will see that if the testing sigma somehow deviates from the training sigma, you get the performance drops quite significantly, right? And we want to avoid that. We want to get you know, good denoising results by making the method more robust, right, or more generalizable. And it seems like this joint modeling idea is a good candidate for such kind of a robustness uh, results. And uh, I show another plot. This is also very similar to, you know, uh, of Wenghai just now, he showed, right? So as your uh, testing time distribution or the noise level gradually deviates from your training time, right? You will see that other method, the performance really drops and you will see a larger gap in terms of the denoising uh, results or quality. Whereas having this joint modeling, the phenol one, uh, I mean, of course it still drops, right? Because your noise level increases, but the degradation is actually uh, less severe, right? It's kind of better than doing just image modeling. So we think this is a good approach to 
trying to improve the generalization and the robustness for denoising in practice. Right. And also, we also try something like, say, non-uniform noise, which is another type of you know, robustness. Like you, we're, we're assuming that the noise, is, noise itself is not uniform. Right. So if you train using one sigma, you are talking about handling spatial varying noise in the practice, in, in, in testing time. Right. And we also try like real noise. In this case, you have no idea about the noise distribution at all, and they can be hybrid, they can be non-uniform. And we show that while well, having a joint model will make the whole model more restrictive. And so also you can prevent some kind of overfitting in the training time, right? So this is the uh, first work. And also, by the way, because we are explicitly reconstructing the noise. So we find that this is also a good approach to learn the real noise distribution, right? So in principle, well, by having this joint reconstruction, we can not only reconstruct the images, we can also try to reconstruct the noise. So give us a way to kind of learn what is, the, what is the, like a, the distribution of the real noise, right? If you give me some samples, I can try to have some kind of generative model for noise as well. So in fact, we have a ongoing works on this aspect, but since we don't have good results, I don't show them, but this is perfectly possible, right? Okay, and that, another example is that, well, just now I showed uh, like a super uh, simple example like Gaussian denoising, right? But, you know, just now Prof. Rene also showed this kind of adversarial uh, examples, which to my opinion, this is it's a special version of denoising, right? I mean, uh, you, if, you, if you look at the, the, the adversarial perturbation uh, beta here, it's also an additive components, but the only difference here is beta itself is not random. It's a highly structured one. You train specifically for fooling the classifier, right? But, you know, if we want to remove it, right, this is some kind of a denoising problem, which we, I mean, we call that purification, right? You are trying to reconstruct the uh, normal example from the adversarial example, right? And also, this is, seems, seems like this is also another example of inverse problem. And because it's an inverse problem, we need to have some form of you know, data prior or image prior. And we find that, well, many of the so-called uh, purification methods really similar to image de denoising. They have a CN for regression. But we would like to argue that because this perturbation is so structured, you need a separate model for the perturbation as well. Right. So this one gives um, us the idea, like we use the similar kind of idea to not just recon directly reconstruct the images, but we're trying to disentangle the images from the perturbation. And we set up loss function for the perturbation and the separately. Right. So it's some kind of joint modeling of the images and also the adversarial per perturbation. And by doing so, um, we show that uh, it works pretty well for you know, like just now Prof. Rene mentioned that there are many type of the attacks, so we try some of the popular attacks we know, and it works reasonably well compared to other methods, and also we also try different like a very budget, right? Sometimes the attack is kind of stronger, sometimes it's weaker, and for different kind of budget, uh, the method can always, can, can like most likely try to remove those perturbations from the uh, adversarial samples, right? And this is kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, contributed by having this additional renderizer and, uh, and loss function for the perturbation themselves. Okay. So, uh, oh, I don't know why it's like that. Okay, so just now I, I show like two examples which are more, most likely denoising, right? Even if one is random noise, the other one is structured noise. But this kind of idea can also apply to something more complicated, right? Some other, a uh, little bit more complicated inverse problems. For example, like, uh, uh, we have been investigating this, uh, you know, shadow removal problem, which is something like a photo, maybe under the sunshine, and probably you have, you have some shadows because certain object may block the sun, right? So we want to uh, enhance the visibility of the shadow region by maintaining uh, the kind of the quality of the whole images. So we need some kind of algorithm to try to recover the underlying, uh, you know, high visi visible images from the shadow version. Right. So conventionally, uh, people just treat this, this input as you know, shadow region plus non-shadow regions. Uh, but we are thinking, well, they, they can, the, the model can be more kind of, a, a, how to say, sophisticated than the simple combination. Right? So we trace back to the physics of Retinex model, where they model the measurements as the multiplication of a reflectance and the illumination. Right? And we think that, well, for shadow case, the only difference is that the, the illumination will be inconsistent across shadow and non-shadow region. 
but the underlying reflectance is actually the same, right? They are just the you know, normal natural objects we have in, in, in practice, right? So we use this to kind of have a more, uh, how to say, rigorous formulation of the shadow removal process. And by having, well, both the regularizer for the underlying reflectance, here the reflectance is a little bit like the X we have, like the underlying images, as well as the consistency of the illumination, which is something like your degradation model. By having the you know, joint uh, modeling for both, we show that the whole process can make some of the existing uh, deep learning network more effective and efficient. Right. So we, we, we pick one of the, uh, you know, one of the recent progress in VIT, right, vision transformer, which are demonstrate usefulness for many, you know, low-level vision problems. We try this for shadow removal. But, you know, as, as actually just now the speaker mentioned that the transformer, uh, one of the issues is that their, you know, efficiency is not that good because in terms of the model complexity is really much higher you know, normal CAN, right? But we think that the reason is because they have a, a self-attention mechanism where they're trying to construct the correlation matrix throughout the whole feature matrix is quite expensive and, and you know, takes a lot of time, right? But we argue that for some of the problem, like shadow removal, you don't have to calculate the correlation matrix through the whole image. Uh, instead, here, we, what we really care about is really the consistency between the shadow and non-shadow region, right? That's really the key we want, to, we want to impose in this process. So because of that, we kind of change the very redundant global uh, self-correlation uh, calculation to uh, a specific correlation matrix, which is only between the shadow and non-shadow region. We call that shadow and non-shadow interaction. And turns out that by having this more careful uh, modeling of the degradation process, uh, we can end up with a model that has much fewer parameters than the existing one. Right? You can see that actually the model size may just drop like more than 10 times than the previous state of the art. And provided that we also have better performance, right? Or you know, shadow removal PSR and SSIM can also improve comparing to the existing state of the art, right? So this is kind of owned by have a better understanding and modeling of the degradation model as well, right? So I mean, in terms of the numerical things, we, we, we think we, we achieve a much fewer number of parameters and with more promising results in the shadow removal. And this is also uh, have the idea of having a more effective use of those limited parameters by having a better understanding of the degradation process for a particular task, right? Not a generic model, but a very task-specific deep model in this case. Okay, and you can see some of the results, like uh, existing models usually, they still have some artifacts, even, uh, even after the shadow has been removed, you can still tell the boundary artifacts. Whereas if we purposely in impose the shadow and non-shadow interaction, those boundary artifacts can be alleviated in a much better sense. Okay, so this is actually some of the recent works. And actually after this work, right, uh, actually my student, he also tried a very similar idea with diffusion model. I think just now also many people mentioned about diffusion model, which is also quite popular. And surprisingly, it doesn't work very well. You see, this is actually the diffusion model uh, my student trying to generate. He's trying to uh, train a generative process of shadow free images using the shadow mask given by the data set. And we find that, well, you can always see some kind of, kind of artifacts there. And we, we find that the problem is actually because the mass estimation was wrong at the first place, right? Because this mass estimation is normally by human annotation, by some algorithms, and it's possible that we end up with inaccurate mask for shadow modeling. So that gives us, uh, give us the idea that, well, not only trying to re remove the shadow, we should jointly also try to refine the shadow mask because no one can guarantee that this mask is accurate. Right? You have to uh, assume that there is some inaccuracy in the mass estimation in the first place. Right? So we, we kind of uh, uh, modify the, uh, the, uh, the original idea of you know, training a generative model for the shadow free image alone, but together we're going to combine the degradation prior also into this diffusion model. In this case, we're trying to jointly refine the mask with the shadow removal process. Right? So this one gives us uh, some kind of idea to uh, you know, coming up, uh, come up with an unroll network which is based on the existing understanding of the shadow model, like the retina-based shadow model, together with a joint model, like a DMDM, for not only the images, but also the mask. So, so in the whole generation process, the images will be kind of 
gradually generated from the random noise, and together your mask, which initially is not accurate, will also be gradually refined to achieve a better kind of estimation, which doesn't really prevent you to recover the shadow regions in the end, right? So having this joint modeling, uh, okay, I, I skip those details because in fact we have a rigorous formulation. We're not designing this as some, you know, assembly of networks. Everything is actually is an unrolled network based on the you know, standard MAP problems we have talked about in the first place. Um, but in the end, I want to mention that, well, having this joint estimation of the mask and, uh, and images will give us even better results and just, you know, considering the image restoration process. And this is by, you know, considering the correlation between the mask and the images because these two are not independent. These two are kind of highly correlated in terms of their shape, their, their kind of regions, and you can use each other to refine the other part. In the, in the actual uh, shadow removal process, right? Okay, and I show some examples where uh, you see this is one perfect example that in, pra in practice the shadow is actually here and also the, the bottom right regions, but the estimated mass doesn't really reflect that, and that is the region that is reason like most of the images, uh, the, most of the method they didn't capture the shadows on the right, right? But by jointly estimating the, the mask, this part can also be re removed successfully. By the, by the joint modeling. And another interesting thing is that if we can have a joint refinement method, we probably we don't need a very sophisticated mass estimation, right? We actually try that user can just do some sketch. They just give us some, uh, some idea about where the shadow is, and the whole network will automatically refine it to something much better, right? Get rid of the, maybe the expensive process of mass estimation as well by jointly considering the image prior, right? Okay. All right, so uh, this is, I hope I've, this is my first part. I want to summarize the lesson we learned through all of this practice, right? So uh, we would like to argue that, well, sometimes it is limited uh, for restoration to only rely on image modeling, even though we have lots of good tools for image prior image modeling. Um, and we would like to argue that for image restoration in practice, uh, maybe a better idea is to have a joint image and degradation modeling for reconstruction if you know something about your, degra your, your degradation, your noise, your forward model, and if you have the uh, feeling that your degradation is inaccurate, it's better to have a joint modeling method than just image prior. And we show some of the uh, results showing that uh, having a more accurate joint modeling will eventually lead to a better image reconstruction in practice. Yeah, this is like uh, some of the takeaway message we have for the first part of my talk, okay? And also I want to share some of the uh, work we did uh, which we're trying to argue for hard image restoration problems. Solving them in one step may not be a good idea, right? Sometimes if we solve the whole problem in a progressive way, it may give us some good merits uh, in terms of robustness, in terms of generalization. So let's show work we did. Uh, we, we, can, we start with the same example. Just now we mentioned about shadow removal, right? So we, if we make it more general, this is about, uh, you know, enhance the low light images, right? Shadow removal is just like enhance the lightment of the shadow region. But if you make it more general, it's about give me your low light images, I can enhance them to a, towards a better visibility, right? And it's still following this Retinex model where you're trying to, you're trying to re restore the images with, from the low illuminations and to some normal illumination. And simultaneously, you want to remove the noise and also you want to estimate the so-called optimal illumination uh, I optimal here, right? But actually, the question here is nobody knows what is optimal illumination. Like, say, denoising, where there's a clear definition of underlying clean images. Uh, so called optimal illumination is really subjective, right? So, I can give you some example. Like, most of the low light enhancement methods are trying to learn end to uh, one to one translation from the low light images to some enhanced, uh, you know, or normal light images, right? by building some networks or maybe using some conventional signal processing methods. Uh, but in fact, we, we, we think this deterministic one-to-one -one translation have some limitations in practice. For example, um, if, if you give me a data set, right, training data set, it's very likely that both the illuminations, uh, the so-called low illumination and the optimal illumination may vary from sample to sample. By, uh, by using individual su subjective evaluation. I mean, your evaluation matrix is different, the so-called optimal illumination you know, may also be different. Right? And not mentioning that, the degradation process may not be consistent 
among your training data, right? Because some training data, the low illumination images may be like much darker than the other ones. So you don't have like a consistent degradations in the training data. Having this kind of observations, uh, we, we propose to not do this in one step. The idea to do that is to use something like a reinforcement learning to do this restoration progressively and treat everything as a Markov decision process, right? So visually, what we're talking about is here is that, well, giving you a bunch of uh, low light images, we allow them to vary from sample to sample, some of them brighter, some of, some of them darker. And when you, when you do the enhancement, we also allow the user to customize which enhancement you like, right? Sometimes you want to make it darker, sometimes you want to make it brighter. It's really up to the user to, to do it. We offer multiple copies by adjusting the number of stages where you use in, uh, for your agent, your trained agent in your restoration process, okay? So, um, so I think the key here is like we're modeling the whole, uh, you know, enhancement process as a Markov decision process. In this case, sorry? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hello? Okay, I think it works. Okay, thank you. I think the battery is low. So, all right, so I think here the, the key is that uh, we're trying to model the whole image, low light image enhancement as a Markov decision process rather than a deterministic one to one mapping and using a deep reinforcement learning. And here the state referring to the low light images, uh, but not necessarily the initial images. They can be intermediate images like we, after we're running this agent for several times, right? And also the action here, uh, we are we're using those parametric light adjustment AT, which we're going to talk about later. In this case, it will be light adjustment curve that we parameterize the whole curve definitions and allow those parameters to be learned, right? And also, by having these definitions, the whole low light enhancement process can be modeled as an MDP trajectory from your initial state, action items, and then followed by the next state. So by forming this uh, MDP trajectories, you can set up some reward function which is linked to your quality uh, evaluation. You can use PSNR if you like. And later I'm gonna show you that we follow something like a non-reference because we want to achieve some kind of zero shot uh, image, image enhancement. Uh, but of course, this reward function really depends on the quality assessment as well, right? And now your agent will become some kind of policy network which you can try to learn uh, with the trainable parameter theta, and it's going to map the current state to some probability density function over the actions eventually, right? So, uh, like I said, uh, in our case, I mean, this is really task specific, right? But for light enhancement, uh, our action will be used to characterize a second order light enhancement curve and by using this LE multiple times as MDP, we can try to approximate even higher order light enhancement curve as well. So I'll give you one example. Uh, eventually, uh, after multiple iterations, we're talking about the actions going to approximate some kind of a you know, pixel value adjustment in the lower, between the low light images and high light images. And the learned action eventually will form some curve within these boundaries. And hopefully this one will try to map from a collection of low light images to some normal light images according to customer's subjective metric, right? So eventually the, uh, the, uh, the network will look like this. And like I said, uh, the, the loss function, the, the reward function we choose, we didn't follow the standard, let's say, mean square errors or SSIM. Instead, we're, we're following a, a paper like previously uh, called Zero DCE. They're using a completely non-reference quality metric, such as like age uh, enhancement, uh, light, uh, like channel balance, all of this, uh, for, uh, which are demonstrated quite useful for like light enhancement applications. So, um, I can show you like one example. By having this customized progressive image enhancement process, in, in fact, the result you have is, uh, it depends on how many stages you have, right? You can progressively enhance the light from the input images and eventually, you know, four times, five times, six times, and gradually increase the light. And the user can actually choose which, you know, version they want, right? According to their quality evaluation. Okay, and, and if you plot the PSNR as a function of uh, number of steps, of course, there will be some kind of a peak value, which is exactly matched with your training number of N. 
Uh, but even though if you run more times or less time, the PSR drops, but sometimes the visual quality may be better, right? So it's really subject to, really subjective to the quality evaluation you have eventually at the user end. Okay, I'll show you some visual example where uh, having this, uh, you know, uh, reinforcement learning method uh, can generate some of the, you know, better visual quality than other existing methods. And more importantly, because, uh, uh, you know, this kind, of a neural, uh, this kind of deep reinforcement method is something like a, a recurrent neural networks, the number of parameter, uh, trainable parameter is much fewer than existing, uh, many of the existing methods, such that we can actually achieve something like a zero shot learning, meaning that you just, just, you just give me one images, the testing images, I exact, I'm only training on that simple testing images and try to recover an uh, agent that is working for that test image. Something like a testing time training, but make it more extreme, right? But you can only achieve this by significantly reduce your model complexity eventually, uh, other than you, other, uh, otherwise you are stuck into some overfitting problems in practice. Okay, so we also do some other, uh, you know, practice, uh, not only in enlightenment, but also maybe denoising. Uh, I will skip some details, but basically for different applications, right, the only difference is the action you are going to use. For enlightenment, the action may be the curve. For denoising, the action will be the residual values from the current stage towards the clean image, right? And again, we're treating everything as a MDP trajectory for denoising. Um, and, uh, and we also show that, well, theoretically, uh, the, the, whole, the whole recurrent, uh, the whole like different reinforcement learning method eventually end up with something similar to RN, right? But only difference here is the way you train them is quite different. And because the way you train them is different, they, they kind of provide some kind of a stochastic version of RN and end up with various merits such, such as robustness later, later I'm going to show you uh, in denoising in practice, right? So uh, this is also very similar to the robustness I just mentioned, right? Uh, we're assuming that our training noise level is certain, like say 25, but the testing time sigma or the noise level can vary. Maybe they, sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. Uh, and this one will bring some problems for some of the existing denoising method, like say DNCN or FFD net, right? But in practice, having this reinforcement learning based method will demonstrate better robustness comparing to the so-called regression based method on to the way of training, right? And also, uh, we try another sigma level, we have something similar, uh, similar conclusion as the previous one. And we also try this for real, real noise removal, where, uh, I mean, we have some images and we have no idea about the noise structures. They may be hybrid noise, they may be uh, non-uniform noise, and we, we try different methods to, you know, uh, uh, to, to kind of try to remove the noise as much as we can. And we show that the robustness will also be very useful for dealing with real noise, right? Okay, uh, and just some recent work actually I did with Sai. We have a collaboration on this, uh, you know, plug and play method together with a deep reinforcement based denoiser. And we can extend the uh, usefulness to maybe not only denoising, but other inverse problem, right? So we also try uh, like a deep blurring or super resolution. And also here the problem is, uh, the observation model may not be inaccurate, right? So there may be uh, some kind of shift from training to testing, and how can we deal with those robustness issues in practice? That's like a, a, a challenge. We think, uh, you know, reinforcement learning method will have uh, some unique merits on that because they end up, end up with lighter weight deep models and be more robust to address to those shift in the observation model in this case, right? So the idea is very simple, like we are trying to change the denoising process with a plug and play uh, formulations and we have some iterations through data consistent step and also incorporate those pre-trained DIL based denoising. And we see that, well, given the shift in the forward model, right? For example, in, in this uh, deep learning pro uh, process, if our training kernel uh, is like 2.0, but our testing blur kernel is something different, right? We, ob we ob observe some degradation of, you know, some competing methods but we, we see some reasonable robustness by having a DIL-based denoiser compared to other methods. And similarly for uh, super resolution as well, you may have some deviation of the kernel as well, the blurry kernel, and we see that this kind of robustness will be a, a good kind of merits brought by this DIL-based denoiser, right? Okay, so just want to summarize by the, the lesson we learned from the second part. 
uh, we, we see that, well, some regression problem, instead of treating them as a one-to-one -one mapping, it may be modeled as an MDP as well. And by dividing the, you know, the very uh, relatively more complicated restoration into multiple stages, it's possible to make the challenging problem much simpler, right? For example, we can decompose the light enhancement into multiple stage curve enhancement, and maybe we, we can decompose the denoising problem into some residual estimation problem instead, right? And also, we observe in practice there are some, you know, these kind of methods to better generalization and robustness, and also, by having a lighter weight network, sometimes it can enable uh, you know, a zero-shot learning or unsupervised learning, rather than you know, supervised learning over a very large data set. So these are some of the mer merits we observe for this kind of trial and methods. And for that, well, and my, uh, sorry, the last but not least, we think this is a kind of approach, something like a divide and conquer. So it's a, it's a better way or a smarter way to tackle challenges in practice. So you don't have to solve everything in one step. You can try to solve them in a progressive way in this case. So by having that, that will conclude my talk. And uh, thank you, and I'm open for questions. We have time for a few questions. Well, may maybe I can start. So. Uh, for the first <clears throat> first part on disentangling, I was wondering, uh, have you thought about you know connections between uh, what you're doing for disentangling signal and noise, and sort of uh, a more information theoretic perspective on it? Because I was reminded of you know things that people have done in privacy aware yes. deep learning. There's disentangling and stuff, right? So, what connections do you see? Uh, yeah, I mean that's a really good question. In fact, we have some ongoing works, looking about that problem. For example, you just mentioned about the privacy issue, right? Uh, some of the work we mentioned, like uh, adversarial purification, we also study like what kind of, uh, what is the kind of the, uh, uh, how to say, uh, like I could say correlations or, or mutual inference between those uh, adversarial perturbation and images, such that if we have such kind of theoretical guidance, it can give us a better idea to impose the, especially those laws to try to differentiate the images from the perturbations. Uh, right now, all of this loss design is still based on some kind of assumptions and priors. There's no, how to say, theoretic, uh, you know, uh, kind of guidance for it. Uh, we're now working on some of the results. Uh, for example, we, we, we did some kind of a, a set theory analysis on, uh, on adversarial perturbation, uh, but it, since it's not published, so I didn't share with that. Uh, and also regarding the, the second part, the reinforcement learning, right? In terms of robustness, we're also trying to work on some of the robustness guarantee, maybe as a function of a number of stages. Uh, I guess if we can get it, hopefully I can share maybe in the next workshop, hopefully within a year, yes. Thank you. Maybe I can ask one more, one oh, sure. more question then. So, or maybe it's more of thought. Sure. Uh, so you were talking about doing the <clears throat> image reconstruction or restoration sequentially, and you also had you know um, a work with the diffusion models, which are also have the sequential process. And traditional iterative reconstruction yes. is also also has an iterative process different from like uh, like just a single shot applying a neural network to. Yes. Uh, to recover an image. So, so maybe a thought is like, is there a way to unify these iterative <clears throat> methods, whether involving a neural network or diffusion or not, uh, yes. into a more common kind of framework, right? So that's kind of, that was my thought. Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, I think that's also a uh, you know, very interesting question. In fact, we talk about that in the diffusion paper we put in the archive. Uh, so, um, in fact, you are right. Um, if you look at the, the diffusion model, right, the way they generate the images from the, say, random noise is also like in a progressive way. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really a unique advantage because, for example, the work we're doing here, we're having an unrolled network where you also need to progressively doing this kind of projection onto your, I don't know, your data consisting term or, or you know, your, your fidelity term, right? And if we're not using diffusion model, maybe we're using, say, game-based method, you have to run the, uh, run the game-based method multiple times, which increase the you know, complexity and the, make it more expensive. But diffusion model is good because itself, it's a progressive method. 
So uh, then we use it for unrolling network. It doesn't really uh, uh, kind of cost additional time because if you have any way you have to run this progressive uh, pr diffusion model progressive time. So the only additional cost is, uh, is some kind of back projection. You have to, you just need to impose additionally this data consistent, consistent term. So I think that's a kind of a, how to say, a, a good match with many of the iterative methods like unrolling and plug and play. Uh, yeah, that, I think I totally agree with you. I think it's kind of a, uh, they have the similar late nature, so seems like they are a good match between the two, right? Yeah. Okay, so if we don't have any further questions, let's thank Bihan okay, for thank you. his wonderful Thanks. talk. And that concludes our uh, afternoon session, so hope you have a good dinner and we'll see you tomorrow morning. We start at nine o'clock. Right, right. So there is a poster session, and I saw it was extended until seven thirty. So we have that now. <laughs>